Hey everyone. Welcome back for another video. Now, this is the second part of Patriot's Dawn, a story I posted the first part for on my channel a long time ago. If you haven't seen that one, or if you need a reminder, I recommend you go watch that video first. I'll add the link to part 1 in the description and pinned comment. As always, huge thanks to all of my Patreons, making these videos would be impossible without you guys' support, especially with all the restrictions YouTube places on my type of content. As always, the full story is already out over there for you guys along with about 30 other different stories you can enjoy. Also feel free to send me any messages over there if you have any questions or even if you just want to chat. Link to all of that will be in the description. Anyways, everyone, enjoy the video. Chapter 6, Hell Above Water. Slash tilde slash. A light, one mile warm up run was finished in 4 minutes flat. Naruto took a deep breath, not that he needed it, a fresh, sea air. The boy allowed his eyes to close contentedly for a few moments. The slightly more haggard breathing of his training partner for the day filled his ears and brought a smile to his face. It was good to know that he was still the best. Ino was rapidly catching him, however. He would have to do something about that. A solid morning of training was just what the doctor ordered. Doubly so after the mission he and his teammates had run two days previous. Asuma had been pleased with the result, though he meticulously picked apart their execution of the plan. Naruto was the first to concede that mistakes had been made, but given what they had to work with, he thought that he, Kiba, and Ino had managed rather well. It had been their first true assassination mission, after all. He might have been biased, but he thought they did a pretty bang-up job for an inexperienced team of Janan. There had been a few hiccups, but the outcome had been exactly as planned. The more dangerous of the two, Futaba, had been dealt with, while the weaker of the two had been brought in for questioning by Asuma. Naruto hadn't seen the man in a day, but given Asuma's cheerful mood, he had been a wealth of information. By Asuma's estimate, Zabuza should be recovered enough to make his move within the next two days. Once they were finished with him, they would move on Gato. Naruto was still unsure about the whole ordeal, he didn't particularly want to get himself involved in what might turn into a civil war if handled the wrong way by the people of Wave. It seemed like something more suited for more experienced ninja. Just killing Gato while possibly stopping the problems that Wave had, could throw the country into chaos. Gato might have ruled with an iron fist, but he still ruled. Wave had laws, and they were followed for fear of retaliation. It wasn't a good or pleasant system, but it kept people in line. If that was removed, there was no telling what might happen. Wave hadn't been governed by its people in years, and Naruto hesitated in saying that they would just go back to business as usual once Gato was dead. A poor handling of Gato in the immediate aftermath could lead Wave into a period of chaos. He shook his head as he moved through some light stretches. That wasn't his, or his team's, problem. He banished all thought about the mission from his mind as he finished stretching his chest muscles. Guy had impressed on him the importance of proper stretching and rest at a young age. Naruto followed what he man said to the letter. He had also managed to impress that same notion on his partner for the day. He had no one to be injured, especially on a mission like this one and having an injured teammate would just be too troublesome to deal with, to quote Nara Shikamaru. Ino was developing nicely, he noted from his peripheral vision as he watched the girl cross and uncross her arms in a simple exercise. Stretching had its benefits, and he was in puberty. That was all the excuse he felt he needed, and it wasn't like any straight male in his graduating class would dispute Ino's attractiveness. He dropped to the forest floor and began a sequence of push-ups. At 50 he would stop and rest for 30 seconds, before doing 50 more. He would do that in increments of five, and then move to his abs. General strength was important for a ninja, and there was no better way to go about getting it than through push-ups, pull-ups, and sit-ups. They were perfect for Naruto, who was still young and developing. They allowed for his body weight to work against him while not straining it past its limit. He had moved toward more general strength when he discarded his weight set. They focused too much on the legs and arms, and would eventually lock him into a rigid taijutsu style based on bulk. He had been moving along that path almost subconsciously, by training with Guy and Lee on a regular basis, and he needed to get off that track. It wasn't that it was bad, but it had its disadvantages. His fight with the missing Nin had shown him that a rigid taijutsu form could easily be overcome in the right circumstances. The enclosed space of the apartment hadn't allowed for Naruto to use the more sweeping attacks of the Gokan style, and it had hampered his efforts tremendously. A more flexible form based around quickness, efficiency of movement, and flexibility was more his speed. It fit in with what he liked in a shinobi fight, and would allow him to use his ever-increasing ninjutsu abilities. 
he had to start with eliminating many of the kicks, they were common in the Gokan style, and replace them with more grabs, grapples, and throws, more close-range tactics. It was easier said than done. Building a taijutsu style couldn't be done overnight, and Naruto knew that it would take years for it to sort itself out properly. There was no sense in not getting started though. The wind ruffled his hair as time flowed past him in the clearing. At one point, he and Ino shared a look, no words were conveyed, and the individualized training session devolved into a spar of epic proportions. Naruto was more than happy to say he won. If you had asked him a few months ago, he would have been scandalized to even hear the suggestion that he would have to go full out to beat Ino in a spar. It was a credit to both him and her that he had no such compulsions anymore. He took a sip from his canteen, reveling in the crisp, cool taste. There was something inherently enjoyable about relaxing alongside nature. It had a certain energy to it. A relaxing energy, if Naruto were to attempt to describe it. Even powerful. It was peaceful though. Naruto shook his head quickly to clear his head of such confusing thoughts. Now wasn't the time to think of such things. No, now was the time to focus on much more important things. Like why Ino's head was currently resting on his shoulder. Ino? He asked, his voice light. Hmm, yes Naruto-kun? She responded blearily, sounding like she was the most comfortable person in the world. Naruto blinked at both the tone and the suffix at the end of his name. She had started adding the kun to the end of his name recently, and he didn't know what to make of it. He shook it off. Is something wrong? She lifted her head from his shoulder gently. Cerulean met sea foam as their eyes locked. Naruto fought down a blush at the proximity of their faces. So undignified, he thought. How does she do this stuff to me? No. Her response was simple and she returned her head to its former resting place. Naruto nearly sputtered at the girl, but controlled himself. He settled back into the tree trunk and did his best to make himself comfortable. He knew well enough that Ino wouldn't leave her place of comfort unless he forced her off. Inwardly, he reflected that he wasn't too inclined to move her. Growing up the way he did, with just about no one to either raise him or comfort him, he was mostly unfamiliar with human contact of the pleasant variety. He was sure that this would fall into that branch. It was nice to know that someone was comfortable enough with him to be willing to actually touch him. The fact that it was Ino of all people who was so comfortable with him brought an involuntary smile to his face. He knew he still nursed a crush on the girl next to him, and it hadn't really shrunk since he had gotten to know her. It was just more indication that his life was changing more than he had ever imagined. And for the better. He had a team that he actually liked. No, it was more than that. While he had his squabbles with Kiba and Ino respectively, he wouldn't replace them with anyone. Not for anything. That didn't even go over the effect Asumo was having on his life. The man was rapidly filling the gap that a father figure should have occupied. It had gotten to the point that he wanted the man to be pleased with him just for the sake of it, rather than it being a matter of pride. Kiba was as good a running buddy as he had had back in the academy, and he genuinely enjoyed exchanging barbs with the dog ninja. He had even caught himself defending him to Sasuke a few times. Ino was the same, yet so different. He wasn't quite sure when the girl had started paying attention to him, but he was sure that he didn't mind. Their friendship, if it could be called that, was probably the best thing to come out of his time with Team 10. The girl had proved herself to be more than just another pretty face from the academy. She was far more than that. She was a competent kunoichi, smart, skilled, and determined to prove herself to anyone she came across. Naruto knew himself well enough to know that he never would have given her the same respect she held with him had he never been on her team. He had never done it in the academy, despite her grades showing her competency. He had simply brushed it off, disregarding her as just another Sasuke fangirl. Naruto sighed audibly, unknowingly breaking the companionable silence that had permeated the clearing for the last five minutes. Thinking was becoming a steady habit of his these days. It was probably for the best. I suppose I owe you an apology, he said suddenly, startling Ino out of her days. She had been dozing comfortably for the past few minutes, though he had no way of knowing that, as wrapped up in his own thoughts as he had been. Hmm? For what? She asked, perplexed. Ino straightened herself, taking her head off Naruto's shoulder with some reluctance. It was remarkably comfortable. Naruto took a moment to formulate his thoughts, and came up with nothing. He couldn't think of how to formulate an apology without sounding like a total douchebag in the process. How exactly did you tell someone that you used to have absolutely no respect for them? Um, well, I'm not really sure how to say it, he stated rather lamely. Unconsciously, he reached up with his right hand and began scratching the back of his head sheepishly. Ino locked eyes with him, a perfectly manicured eyebrow raised delicately. 
So, you want to apologize, but, you don't know what for? Or you just don't know how to say it, she finished conclusively. The second one, Naruto clarified with some hesitation. This wasn't going at all like he'd wanted. He took a couple of long swigs from his canteen to try to buy some time. You don't know how to say it, Ino said again, looking thoughtful. That means it's probably embarrassing in some way. She directed an accusing glare at him. You've been having perverted thoughts about me, haven't you? The water going down Naruto's throat halted as the boy sputtered incoherently for a moment. WH what? He coughed, spitting out the remainder of the water he had been drinking. He knew the girl well enough to know she had timed her statement perfectly. Bitch. Of course not. Was what he said out loud. Ino narrowed her eyes at him. So you don't think I'm attractive? Any boy that thinks I'm attractive should have some perverted thoughts about me, she concluded in a grand leap of logic. Naruto's eyes widened in horror. One precious life lesson he had learned in his youth was to never insult a woman's looks. That went double for a girl as vain as Ino could be at times. What? No. I mean yes. I do think. You know Naruto, Ino cut him off haughtily, a fence clear as she moved away from him. Kiba may be an idiot, but he's right that women do like to be appreciated. But that has nothing to do. The blonde boy trailed off as he stared at his teammate. His eyes narrowed as his mind finally caught up with his mouth. Oh no, no. You're not pulling that shit, he declared. Blonde eyebrows shot into the girl's hairline. Excuse me? You're the one insulting me. Not happening, Ino. What's not happening? She asked. She looked annoyed, but Naruto knew better. This, he said simply, gesturing at the little clearing they were situated in. If by this, you mean insulting me, then yes it is happening. He shook his head. Uh-uh. No. This, you're getting me off topic by teasing me, just like you always do. And by topic, you mean. My apology. Oh, so you're apologizing for insulting me. Well, let's hear it then. The blonde Janan sat back on her haunches, an expectant look on her face. I'm not apologizing for that. I didn't even insult you. So what are you apologizing for? She questioned, finally looking bored with the whole situation. She casually buffed her nails against her purple top. For thinking you were a bimbo back in the academy. Naruto burst out as he began pacing about the clearing. He missed the triumphant smirk upon his teammate's face as he got on a roll. I mean, here I am, swallowing my pride and apologizing, and you just start in on your usual routine. I have a routine now? You're teasing. All your flirting and all that confusing shit you do to confuse me. Ah, you don't like it, Naruto-kun? She asked demurely, batting her eyelashes. That. Right there. What you just did, he exclaimed, pointing accusingly at her from across the clearing where he had abruptly stopped pacing. What about it? She asked innocently. It's, it's. He trailed off. It wasn't exactly like he wanted her to stop her teasing. It was enjoyable sometimes. Not to mention that Eno wouldn't be Eno without that facet of her personality. It wasn't like she would actually stop if he asked, in any event. You know what, he said, plopping down next to her on the ground. Never mind. His frustration was spent, so he just settled for leaning back against the same tree he had been resting against before. To his surprise, and inwardly, to his satisfaction, Eno moved back to the same spot she had been in before, casually resting her head on his shoulder once more as if nothing had even been said. He even went so far as to lean his own head on top of hers. Her hair was pleasantly soft. He couldn't really describe their relationship, Naruto decided. They argued about random things often enough, almost as much as she and Kiba did, but they also got along far better than Ino and Kiba did on a regular basis. There was a comfort level there that Naruto couldn't really describe. If push came to shove, he knew full well that Ino would have his back, but that was what teammates did. They were closer than that, somehow. He honestly felt that he would be able to trust her with just about anything, and he had no idea why. That was just fine though. Naruto's eyes drifted shut as he allowed his body to relax for the first time since he had arrived in wave country. So, what's this about you thinking I was a bimbo? Arg. Slash tilde slash. A soft smile crept up on an equally soft face as he observed the two preteens from a safe distance. It would be hard to tell that the two were ninja had he not already known. They seemed just like average preteens. He knew full well that they were far from it. He had observed the two for some time now, taking in their routine. They were competent for their age, and that was worrying to an extent. His master would need all the help he could get against the Konoha Jonin when they made their move, 
and having two, three, he corrected himself, capable adversaries besides the Jonin would bode ill for him. It looked like he would have to make an appearance. His heart was saddened by the prospect of killing such happy children, especially ones that were in the midst of young love. It would be necessary though. He would harden his heart so his master's ambitions would be fulfilled. Even as the thoughts crossed his mind, a hand crept toward his concealed senbone pouch within his kimono. His hand brushed cold metal for a moment as he contemplated ending the lives of the two Jinan right here and now. It could save them some problems down the road, and who knew, it might even send the other two home without having to kill them. The girl settled down next to the boy for the second time, idly resting her head on his shoulder. The boy followed suit shortly after, putting his head on hers. His resolve faltered, and the silent observer replaced his senbone with a click. He couldn't bear to kill such children in such a way. He would harden his heart for his master and his ambitions, but not this day. With another soft smile that made him look even more effeminate, Haku went back to his herb picking, wandering away from the two Jinan in the clearing, oblivious to his presence. Slash tilde slash. Wind ruffled blonde hair and whipped through black shorts as Naruto stared. It was one hell of a view. Wave was truly a beautiful country from the right angle. Rolling hills from the border of the island inward, lush, green forests that spoke volumes about the amount of moisture in the air. That didn't even begin to describe the view of the sea. Blue, rolling waves that majestically crashed against the shoreline with untold force. Naruto had lived a fairly sheltered life in Konoha. To him, the sea's majesty was awe-inspiring. To an extent, he understood how so many bards had found inspiration in the ocean. He just wasn't quite sure he would be able to find words to properly describe it had he been put on the spot. It was that amazing. From the top of the tallest tree in the immediate vicinity of Tazana's home, Wave looked to be a country floating in a cloud, the rolling fogs white contrasting with the eternal blue of the sea. From 60 feet in the air, Naruto could see the sun clearly for the first time since he had arrived in Wave Country, its reflection off of the mist and water nearly blinding at times. He wished he had some sunglasses so he could stare at it. He supposed it was for the best, he wasn't so high up to enjoy the view. One heartbeat later had blue eyes focused back on their target, Tazana's house. The humble abode was about as interesting to regard as it was to watch paint dry, but he had his assignment. He was about used to the boredom by now anyway. He had made this tree his vantage point three days ago, when Asuma had estimated that Zabuza would be about ready to make his attack, if he was truly still alive. The plan was simple in nature, and accounted for most of the variables that Team 10 had managed to brainstorm in one of their powwows. The main concern was that Zabuza, or Gato as it may turn out to be, would send men to Tazana's house in order to eliminate or take the man's family hostage when he was working at the bridge. It was a likely prospect, and would require Team 10 to keep at least one member back to deal with any threat to Tsunami and Inari that may present itself. There had been some serious discussion about who to leave, but Naruto had been conscripted into the job, the reasoning behind it being that he was the most all-around of the three Jinan, and leaving Asuma behind was out of the question. Naruto just took it as confirmation of his skills. He was being trusted to deal with the possible threat of Shinobi knocking on Tazana's front door, and that was something most Jonin sensei would hesitate at sending one of their relatively green Jinan to deal with, no matter how low that threat was. It was a nice feeling knowing that someone in a position of authority respected your skills. In any event, he had holed himself up in Tazana's house for the better part of the first day, citing that it would allow him to immediately respond to anything, but that had lasted as long as he could tolerate Inari's incessant staring at him and negative energy. Honestly, the boy just bled bad vibes. Had it gone on for any longer, Naruto would have been more likely to kill him than any possible attacker. The boy's bitching was downright intolerable. Not to mention that he always stared at him with a look that plainly said he pitied Naruto for his stupidity. In some ways, he had come to really respect Tazana and the cause he fought for, no matter how it put him and his team in danger, but he couldn't comprehend how he had managed to end up with such a little bitch for a grandson. It was mind-boggling. He supposed he could just pin it on bad parenting, though Tsunami seemed to have a decent head on her shoulders. She was hot too. That made everything better. He and Ino had had much fun ribbing Kiba about his newfound obsession with his dream woman. It was endlessly amusing watching the boys posturing in an attempt to get some attention from the mature woman, doubly so because the pretty woman was far more interested in their laid-back Jonin sensei. Kiba would never forgive Asuma till his dying day for that one fact, or so the mutt grumbled. Still, as amusing as it was, Naruto could see where the boy was coming from. No matter how much he liked Ino, there was something inordinately attractive about a mature woman. 
Naruto was no expert on feelings, but there was a quiet confidence exuded by a woman who had found her niche in life and was comfortable with it and herself. It was, soothing was the best way he could describe it. Rolling mist, thicker than what was natural, caught the light of the sun in Naruto's peripheral vision. So it begins, he thought dramatically. The mist was his signal that Zabuza was finally making his move. He was to wait a full five minutes if no one showed themselves, an eternity in the shinobi world, before breaking cover and getting to the bridge as fast as he could. The boy shifted slightly in the tree's upper branches as he tapped out the seconds on the bark. He could forgive himself some nervous anticipation, but it was more than that. Uncontrollable by his own thoughts, he was itching for a fight. The count got to 50 seconds when two figures emerged from the dense foliage surrounding Tazana's house. They were dressed like thugs, katanas held arrogantly at their sides as they swaggered in like they owned the place. Fucking Ronin, he thought uncharitably. He checked himself for a moment. They could actually be shinobi in disguise. He discarded the notion a moment later. Even the most idiotic of shinobi weren't as arrogant, not at the level these two would be at. His thoughts were confirmed a moment later as they kicked in the door. A smart shinobi, or even a smart thug, would have knocked. The person who answered the door would have been somewhat unawares and easy to subdue and capture. Honestly, no creativity. God damn it. Hold still woman. Came the shout from inside. The sound of muffled screaming came a moment later, followed by wailing that could only belong to Inari. They re-emerged from the abode a few moments later, a struggling tsunami being dragged from the house. Naruto stood, chakra holding him to the thin branch. A quick glance at the clearing around the home revealed no new enemies, so Naruto felt relatively safe from ambush. His legs flexed once, hard, before he leapt from his perch like a swimmer diving into a pool, arms held out and legs snapped together forming his body into a T-shape. Chakra carried him past the surrounding branches sticking from the tree, and he did a quick, mid-air roll on his way down, using his life essence to angle his body into a perfectly controlled fall. The thug not holding Tsunami was completely unprepared for 105 pounds of 12-year-old to come crashing down upon him from 60 feet in the air. He said nothing as Naruto plowed into him, having simply let gravity go to work, and he said nothing as his body was crushed into the earth as Naruto discharged the chakra in his legs so as not to break them. You won't hurt my mother. A determined and tear-spilling Inari sprinted outside his home, knife brandished wildly, only to see one of his attackers wordlessly pounded into the ground with all the grace and subtlety of a railroad spike. Huh? Escaped his lips as Naruto stood calmly on top of the dead man, two kunai held loosely at his sides as he stared down the second man with something akin to divine wrath in his eyes. Get back in the house Inari, was all the blonde said, without even turning to face the boy. The boy retreated wordlessly, barely in control of his own body, so in awe of the blonde specter of righteousness before him was he. The remaining ronin had regained some semblance of his wits, and was brandishing his katana at Tsunami's neck. Stop right there. I'll kill her. I will kill her. He screamed, his voice shaking. Naruto pinned all the rudimentary killing intent he could muster on the man and was rewarded with the thug breaking out in a cold sweat. Drop the bait, ronin, he said in his best intimidating voice. He imagined it sounded ridiculous coming from a twelve-year-old. You drop the blade, you live. If you make me come and get her, you die. If you kill her, you die. Is this really worth losing your life over? Contrary to what Naruto wanted, the man simply pulled the blade tighter to Tsunami's neck, eliciting a muted wail from the captive woman. One chance. A seal less Kawarimi had Naruto in Tsunami's place, his chakra easily dwarfing hers. He was inside the man's guard before the man realized a switch had been made, and a simple haymaker to the neck sent him to the ground, his windpipe crushed. Naruto spun one of his two kunai idly before planting it in the man's exposed chest, right through the heart. He had no pity for such men, but allowing any human being to die in such a painful way was distasteful to the twelve-year-old Janan. The boy turned to the embracing mother and son with a reassuring smile plastered across his face. You two should get back inside, he cautioned as the two turned to him. Tsunami nodded hurriedly, tears flowing. Thank you. Thank you so much, she gushed as she steered a sobbing Inari inside with a firm hand, unconsciously shielding him with her body from any other threat, real or imagined. Even now, she thought of her son first. Naruto smiled wistfully at the sight of mother and son, silently lamenting his own lack of a mother, before turning his gaze toward the bridge. He couldn't see it clearly through the trees, but Zabuza's mist was seeping through the foliage. That wasn't good. He gave one more glance to Tazana's house, where Tsunami was barricading the entrance with furniture, smart woman, he thought before channeling chakra and stepping into sunshine. 
the world blurred to a combination of green, brown, and grey as tunnel vision made its wonders known to Naruto. He stopped abruptly as the bridge came into view. Heavy mist covered the area, restricting Naruto's view of his teammates, but he could see one thing. Large, reflective shards of what looked to be ice were the only thing that penetrated the mist, the muted light reflecting off of them like mirrors. That can't be good. He broke into a full sprint as the sounds of clashing blades reached his ears. He wasn't stupid enough to charge into a full-scale battle in Shunshine, he'd be cut down in an instant just on reflex. A chakra-enhanced leap carried him into the mist where he landed in an instinctive roll to dodge any projectiles that may have been aimed at him. Asuma had trained him well. The roll saved his head, as he felt a kunai whipping through the air where his head had just been. Naruto. The familiar voice of Ino called through the mist from the direction he kunai had come from, and Naruto balked. Fratricide would have been one hell of a way to go. Damn it Ino, hold your fire. He sprinted through the mist toward her. She stood flanking Tazana, her tanto drawn and held at the ready. Her gaze snapped to him with something akin to relief as he approached. The fuck's happening? Asuma sensei's fighting Zabuza while Kiba's dealing with the hunter Nin, she nearly screamed at him. From the words themselves, he would have thought the situation under wraps. Her tone, however, told a different story. Sensei can take care of himself, I hope. Where's Kiba? Naruto asked in a rush, already prepping his materials. Kunai were loaded with an explosive tag each and deposited into one of the pockets in his shorts. Shuriken were threaded with wire and placed in his middle weapons pouch on the small of his back, the second of three. I really should have done this earlier. Ino pointed with a shaking hand. In there. That was unlike her in every way. In battle, he had found, she was often at her most collected. For her to be this shaken up. Things weren't looking good. Naruto spun his head so fast he felt a pop in his neck. The reflective construct he had seen from off the bridge loomed ahead of him, the sounds of combat coming from within. How the hell had he missed that? He mentally slapped himself a few times. This wasn't the time to lose focus in battle. How the fuck did he get caught up in there? He asked as he re-retrieved his explosive-laden kunai from his hip pocket. No idea, Naruto, but be careful, that guy's probably as fast as you, Ino cautioned. That gave Naruto pause, and he glanced back at the mirror structure. He was unable to make out anything but two shapes weaving around each other on the bridge. Great, he drawled. Anything else I should know? He quickly double-checked his resistance seals to make sure they were disengaged. They were. He's good with water, Ino rushed out, tapping the bridge with her hand impatiently as she tried to dredge up any more information she could think of. Arg. That's all I got. Naruto nodded as he turned. Okay. Water-natured, fast, mirror-like structure. He trailed off in thought as he tried to formulate a plan. Glancing at the construct before him, he narrowed his eyes. It was abnormally cold on this bridge, even for wave. The answer came to him at the speed of thought. Ice, maybe? It made a twisted sort of sense. Ice was really just water. He had never heard of ice manipulation, but now wasn't the time for that. Kiba was on the other guy's home turf. It was time to get him out. Naruto broke into a light jog as he approached the mirror dome. The two shapes became clear enough to view, and Naruto spied two Kibas. Jujin Bunshine. Kiba. Get back. He screamed. Two pairs of feral eyes snapped to his as he hurled the two explosive tag-laden kunai in between a gap in the mirrors. The boy and his dog leapt back, simultaneously avoiding a hail of senbone speeding toward them, as Naruto's hands formed a ram seal. 2. 1. A single application of chakra activated the charges on the kunai, which detonated with a force of two grenades. Shrapnel peppered the inside of the dome, but Naruto didn't stick around to find out what had happened. The concussive force, while impressive, hadn't resulted in a shattering sound, something that would have naturally happened had the mirrors broken. Six hand seals had him submerged in heavy concrete courtesy of Doden, Dachu Senko, and a focused application of chakra blew a hole right through the concrete in a place Naruto knew was covered by the dome. He exploded upward from the concrete with a crash as dust filled his vision. Rapid blinking cleared his sight well enough to make out the forms of Kiba and a transformed Akamaru huddling away from his explosion. The two needed no goading to dive through the hole Naruto had created, and the trio of Team 10 teammates scampered back outside the dome. What the hell took you so long? Kiba groused as they pushed their way through concrete and support beams. Naruto was surprised he had managed the earth-natured technique so quickly, given the structure of the bridge. It was amazing what chakra and adrenaline could do when moving in the same direction. Had some shit to deal with, mutt. 
Aren't you happy I bothered to show up? Naruto snarked as grey light assaulted his eyes. Naruto immediately made space once he emerged from the tunnel, speeding through seals for the Fuuten, Rinkudan in order to provide cover. His instinct turned out to be fortuitous, as the hunter Nin appeared from a mirror less than three meters from the trio, and made to press his advantage. The screaming Rinkudan had other ideas, however, and the masked youth was forced to abort. Danger senses screamed bloody murder at him, and Naruto dropped low to avoid being turned into a pincushion. He palmed two kunai and the wind howled as an ethereal light surrounded the blades. He let the true nature of wind chakra take over as he slashed the air while the hunter chucked more senbone toward him, the wild chakra flying off the kunai and deflecting the incoming needles, leaving ruts in the concrete where they impacted the bridge. Get back! He ordered Kiba and Akamaru. They obliged him as he blurred into sunshine. Only reflex born of life on the run saved the masked hunter as death soared toward him. His right arm came up in a rudimentary, reflexive block that halted Naruto's kunai strike in his forearm. He resisted the urge to scream as wind chakra ripped through skin, muscle, and bone, tearing his arm away with an almighty wrench, and a burst of speed carrying him away from Naruto. The blonde cursed sulfurously as his prey slipped away from him, saved by a lucky break. The hunter wouldn't be letting him get so close a second time. No sense in not trying though. Three kunai were airborne as Naruto finished seals, a few uten. Repushu propelling the blades at thrice their normal speed. A slab of ice appeared from nowhere to block the projectiles, where they embedded themselves nearly hilt deep in the mirror. A second curse split the air as Naruto realized he wouldn't get another opportunity to end the hunter nin any time soon. At least not by himself. The hunter was as fast as him, at least, and wasn't about to let himself be maneuvered. A gust of wind blew a few strands of hair in his face, and he brushed them away idly, his blue eyes scanning what little he could of the bridge. Asuma had his hands full with Zabuza, the man's massive cleaver keeping the Konoha Jonin at a safe distance. Ino was performing a hasty patch job on Kiba and Akamaru, both of whom were suffering from multiple puncture wounds. He was on his own for the moment, as Ino needed to patch up Kiba before he would be any use in a fight. He gripped a kunai as the hunter Nin spun toward him, Senbone in his good hand. The two blades met in the middle, the hunter showing a surprising amount of strength for such a lithe body, as Naruto noticed for the first time. Naruto used his second hand to bring a second blade to bear and slashed out, slicing the hunter's kimono as he spun away. A swift pivot on the balls of his feet had Naruto in position to block a second stab, and the redirected needle passed over his left shoulder harmlessly. The hunter made to move away once more, but Naruto was having none of it. A harsh grab of the arm had the shinobi in a vice grip as Naruto used his body weight to hurl the body to the concrete. A kunai quickly split the ninja's neck. Naruto was already moving as the body exploded into water, a hail of needles peppering the spot he vacated. A second hail from his right forced him backwards, and Naruto used his left kunai to slash out at the specter of the hunter Nin. His blade caught skin once more, but the hunter was one step ahead again. The body dispersed into liquid and Naruto was left off balance as his kunai split water. Water splashed around his feet as he attempted to regain his balance on the slippery ground. He had no time, however, as the hunter asserted himself with a vicious stab at Naruto's exposed neck. Only a desperate grab halted the motion of the shinobi's good hand, and Naruto moved to use momentum to swing the hunter around when he encountered a problem. He couldn't move. A glance downward showed that the hunter was doing more than Naruto had originally thought, as his feet were encased in ice. His eyes widened as they met the eye slits of the hunter's mask. Now you won't even be able to run from my attacks, a melodious voice spoke from beneath porcelain. Naruto's eyes were drawn to the hunter's bad arm, the one he had stabbed, and he beheld the boy making one-handed seals. How is that possible? He mentally screamed. His harried breath billowed out in a white cloud, and he belated realized that it suddenly had gotten colder. Much colder. A stomp to the water-laden bridge sent water skyward, where it coalesced into needles made of pure ice. I don't want to kill you, the hunter spoke, voice sounding solemn. But I will kill my heart in this case. You are far too dangerous. I am sorry. The senbone twitched once in midair before shooting toward him at speeds too fast to dodge. Naruto's eyes widened as death soared toward him. Tsuga. Was all Naruto had time to hear before his body was brutally slammed into by a spinning grey projectile. Ice cracked and he was airborne before he knew it, but the all too short flight came to an abrupt end on the hard concrete. He had little time to feel disoriented as a slap to the face brought him back to reality. Wake the fuck up, Naruto. He heard Kiba howl at him. Blonde hair flailed about his head as he shook it to clear his head. He immediately wished he hadn't, 
as nothing but bruising pain hit him in the chest. What the fuck Kiba? He coughed when the memory of being barreled into by Tsuaga reasserted itself in his mind. Sorry, man, it was all I could think of to get you out of that, Kiba apologized as Naruto pushed himself up, doing his best to ignore the pain where he knew his ribcage to be. Better battered and bruised than dead, right? Don't count on it, Naruto groused as his preliminary test of his ribs revealed sharp pain in three too many places. They were broken, but not shattered. That was good. Well suck it up. Ino's covering us right now, but her genjutsu's gonna break at some point. Naruto nodded, wincing in pain as his ribs started involuntarily grinding together of all things. He coughed, once, as blinding pain hit his senses for a single moment before a pleasant heat enveloped the damaged ribs. Abruptly, and with no goading from Naruto himself, the pain disappeared, taking the pleasant warmth with it. He quickly patted himself down, only to feel no pain whatsoever. What the hell? There's no way broken ribs can heal that quick. Not even with chakra therapy. Ruto. Naruto. Listen the fuck up, man. We need a plan, Kiba was shouting at him. He shook himself once more, breaking any and all thoughts about how he had somehow managed to spontaneously heal three cracked ribs. There were more pressing matters to attend to. Yeah, I hear ya. Where's Eno? Kiba pointed to a spot on the bridge mostly obscured by mist, Naruto could barely make out two figures huddled together. She's doing a double layer on the hunter, Kiba clarified for Naruto. A quick glance showed the hunter hurling Senbone at an imaginary opponent. It won't hold long. Alright, move. We're gonna trap him. I'll flush him out once Ino drops the illusion. Naruto quickly tossed a kunai to a spot on the bridge near where the hunter was flailing about. Hit him here with all you've got. We need to make this work and I don't trust us to get another shot at this guy. He's not too strong close in, but he's crafty. Kiba nodded resolutely. Got it. Put your radio in. Ino and me are on channel too. Naruto didn't bother nodding as he ghosted through the mist toward the illusion and trapped hunter. He threaded the wire for his radio through his ear absently as he strafed. His first inclination would be to kill the hunter outright, but Asuma would want information from him after the fight was through. They needed to take him alive, and that was just so much harder. He palmed a kunai as the hunter was finally in range. Eno, he growled over the calm. He wasn't quite sure when the illusion dropped, but that wasn't his concern as he slashed out at neck level with the hunter. Eyes widened behind porcelain as Naruto came into view once the illusion fell, and the hunter ducked on reflex. Naruto's eyes gleamed as his kunai sliced through long black hair, and the hunter moved to make space. Not so fast. Naruto thought as he brought his leg up and out in vicious, chakra-enhanced thrust kick. The hunter attempted to block with both forearms, but the kick proved too much as the shinobi was sent sailing through the air, directly toward the kunai Naruto had thrown before. Kiba appeared from nowhere and was nothing but a grey blur as he executed his clan's signature technique with a scream of Tsuga. The hunter nin was slammed with an almighty crack, and soared for a precious few moments before landing in a heap, unmoving. Naruto gripped his kunai loosely as he warily approached the hunter, who was now struggling to raise himself from the ground. The disguised shinobi fell back to the concrete with a muted thump and a rustling of cloth. I wouldn't try that if I were you, Naruto cautioned as he approached. You probably have a few cracked ribs, if not shattered ones, and judging by the state of your arm, that's broken too. The left arm, the one Naruto hadn't stabbed earlier, was bent at an unnatural angle adjacent to the shinobi's body. The blonde took a moment to admire the pure power that the Inuzuka technique had, inwardly happy that the same hadn't happened to him earlier. He flipped the body over with his foot cautiously, though none too gently, to take in the surprising sight of a bloodied front and a cracked mask, revealing a blood-spattered, feminine face. She was quite pretty, in Naruto's opinion. It was just too bad she was fighting on the wrong side of things today. All right, up you get, he said as he lifted the girl bodily into his arms and half-carried, half-dragged her to the edge of the bridge, where he leaned her against the railing. Kiba joined him a moment later, while Ino slowly worked Tazana over to their position. Caution was always the best part of valor. So, what do we do with her? Kiba questioned, his gaze locked on their captive. His eyes were oddly appraising, calculating even. It was far from the usual reaction he had when faced with a pretty girl. Even he realized the situation they were in. Naruto sighed. He had planned the combat expertly while in the heat of the moment, and now he hadn't the faintest idea of what to do. Life was funny like that sometimes. I've got no idea, he finally admitted. I figured Asuma would want someone to question afterwards, and we all know we wouldn't get shit from Zabuza. 
So are we just supposed to wait here for Sensei? Ino asked as she arrived on the scene with Tazuna in tow, wind whipping through her hair from the discharge of one of Asuma's few Utenjutsu. She gave both Naruto and Kiba a once over, checking them for injuries. Her eyes lingered on Naruto for a few extra moments. He locked eyes with the girl and nodded once, conveying that he was alright. He sighed once more. I guess? It came out as more of a question. Kill, me. The soft voice of the hunter piped up weakly. Four heads spun to regard the girl in stunned silence. WH what? Eno finally squeaked. Enemies asking to be killed wasn't something Team 10 was familiar with. Naruto and Kiba just stared. I want to protect the person important to me. I want to work for that person. I want to fight for that person. I want to make that person's dream come true. That is my dream, the girl muttered, more to herself than to Team 10 and Tazana. I failed in my dream. I've realized, my existence is no longer needed. Naruto shook himself from his stupor. What's your name? He asked gently, far more gently than he had ever asked anyone anything before. It was almost as if he feared the girl would break if he raised his voice. Haku, was the whispered reply. Well, Haku, we're gonna get you patched up a bit. He held his hand up to stall any protest the girl may have had. We're not gonna kill you, Haku, so you may as well get used to it. We have some questions we need to ask you. The girl seemed to pull herself together for a single moment, almost looking outraged at the notion that they wouldn't honor her wish to be killed, but then wilted, falling back against the support beam. Naruto turned to Ino. See what you can do for her. We don't need her pass. An earth-shattering explosion rocked the bridge suddenly, followed by a large gust of wind that cleared the mist from the bridge in one fell swoop. Naruto steadied himself against the bridge's railing as he gazed into the area where the explosion came from. His eyes widened. Trench knives in hand, Asuma stood in the remnants of a great ash cloud, battered, bruised, and cut. His vest was nearly sliced in half, and the blood stains could be seen clearly even from a distance. The Jonin stood like a great statue of a hero of the old times, weapons brandished as he engaged a monster of legend and brought it to its knees. The eyes of the blonde were drawn to the second form on the bridge. Zabuza kneeled in the center of the concrete construct, Cleaver discarded in front of him in the wake of the excessive amount of third-degree burns covering his exposed skin, the explosion having burned through his sleeveless top. A shinobi who's willing to sacrifice everything for his goals, Asuma said as he strode toward Zabuza, trench knives glowing with extended wind chakra sharpened to a four-foot blade. Everything, including the very people you seek to control. That's not what a shinobi does. Zabuza glared. I don't give a shit what you think a shinobi should do. I fight for my own goals. You fought for your own goals, Asuma corrected. And you die for your own goals. Three things happen at once. Asuma brought his blade down in a vertical slash that would bisect Zabuza, the Kirigakura no Kijin raised his head to death, and Ino gave a squeal of surprise as she was unceremoniously bowled over. It was the third that caught Naruto's attention. He turned to regard his teammate, only to find her sprawled on the bridge. Haku was gone, an ice mirror left in her place. Oh no. In a single, momentary heartbeat of total clarity, Naruto knew exactly what would happen. He spun to face Asuma and Zabuza to warn his sensei, but by then it was far too late. A single ice mirror stood between Haku and Zabuza, slowly melting as its creator bled out onto the concrete, Asuma's trench knife having neatly eviscerated the hunter Nin. The Jonin stood transfixed by the sight of the young girl in front of him, shocked beyond words. Zabuza was the only one who didn't seem to be moving in slow motion his body already moving to capitalize on the opportunity. It was all over in the blink of an eye, in one slash of the blade. And Team 10 watched, transfixed. Hey, one hell of a kid, giving a chance like that. Sure can pick him. Zabuza stood, cleaver in hand, a vicious smirk upon his face as he towered over the bodies of Asuma and Haku, their heads separated from their necks as blood flowed freely onto the bridge. Chapter 7, Lesser Evils. Slash tilde slash. Hey. Who'd have thought picking up some run off the street would pay off so well? Zabuza's voice carried over the bridge effortlessly, even with the mist and its auditory amplification effects gone. The Kirigakura no Kijin stood over the headless bodies of Asuma and Haku, hunched over from exhaustion as he fingered the handle of his massive cleaver. Blood covered him, having spurted as if a fountain from the necks of his two victims. His black muscle shirt was stained with dark splotches that looked right at home on the man named the Demon of the Mist. Kubi Kirabocho shone like the sun was bathing it in light, despite the clouds and low-lying mist. Its presence made for a chilling picture when next to its blood-drenched wielder. 
An idle swipe of his hand removed his bandages. Blood soaked as they were, it was getting hard to breath. He tossed them to the concrete without a glance. And now for the brats, he former Kiri Anbu growled with a sinister snarl. Naruto noticed none of this, however, so focused he was on the prone form of Asuma, headless in death. Blood flowed freely from the two parts that had once been his sensei, drenching he formerly grey concrete and dying it red. Sensei? He thought weakly in his mind. His inner thoughts no more than a whisper as shock set in. All at once, memories of the battle on the bridge assaulted his mind without warning. Naruto's eyes widened for but a moment as red-hot needles threatened to break from his skull and spill out. He gripped a kunai as the hunter nin spun toward him, senbone in his good hand. The two blades met in the middle, the hunter showing a surprising amount of strength for such a lithe body, as Naruto noticed for the first time. Naruto used his second hand to bring a second blade to bear and slashed out, slicing the hunter's kimono as he spun away. I don't want to kill you, the hunter spoke, voice sounding solemn. But I will kill my heart in this case. You are far too dangerous. I am sorry. Naruto's eyes gleamed as his kunai sliced through long black hair, and the hunter moved to make space. Not so fast. Naruto thought as he brought his leg up and out in vicious, chakra enhanced thrust kick. The hunter attempted to block with both forearms, but the kick proved too much as the shinobi was sent sailing through the air, directly toward the kunai Naruto had thrown before. Hey, one hell of a kid, giving a chance like that. Sure can pick him. Zabuza stood, cleaver in hand, a vicious smirk upon his face as he towered over the bodies of Asuma and Haku, their heads separated from their necks as blood flowed freely onto the bridge. Blue eyes widened as Naruto was ripped from his thoughts by Zabuza's taunting voice. Is this the first time you've seen someone fall in battle? The demon asked, disgust dripping from his voice. He scoffed. Greenhorn Janan. To think, Haku had so much trouble with you. I suppose he was weak after all. The boy never could kill that heart of his. Naruto, and Team 10, was silent as Zabuza rambled. A scream threatened to break from Naruto's lips as his eyes stayed rooted on the rapidly cooling corpse of his sensei. This isn't happening. It's not true. He screamed internally. It couldn't be happening. Not after everything they'd been through. Asuma just couldn't be dead. The Janan dimly realized that Zabuza was speaking again. When I was your age, I already had blood on my hands. Leaders of it, from dozens of kills. The man trailed off, seemingly in fond remembrance. The demon Zabuza, they called me. A boy who slaughtered an entire graduating class of Miss Janan when he was only nine. A smile uglier than anything Naruto had ever seen broke across Zabuza's face. And it felt so good. Naruto closed his eyes as the man's words washed over him. He was hearing them as if from very far away, his attention still focused entirely on Asuma. Thump. His heartbeat thumped out the seconds in his ears, overshadowing the demon of the mist's words effortlessly. Thump. The click of the handle of Kubi Kirabocho sounded as Zabuza hefted the blade to the level of his shoulder without effort. Until your names appear in my bingo book, you're not real shinobi in my mind. A short chuckle that sounded more like a cough escaped his throat. The man gently massaged his bruises that the Konoha Jonin had left with him. Hey, too bad you won't live long enough to get there. Thump. I'll never forgive you. Naruto yelled in his mind, his voice no longer a whisper in the dark. His eyes were squeezed shut as if not opening them would make Asuma's death less real. Blood coated the underside of his fingernails as they dug into his clenched fists. Images of a sewer, a great cage lined with hundreds of bars flashed in front of his eyes. Crimson eyes snapped open in the dark as if from a great slumber, and Naruto felt painful warmth wash over him, coating his muscles and bones as if from the inside. It's about time. Too bad really, Zabuza was saying. You kids have got talent. The battlefield's no place for children, though. Thump. Finger and toenail sharpened into claws, muscles bulged for a moment before relaxing as lactic acid was flushed from them, chakra flowing at an accelerated rate through Naruto's whole body, chakra crackled like electricity down nerve endings, sending instantaneous impulses that impacted the adrenal glands, the chemical heightening Naruto's reflexes beyond anything capable by a shinobi of his age. Whisker marks elongated and deepened along Naruto's face, and Zabuza finally took notice of the increased chakra output literally spilling from the Janan. Black eyes narrowed to slits as he gripped his cleaver and leapt forward, his shinobi instinct to kill the Janan before anything untoward happened overriding his curiosity. It was too late. Pupils slit down the center, red eyes snapped open as a wave of killing intent that brought Tazuna, Ino, and Kiba to their knees struck Zabuza like a hammer blow. 
His forward progress was halted abruptly as his eyes widened. What the fuck? No Jinan should be able to produce this kind of murderous intent. Naruto, however, cared little for Zabuza's concerns, as his eyes finally left the prone corpse of his sensei, zeroing in on the object of his rage. I'll kill you. Concrete cracked, dust sprayed upward, and chakra exploded as Naruto burst forward toward Zabuza in a show of raw speed that his sensei wouldn't have been able to match. Only instincts born of countless battles saved Zabuza as death soared toward him. A hasty duck and a thrust of Kubi Kirabocho put the massive blade in the path of the Jinan's new claws, and Zabuza's black eyes watched in shock as the tempered steel was carved into, the sound of metal cracking and scraping sending shivers down his spine. He didn't know what the fuck had happened to the blonde kid, but he knew that he had to make space fast. Naruto, however, wasn't about to let that happen. Clawed swipes that resembled punches tore through the air at Zabuza, the former Jonin using all of his speed and reflexes just to avoid being rent in two. He wasn't fast enough, though, and Naruto's claws met vulnerable flesh with a sickening tear as Zabuza's pain sensors overrode his pride. The demon of the mist screamed. The pain ignited his reflexes, however, and the former Anbu leapt away from Naruto with speed born of desperation, blood dripping from four gashes in his chest. Naruto led him, his mind at war with baser instincts and rage that threatened to overwhelm him totally. Inside Naruto's mind, the boy knelt, hands clasped to his head as if in pain as red chakra swirled about in the sewer that was his mindscape. On the outside, his body moved on instinct. The boy shifted into a crouch for but an instant before he was gone from sight. Zabuza was far more ready for round two, though, the red corona of visible power surrounding the Jinan giving away his position through the rudimentary sunshine long before Zabuza saw him. Muscles screamed as Zabuza torqued his body more sharply than ever had before, Kubi Kirabocho's flat edge swinging in a wide arc that impacted the charging Naruto with a hard thump and a crack that heralded shattered ribs. The blonde Janan was airborne before he knew what to do with himself, and pain assaulted him for but a moment before the healing abilities of the Kubi's Yuki asserted itself. He landed heavily on his back and stayed there for less than a moment, springing back to his feet from his hands. The blow to his chest had done more than just hurt, however. Naruto's consciousness had awoken from its internal struggle, and the boy was finally back in control of his finer motor functions. Naruto glanced down at his hands in detached wonder, and with more than a little fear, beholding the claws that had grown from his fingers. His mind was in three places at once, all wondering what the hell happened to him, before common sense and knowledge was reasserted themselves in his brain. QB, was all he thought, though his inner voice was quiet and hard to hear over the pounding in his ears. It was all that needed to be thought, for it answered all of the questions the blonde could have about what he was currently experiencing. No aches, no pain. Hell, he felt great. The feeling didn't last long, as near precognitive reactions had him ducking backwards under a sword swipe that would have made him as headless as his sensei. A swift, effortless backflip that revealed dexterity that Naruto hadn't previously possessed created space between the two combatants. Naruto was barely on his feet before he had retrieved and released a kunai from his hip pouch, accelerated reflexes working perfectly with his accelerated arm motion so as to make a perfect throw. Zabuza raised his cleaver to block the knife, and it clanged off the tempered steel before coming to rest on the concrete of Tazana's bridge. Naruto paid it no mind as his body slipped into a Goken stance, the result of nigh endless hours of mind-numbing and knuckle-breaking training making the shift effortless. One hand was clasped behind his back, the other in front, claws raised to the sky as Naruto stared Zabuza down, murder in his eyes. The whole universe seemed to grind to a halt for a moment as the two shinobi locked eyes. No words were spoken, but then, none were needed. Naruto exploded force with all the grace and subtlety of a hurricane as the world kicked into high gear once more. Zabuza crouched low and raised his left arm to block a telegraphed roundhouse kick that promised to break stone. The blow never came, however, as the blonde merely passed through Zabuza's outstretched arm like a ghost. Bunshine. The former Jonin thought in alarm. A quick pivot saved his head, literally, as Naruto's claws passed mere millimeters from Zabuza's neck in a controlled swipe. Swiftly pressing his advantage, Naruto burst into Zabuza's guard with a furious flurry of punches and clawed slashes, determined, though not consciously aware of it, to keep the Kirigakura no Kijin in a taijutsu battle. He wanted no part of the man's ninjutsu. Zabuza made to make space, and Naruto lunged forward before he distantly realized that he had been had. The demon of the mist pressed forward before Naruto knew what had happened, bringing his decapitating knife to bear in a reverse grip strike at Naruto's chest level. 
reflexes beyond human comprehension had muscles firing on all cylinders in Naruto's chakra-enhanced body, and the Janan was barely in control of his own motions as he planted one hand on the blade and pushed, using the momentum and direction to spin his body over the sweeping strike in a barrel roll. He landed on all fours, grabbed a kunai from his hip pouch, and buried it in Zabuza's right shoulder with a savage snarl. Blood spurted from the wound, but Zabuza was both expecting and conditioned to the pain. The former Anbu ignored it, let momentum go to work, and simply kept spinning, planning to let his blade decapitate Naruto on the back end of his sweep. His instincts didn't let him finish, however, and his spin was halted as he jumped deftly in order to avoid having his legs swept by the chakra-empowered Janan. Naruto met the former Jonin with reflexes and reaction time beyond Zabuza's comprehension, and certainly beyond what Naruto had been capable of before. A quick pivot on his hands and a thrust kick had Naruto shooting the Kirigakura no Kijin skyward as his blow landed on the underside of Zabuza's chin. The Janan landed on all fours once more, before disappearing in a burst of red chakra. The emote Renge required speed and power almost unreachable by normal ninja, and the creator of it had compensated for it by opening the first of the celestial gates. Naruto was no normal ninja when under the influence of the Kyuubi's chakra though, and, while the technique was almost unusable in his hands under normal circumstances, being unable to open the gates, the demon's Yuki more than made up the difference. He reappeared behind the prone and airborne Zabuza in a perfect cage buyo, before planting four of his sharpened nails in the man's exposed back. Using his grip for leverage, Naruto flipped and positioned his body so that his head was at Zabuza's feet. The Janan locked his arms around the man's legs, his ankles snapping to either side of Zabuza's neck to keep him totally immobile. Chakra exploded into a visible corona as Naruto forced his body to spin in mid-air as gravity went to work. The two combatants were an indistinguishable blur to any observing eyes as they fell, Naruto's chakra rapidly gathering in his feet. That chakra exploded outward as Zabuza's head met the concrete, liquefying flesh, bone, and brain matter while simultaneously providing Naruto with a cushion. The impact was felt by everyone on the bridge as the two shinobi came back down to earth with an almighty crash. Dust was sent skyward and the force channeled by the supports rippled across the concrete, knocking Kiba, Ino, and Tazuna to their back as 20-foot radial fractures spread from the point of impact. Naruto hopped off the now headless Zabuza without ceremony, red chakra still racing around and across his body as he silently regarded the corpse. The Janan was silent as his red eyes rose to meet those of his teammates. Distantly, he felt sorrow for what their reactions would be to his big secret being revealed. It was overridden, however, by the blood pounding in his ears. The smell of fear hit Naruto before the sound of clapping made itself known. The boy turned slowly to regard a small horde of mercenaries, a stubby man in a business suit at the head. It was unmistakably Gato. Well, the man began, his voice surprisingly steady as he strode forward with a swagger that belied his fear. Fear that Naruto could smell. I had brought all these nice men with me today in order to deal with Zabuza, but you seem to have done me a favor, boy. Thank you. The short man laughed at the irony of the situation. I never intend to pay any of the shinobi I hire, you see, they cost far too much. I let them do their work, tire themselves out, and then kill them off with numbers. It's a nice little operation I use. The man smirked viciously as he stepped over Zabuza's blade. Disgust rippled through Naruto despite his detachment from his feelings. It was a testament to how much he hated this man that he could actually feel it through the pleasant yet painful haze of the Kyuubi's Yuki. Gato would die this day, he just didn't know it yet. Gato, was all the rage-fueled boy managed to grate out. It seemed to please the man, though the guttural growl by which it had been delivered seemed to unnerve the man. Indeed I am, boy, the stumpy man said. I'd ask for your name, but I'm not all that interested in dead people. The thugs behind him laughed menacingly, brandishing their assorted weapons in what they thought was a threatening manner. Naruto was far from impressed as he began a slow march forward. That only seemed to amuse the man further, though the smell of fear wafting off the man increased. Look at this one, men. Gato crowed as the assorted thugs laughed at Naruto's stupidity. Don't try to be a hero, kid. It'll only hurt before you die. Naruto said nothing as he continued his march, nearing the assembled group with palpable murder in his eyes. A kunai found itself in Naruto's hand and began spinning around his finger. Gato had stopped laughing as the Janan got ever closer, taking a step back in apprehension as the boy refused to stop. He was an instant away from ordering his men to attack the crazy kid, but he never got the chance. Naruto's kunai was buried to the hilt in the chest of the thug standing directly behind Gato, having passed through the shipping magnate's exposed throat like a hot knife through butter. 
The stumpy man dropped to his knees as if in shock, blood spilling from the gaping wound lie water from a broken canteen. Naruto paid him little mind as he shoved him aside, now at a full sprint, reaching down to snatch Zabuza's cleaver from its resting place on the bridge. Neither the balance point, fine though it was, nor the weight registered in Naruto's mind. All that the boy cared about, however distantly, was that it channeled chakra like nothing else he had ever laid his hands on. Disruptive wind chakra infused with Yuki crackled madly as it rippled down Kubi Kirabocho, and Naruto turned his body so that the assembled thugs could see his back. Coiling and uncoiling like a spring, Naruto hurled the massive decapitating knife at the crowd of mercenaries at speeds almost too fast to track. The sword, spinning like a shuriken, passed through the first man unlucky enough to be in its path as easily as if he were made of water. Wind enhanced as it was, it didn't stop there living up to its name as it cleaved through three more men before it escaped the four lines the thugs had formed at the entrance to the bridge, finally coming to a stop as it hit the ground, its momentum spent. Blood spilled from the halves of the victims like water from a broken canteen. One poor soul had been unfortunate enough to be close to the spinning blade's path, but not close enough to have been granted the mercy of death. His arm lay on the ground, neatly sliced off above the elbow as blood flowed from the wound. Another lay dead on the concrete, having had his chest tagged with disruptive chakra that splayed off the blade in rivulets. The living man's screams drew the rest of the assembled thugs' attention from the dead bodies as they turned as one to watch in morbid fascination as the man, formerly a samurai, quickly bled out. Naruto paid no such attention. Bursting forth, the boy left cracks in the concrete as latent chakra was forced into the bridge from Naruto's speed. A blurring after image of the blonde was left in his place, so great was his chakra-enhanced speed as he hurtled toward the small army. Cracks and dust exploded from the bridge as Naruto stopped in front of the nearest mercenary, crouched with a hand on the ground and his foot poised to snap to the man's chin. One moment, the man stood, transfixed by the sight of the monster in front of him. The next, he was airborne with a sickening crack that spoke of a broken spine as Naruto neatly snapped a thrust kick to his chin. The Jinan didn't even bother with the cage buyo in favor of moving on to his next victim. Naruto subconsciously slipped into Gokan, the deadly and bruising style of a man whose tutelage had boosted Naruto to second in his class. A spinning back fist shattered the skull of one mercenary. An improvised punch that sent claws forward instead of knuckles claimed the life of the next. Vulnerable flesh was rent effortlessly as Naruto literally ripped the throat out of one man unlucky enough to be in his path. It took a total of six seconds and nine dead men to capture the full attention of the assembled mercenaries. Weapons were drawn hastily, hefted in front of them as an impotent defense against the miniature monster in front of them, poised to slaughter them all on a whim. Naruto had stopped, however, directly above the still sputtering and paralyzed Gato. A kunai slipped into his hand from his hip pouch and began to spin around one of his fingers. It had a hypnotic effect on the small army, as the eyes of every man on the bridge was drawn to the small, spinning knife. They all knew what was about to happen, were powerless to stop it, and couldn't look away even if they had wanted to. Without ceremony, Without warning, Naruto buried the kunai hilt deep in Gato's back, blood spurting forth from the wound in rivulets as the blade severed the aorta savagely. It was withdrawn just a brutally, red life water covering it and dripping down to the now liberally stained concrete. The kunai began spinning on Naruto's finger once more, flecks of blood flying off in all directions, most landing on the right side of Naruto's face. Blood dripped off the boy's claws and splashed to the concrete, the soft noise all the more deafening in the silence of the bridge that was all it took for the dam to break. All it took was a single man to turn and flee, before all the rest got the idea that they had a much better chance of surviving if they weren't anywhere near the blonde ninja turned monster. Most of the men sprinted back toward the forested land that was fire country, while a few others dove off the bridge and into the water in their attempt to escape. Naruto stood silently throughout the whole process, watching with a dispassionate eye as many men tripped over themselves in their haste. The fox's chakra was slowly leaving his chakra coils, the process seemingly instinctive despite Naruto not having any experience with it. Without boosting his system beyond human capabilities, Naruto once more felt every little ache and pain in his body. He ignored them, however, in favor of watching the crashing waves that gave this country its name. His mental faculties had returned to full strength, finally. To think, he had thought of this country as beautiful just earlier this day, as some place that he would love to return to. Now, it would only be a memory. A blood-stained memory filled with sorrow, self-loathing for all that he had done, and pain. He would never return here. Naruto himself turned, numbly, after several long moments that seemed to last an eternity and an instant all at once, and began moving back to his still shell-shocked teammates, 
Red eyes reverting to blue as the QB's chakra left his system. Sea foam blue and brown eyes regarded him as he passed in between the surviving member of Team 10, past the quivering Tazana, and to the limp and headless body of Sarutobi Asuma. The stupefied eyes of Ino and Kiba watched silently as Uzumaki Naruto dropped to his knees in front of the man who had been the closest thing he had had to a father, and wept. His body shuddered with emotion for a moment, before going limp, exhaustion finally taking hold of him. Slash tilde slash. Looking back, he supposed it was rather like a dream. You never know how exactly you get to where you are, but you're always there. Right in the middle of the action. Right when it matters most. There is no true beginning to it, or if there is, you never remember it. The only thing that could possibly disprove the thought that it was a dream was the fact that he could remember it as vividly as anything. You can never remember dreams after the fact, at least not with any true clarity. He supposed that it could have been a nightmare, but he had lived through a nightmarish existence for the majority of his childhood, if it could be called that. He knew enough about them to know that this wasn't one, no matter how much he would have liked to believe it. The red glow from farther down the long sewer in which he stood spoke of something sinister, something that Naruto, for the life of him, wanted absolutely no part of. The boy knew, however, that that very glow was exactly what he was here for, no matter how much he wished it wasn't the case. With trepidation born of knowledge imparted on him by the Sandaime, Naruto started forward. Water shifted beneath his feet as he approached the crimson glow, chakra control exercises placing on its surface with nary a thought. The boy spared no thought for how he was supposedly controlling chakra within the seal. Minuscule details like that didn't matter right now. Only the palpable aura of murderous intent so thick it could be cut with a kunai mattered at present. Had Naruto not known it was coming, his knees would have buckled. As it was, they almost did. Naruto found himself standing on top of water that would have been up to his knees had he not boosted himself, facing a cage barred by steel beams 200 feet high held closed, impossibly, by a slip of paper. So that's the seal, he thought with a detached sort of wonder. Without warning, crimson eyes 50 feet above Naruto's own opened, the pupils focused on Naruto's own with uncanny clarity, menace and hatred beyond the scope of his imagination held within the twin orbs. Then, somehow, the murderous intent became even more pronounced, thicker and heavier. Naruto just barely kept himself standing, though he did sink into the water. He was suffocating. Hands rose to his throat by their own accord, trying to find something to unlatch to allow oxygen into his system. That wasn't the problem though. There wasn't something coiled around his windpipe, restricting his access to air no matter how much he tried to breathe. Nothing was wrapped around his chest, crushing his ribs and lungs. He just couldn't breathe. His lungs wouldn't expand, his diaphragm wouldn't move, his own mouth would barely work to try to force air down his throat. Just as he was about to lose the battle and fall, the pressure disappeared. It didn't recede or slowly reduce itself. It simply vanished as if it had never been there in the first place. Naruto took gulps of air with all the vigor of a starving man given a feast to eat. His mind, however, was focused entirely on the monster looming in front of him. Unknowingly, unconsciously, his respect for the Yondaime, which had taken a nose dive when he had learned of his situation, shot up to its old, godlike levels. How did he fight such a beast? Naruto wondered, in awe of the man who had not only fought the Bijou, but defeated it. Suddenly, the idea of the Yondaime being acknowledged as the greatest shinobi in the history of the world wasn't so far-fetched. That though, mattered little at present. I would like nothing more than to devour you whole, boy, but that would defeat the purpose of this little chat, the QB spoke in a deep, gravelly, unyielding voice that brooked no argument. KQB, was Naruto's whispered response. Internally, the Janan cursed the waver of obvious fear in his voice, but was powerless to stop it. It was an instinctive, primal fear that asserted itself when faced with a being so obviously more powerful than he was. A wave of hot air smacked him in the face, and Naruto realized belatedly that the fox had just exhaled. Yes, boy. I suppose I should be pleased that you at least know that much. I had expected little from a human who had managed to turn his mindscape into a sewer, the fox said with an audible note of sarcasm. Naruto felt vaguely insulted, but conceded the point. There wasn't much he could do to refute it, in any event. He was standing in a sewer. So. He began, his voice made steady through a force of will he hadn't known he possessed. What do you want? Another blast of air hit him square in the face. What do I want, brat? The beast asked, seemingly askance that Naruto would ask such a question. What I want is to devour you where you stand. What I want is to break free from this prison and finish what I started in that pitiful village you call home. To set that hovel aflame with my power, 
devour each and every one of those fools who celebrated my so-called death, destroy every monument to your precious Yondame, and find and torture the human who calls himself Uchiha Madara for the rest of eternity. Naruto was growing steadily more horrified with each passing word, his ability to breathe leaving him once more as the massive killing intent returned bit by bit, choking him all the while. And, once more, it evaporated as if it had never been present. Unfortunately, boy, the beast said, it's rant finished, that is impossible at present. The huge eyes snapped to Naruto's own once more. Unless, of course, you would be so kind as to remove that slip of paper. The phrase was said mockingly. The fox knew full well that Naruto would do no such thing. Not after that last declaration. Still, Naruto shook his head. A deep rumbling that shook the very ground Naruto stood upon reverberated throughout the sewer that was Naruto's mindscape. It took a moment for Naruto to realize the Kyuubi was laughing. It wasn't a pleasant sound. I thought not. Red eyes bored into Naruto, making him fidget as fear took hold even without the monstrous killing intent. He was nothing to this being, and he knew it. Almost unconsciously, he brought his, meager, chakra to bear in a preemptive attempt to stave off what little of the fox's chakra he could. The fox, however, simply ignored the life energy, not bothering to deign it with a response of every kind. It didn't even bother to mock Naruto. You asked me what I want, boy, and I told you. What you're here for is something different, the QB spoke. It had Naruto's attention. I wish to deal. Naruto's eyebrows threatened to take flight. Deal? He asked incredulously, working up some nerve to actually talk back to the monster in front of him. Do you think I'm a fool, QB? He hadn't been privy to many folk tales as a child, but he knew better than to strike a deal with a being that might as well be the devil. That nerve promptly disappeared when the beast narrowed its eyes, though the killing intent didn't return. You would be a fool not to, boy. You have seen and experienced firsthand what my power is capable of, the fox growled. My chakra allowed you to reach a level of power you thought unimaginable. My power allowed for you to kill men against whom your meager skills would have left you dead. Naruto shook his head quickly. Despite the truth in the words, truth he had been forced to acknowledge even as he had killed Zabuza with ease, he wasn't about to make a deal with the Nine Tails. I don't want your power, QB. I don't want your power beast came to mind, but he decided against tempting the monster's temper. The rumbling laughter returned. Don't you, brat? I have been privy to your innermost thoughts since you were old enough to have them. Power is all you desire in this world, boy. The power to crush all of your enemies and leave them dead at your feet the power to defend your so-called friends. The fox bared its teeth in a grotesque imitation of a grin. The power to survive. Naruto looked to his feet. He knew the fox was right. The past four years of his life had been spent trying to get stronger in what often seemed to be a futile attempt to survive against what were likely S-rank shinobi after his life. Power was all that mattered to them, so it had become almost all that mattered to Naruto. I offer you all the power you would need and more power beyond what you had previously thought capable would be at your disposal. The very ability to crush those who would see you dead would be at your very fingertips, the QB said, its gravelly voice pouring golden honey into Naruto's ears. Naruto's eyes clouded with doubt. There was little to refute the beast's claims, for Naruto indeed had been witness to the very power the beast spoke of. Having a source of chakra that would never run dry and which could boost his own abilities beyond anything humanly possible certainly wasn't a bad thing especially given the very people who Naruto sought to destroy were so far beyond him. It would be like the ultimate trump card. Still though, he was wary. And if I say no? He asked, his voice betraying the fact that he wouldn't, in fact, say no. It was a question asked simply for the sake of it. The beast's head moved up and down in what could pass for a shrug. It imitated human idiosyncrasies quite well. Imagine that same power you would deny turned against you, it said simply. Naruto looked up sharply. That old man you bowed to made you well aware of our relationship. My chakra passes through this seal and into you. You know this, so know that everything you hold dear, those very skills you bled for, can be taken from you on a whim. Know that everything you pride yourself on exists at my tolerance. Naruto did what little he could in order to maintain his decorum, but was failing miserably. He knew that the QB's chakra passed through the seal, the Sandaime had told him as much, but he hadn't thought that the fox would be able to do anything with it once it left the seal. Even taken forcibly from the QB, it made sense that the beast would still be able to exert some control over its power. Much like how Genjutsu allowed for ninja to use their chakra to manipulate their targets while in their own body. Naruto nodded in acceptance of the beast's point. He certainly didn't want what the fox was describing. 
And if I accept your deal, he stressed the last word with regained nerve and emphasis. What you receive in return. Nothing like what you're proposing is free. Not from a being like you when unspoken. The fox did not smile, though Naruto could sense that the bijou was pleased. In return, I ask two things. Naruto nodded hesitantly. That sounded rather reasonable. Firstly, that you would use the power gifted to you whenever necessary. You and I both know that when you die, I get dragged with you. An audible note of rage colored the fox's voice at this. I have no wish for that to happen before absolutely necessary. You know about this, seal, the beast spat the word seal like a curse, from that man whom you bow to. Your own chakra reinforces it unconsciously, unless otherwise occupied. When Naruto looked up, askance as the beast's threat from earlier played over in his mind, the QB cut him off before he even got going, do not presume that I cannot follow through, boy, merely that it would be difficult. The fox pinned him with a piercing stare. I believe neither you nor I wish for it to come to that, it growled. Naruto nodded once more. He most certainly didn't wish to have the beast's power turned against him. He had planned to use the power anyway, though he would only use the chakra as a last resort. Despite the obvious boons, there were also drawbacks that the beast had smoothly ignored. He knew that Yuki was poisonous to humans in large enough quantities, he had done some serious research on the bijou after his secret had been revealed to him, and he had no wish to poison himself if he didn't have to. Accepted, was all he said in return. The second is a man by the name of Uchiha Madara. Naruto started at the name, though it had been mentioned once before. The fox nodded. Yes, you've heard of him. I want him dead, boy, and painfully so. Since I cannot do this from my current lodgings, the task falls to you. It shouldn't present much of a problem, as you were already planning to kill him. When Naruto opened his mouth, a question on the tip of his tongue, the fox interrupted once more. Information about that man will be revealed to you in due time, though there is little you need to know about him other than his rule over a group of humans who called themselves Uchiha, and that his chakra was more sinister than even my own. The QB shook its head. My relationship with that man is not to be questioned. Is that clear? Naruto kept his silence as he pondered the deal, of course the sentiment was clear. He didn't question the QB's hatred of Madara, at least not openly. It was likely a sore subject filled with residual anger that Naruto wanted no part of. A small bubble of humor threatened to well up in him as he envisioned some embarrassing history between the two. The QB had obviously come out the loser in whatever conflict they had had. The humor disappeared as soon as it had hit. That familiar bubble of fear, the one he had ruthlessly tried to crush over the years, when he thought of the man who was likely the mastermind behind Akatsuki's plot against him, rose up once more. If the man was good enough to get the better of the QB of all things. Naruto didn't want to think about the kind of power at the man's disposal. The boy's mind returned to the deal he and the fox were striking when another blast of hot air struck him in the face. The beast was impatient, it seemed. It was a good deal, almost too good. It wasn't about to stop him though, and the fox had said itself that it didn't want Naruto dead. There was no drawback to that. Still, there was one sticking point. With your power, I want to make sure that my mind isn't overshadowed like it was at first on the bridge. I need to be in control of my own body. The fox hesitated for a moment, but nodded its head in acceptance. Agreed, boy. Do we have a deal? Naruto took a deep breath, hesitating once more in the face of a choice that would likely change his life. He consoled himself with the knowledge that this power would allow him to better survive, a goal he had been working toward for years now. If he had to, he would simply refrain from using the beast's power. With any luck, he would be able to properly avoid Akatsuki for a few years to come. That would hopefully be enough time to get to an acceptable level where he could at least hold his own. He would use the fox's power then, and only then. Besides, it wasn't like he would be up against similarly powerful opponents anytime soon. A and S rank shinobi didn't grow on trees. Resolve hardened to determination in Naruto's mind, and a single nod happened almost of its own accord. We have a deal. The QB simply nodded. Deep within the mind of the bijou, hidden from Naruto by a force of will sharpened over a millennia, the fox smiled. Slash tilde slash. So, what exactly does that mean? Naruto sighed for what seemed to be the thousandth time that day. It had been an unspoken, unanimous decision to stay and help with the cleanup effort after the battle on the bridge, despite the searing grief Team 10 was in. It was what Asuma would have wanted, had been the rationale. The previous day had been cleaning up the mess at the bridge, the majority of the city's population had turned out to help, not that Team 10 truly cared. The idea behind it, though unspoken, was to keep the minds of the Jinan off Asuma's death. Unfortunately, 
with the general population doing most of the work, it left Team 10 with nothing to do but sit, think, and talk. That, of course, led to Naruto fielding questions about his mysterious near transformation back on the bridge, as the Janan certainly had no wish to think or talk about what had happened to Asuma. The man's death would be an open wound for some time to come. There had been more than a little residual fear of Naruto and his two teammates, rightfully so, it wasn't every day that your blonde friend went on a rampage. The fear had only disappeared when Naruto had sought to clear up the mess, assuring them that he was, in fact, completely in control of the power he had shown at the bridge. It wasn't a lie, but they were still understandably wary. Somewhat optimistically, he noticed that they were far more contemplative than wary. Having no wish to either deceive his friends or beat around the bush, Naruto had taken the direct route, outright stating that he housed the QB and that the beast's chakra flowing into his system had caused the minor and major changes his team had seen in him. It had been silent in the room for nearly a quarter of an hour since, only now broken by Kiba's question. Naruto didn't exactly have high hopes about his friends' reactions, but they seemed to be taking the news well, all things considered. It means exactly what I said, Naruto said with a long-suffering note in his voice. The QB is sealed in my chakra system, and I have some limited access to its chakra and mind. Nothing more, nothing less. Kiba was silent once more, the dog ninja scratching the ears of his partner in contemplation. Naruto didn't much care about the silence, it was certainly better than any screaming that might have originally resulted from his friends in his opinion. He would be patient, this wasn't something that could be rushed, as he knew from his own experience. He had taken the better part of a sleepless night to come to terms with what the Yondaime had done to him, and he still had lingering questions, unanswerable questions, whirling about in his mind even now. How? Ino asked softly. How could someone actually do something like that? The girl mumbled ambiguously, more to herself than to anyone else. Naruto remained silent as the girl met his eyes for the first time in 20 minutes. He held her gaze for what felt like an eternity, silently trying to convey the message that he was the same Naruto from three days ago, that nothing had changed in him, that he was the same Naruto that Ino knew. He didn't bother trying to answer the girl's question. After a few more minutes of oppressive silence, Naruto spoke once more. From what little I know, there's no real way to kill a bijou. Their chakra constructs given form through excessive human emotion. It's only possible to seal their chakra someplace. A sigh escaped his lips once more. I just happen to be that someplace. Do you know why? Ino asked gently, far more gently than Naruto had ever heard her before. She seemed almost afraid that he would break if she spoke too loudly. No. Naruto shook his head. The Sandaime probably has some idea, but if he does, he won't tell me. To my knowledge, I was just born in the wrong place at the wrong time. But how can he not tell you? Ino burst out. Naruto nearly jumped at the intensity in the girl's voice. Kiba looked up sharply from where he had been petting Akamaru. I mean, it's your life, right? Who has more right to know than you? She asked incredulously. I've been asking myself that for months. It's his decision, was the simple answer. He had long tried to rationalize the Sandaime's silence about both his condition and how it came to be and that was the best he had come up with. The Hokage could do what he wished. Naruto simply had to live with it. Bullshit. Ino was pacing now. It was a habit of hers whenever she got worked up. Naruto and Kiba shared a quick, unsure glance. He has no right to keep something like that from you. Naruto weathered the girl's anger with stoicism he hadn't known he possessed. It wasn't about what was right, Ino, it's about security. For all I know, I could have some nearly extinct bloodline that genetically predisposes me to holding the fox. Naruto's tone clearly suggested that he didn't think that was the case. It's exactly why he didn't tell me about the fox until just recently too. Having known me when I was younger, do you think it would have been a good idea to tell me about something like that? He let the rhetoric sit for a few moments. Of course it wouldn't have been a good idea. The same principle applies to this. And you just roll with that? Kiba raised an eyebrow. The dog boy had been surprisingly quiet about the whole thing, preferring to let Naruto explain and Ino ask questions to this point. Naruto shrugged. There's not too much I can do about it, really. I try not to think about it for the most part, preferring to just do what I can about what I can actually control. Naruto neglected to mention that this was only a recent attitude adjustment. The info is distributed on a need-to-know basis only. It's why I didn't tell you guys straight out. So why does the whole village need to know? Ino asked harshly, though it wasn't directed at Naruto, only the situation. The girl had unknowingly echoed one of Naruto's more frustrating questions from when he had first learned of the QB. I assume that this is why you get all those stares back home? 
Naruto nodded as he met the Yamanaka's eyes. Some people found out early on, and Sarutobi let the rest know so as not to start a mass panic due to a rumor. He created a law that made letting anyone in the younger generation in on the secret, myself included, punishable by death. S-Class, Ino and Kiba murmured at the same time. Naruto gave each of them a nod. Ino finally finished her pacing, whatever anger she had had either spent or reserved for later. Kiba had shifted back to playing with Akamaru. Naruto glanced at both of his teammates in turn, inwardly shocked and nervous at the lack of reaction they were having. Aside from the conversation, both Ino and Kiba seemed to be moving on like things were the same as ever. That's it? The blonde asked with trepidation. Both his teammates looked to him in surprise. What's it? Kiba asked in confusion. This. Naruto flailed his arms about, gesticulating wildly at the room in their group. I expected a bit more of a, reaction, he finished. Of all of the scenarios Naruto had envisioned, calm acceptance was at the bottom of the most likely to happen list. Kiba and Ino shared a quick glance, each a bit surprised at Naruto's outburst, but neither confused about it. They knew enough about their teammate to know that he led less than an ideal life back in Konoha, and that it was mostly due to the citizens who subtly ostracized him, even in front of their own eyes. Well, Ino started calmly. It doesn't really change anything, now does it? You're still Naruto, right? The Yamanaka shrugged. You've had this thing for longer than we've been a team, so it's not like it's some recent change. Naruto nodded hesitantly, not quite believing the words coming from his female teammate. What did you expect? Kiba asked with an all too familiar smirk. Give us some damn credit. We're not like them, Naruto, Ino stated. No explanation for who them was was needed. Naruto sat back, his back pressing into the thin plaster walls of Tazuna's house. The boy barely kept a radiant smile from splitting his face as his teammates' acceptance washed over him. He had no idea of what to say, so he simply kept silent. You are still a dick, though, Kiba warned. Naruto snorted loudly, as did Ino, though the girl couldn't stop herself from smacking the back of Kiba's head. The group degenerated into silence once more, each absorbed in their own thoughts. It wasn't a common state of inertia for Team 10, they usually bickered in order to fill the silence, rather than think about their options. Now, however, it was almost a given that they would be absorbed in their own thoughts. Three days ago, their sensei had been cut down, and none would deny the fact that they were more than a little lost without Asuma there to guide them. We're gonna have to move, Kiba said, uncharacteristically subdued. We have to go back home sometime. Agreed, said Naruto. Our mission objective is done. Kazuna's in no more danger now that Gato's dead. Asuma needs to be brought back too, he finished a small stutter at his sensei's name the only inflection in his voice. Ino and Kiba nodded along with him. Neither was particularly willing to stay longer than necessary, the mission's completeness tasting like ashes in their mouths given the loss they sustained. It was a pyrrhic victory at best, and even then, the victory on the bridge hardly felt like anything resembling success. In the minds of Team 10, the mission to wave country had been an unmitigated disaster. Naruto's eyes flickered over to the lone storage scroll laying gently upon one of the pillows in the bedroom now shared by all three Team 10 members. It was impossible to believe that just three days ago, the team had been full, happy, if dysfunctional, and perfectly willing to believe in their own superiority. Now, they were broken, the two parts of their sensei locked away in a storage scroll for easy transport back to Konoha. It was in that instant that Naruto made up his mind. Pack up, he ordered. We're leaving. Ino and Kiba stared at him for one long moment, before they began gathering their belongings without question. No explanation was offered, none was needed. It had taken Team 10 five days to get from Konoha to Wave, but that was with Tazana slowing them down. Without him, at full pace, the Janan trio could make the journey in under 18 hours. At full pace with Link Shunshines interspersed in the running, that time could be cut down to 12. It was not yet 11 o'clock in the morning. Naruto planned to be back in Konoha by midnight. He was getting the fuck out of this Kami forsaken country. The team was packed and ready to go within 20 minutes of Naruto's unheralded order. The last bit to be packed was the storage scroll holding Asuma. The blonde boy gently placed it in his backpack, right on top, fighting the urge to both cry and laugh at the fact that he was, quite literally, be carrying his sensei home. What the fuck is wrong with me? He thought as he stifled a small chuckle. Ino's light touch on his shoulder shook him from his thoughts, and he followed his two teammates out of the bedroom and down the stairs. Kazuna's family was sitting quietly in their kitchen, all three members wearing black out of respect for the man who had taken their plight upon his shoulders with no prompting, 
and had paid the price with his life. Tsunami rose as the three Jinan entered, but said nothing as they passed through without a word. Even the normally expressive Inari, who had become far more positive in the wake of Gato's death, had nothing to say. The Jinan trio was halfway to the tree line surrounding the humble abode when Tazana's voice rang out from behind them. Thank you, was shouted across the clearing, causing the three Jinan to turn as one to face the bridge builder. Regret was written over the man's face like it had never been before, true sorrow for what the ninja children even, had been put through as a result of his actions. He made to say more, but choked on his words. Thank you so much, was all he managed, voice cracking as he turned his gaze to the ground, unable or unwilling to meet the eyes of Team 10. The trio said nothing as they turned as one to the tree line, disappearing from the bridge builder's view as Shunshine carried them away from wave country in a burst of speed and chakra. Chapter 8, Better to Honor. Slash tilde slash. Eyes the color of slate peered over steeped fingers, silently regarding the three children in front of him. No, he corrected himself internally, though his thoughts were clouded. They're far from children now. Even now, the three sets of eyes staring at the ground in front of them were shadowed. Haunted even. It was never a look that should belong on those their age. He knew without looking in a mirror that his eyes held the same quality. It wasn't every day you learned you had lost a son. Unbidden, a lone tear left Sarutobi's right eye. It was quickly removed faster than the eye could blink. He couldn't allow himself to show emotion, not here, not now. He was Hokage. He had troops to lead. The oppressive silence that hung in the Hokage's office after Naruto had related Team Ten's tale could have been cut with a kunai. A single sigh escaped the Sandaime, the quiet exclamation being almost deafening in the circular office. Is that all? He questioned quietly, voice held steady by an unfathomable force of will. Nods from two-thirds of the team greeted him, while Naruto spoke, yes, Hokage-sama. His voice was nearly monotonous, lacking inflection and devoid of emotion. Not for the first time that day did Sarutobi wish to have the smiling, never-ending ball of energy that had once been Uzumaki Naruto back. Despite coping with his own grief over the news of his son's demise, the old man couldn't help but be saddened by the loss of innocence that these shinobi, children, really, had suffered. Naruto especially. Both of his teammates had families to go home to, people to help them cope with the loss of a sensei. Naruto had no one. At one time, he might have had the Sandaime to go to with his problems, but he had voluntarily distanced himself from the Hokage years before. That, however, was likely for the best. Naruto would need to be able to handle his own problems down the road, and he wouldn't always have the aged Hokage's protection. Even if he did, Sarutobi likely wouldn't have been much of a help to the boy, given that he himself was having to cope with the loss of his second son in silence. Not for the first time, Sarutobi reflected on his position. The Hokage's hat truly is a curse, he lamented. In a world where coincidences were heralded as myth, the sad state of affairs that was the Hokage's position could only be considered one. Over time, all the families and clans who had held the seat of Hokage had been whittled down to one. Sarutobi's wayward student was the last of the once great Senju clan, its patriarchs the very founding fathers of the village he now watched over. The last in the Namikaze line, once proud, though small and unheralded until the Yondaime made his mark on the world, sat in front of him, his voice betraying nothing. Sarutobi himself had outlived his wife, his first son, and now his second. He would be damned before he outlived his grandson. A single, solemn nod served as Team 10's dismissal, and the three made for the wooden double doors that led to the rest of the administrative building. Naruto, the Sandaime called. His voice served to halt the whole team in their tracks. The boy in question turned to regard him, face still expressionless. I would like a word. The blonde nodded before turning to his teammates, both of whom looked at him expectantly. Go on. I'll catch up with you later. The other two Janan departed without a word, taking his direction without question. Hokage-sama? The boy asked, clearly puzzled though he didn't show it. Sit down, Naruto-kun. The boy did as ordered. A weary sigh escaped the aged leader once more, and Naruto couldn't help but notice how frail the old man looked. For all of his life, the Sandaime had been a larger-than-life figure, thanks in no small part to the role the man had played in his own upbringing. Now though, he looked like just another elderly man, weathered and made weary by the passage of time around him. Without warning, a cat-masked Anbu appeared from nowhere, materializing in between the Hokage and Naruto without a word. A single scroll was placed on Sarutobi's desk, and the man disappeared just as suddenly as he had come, a slight nod being all the prompting he had needed. Naruto blinked as the man disappeared. Crisp, 
clean, and professional. The boy gave an absent nod in acknowledgement. Right on time, as always, the Hokage remarked, seemingly pleased with the Anbu, though his face remained set in stone. Naruto silently marveled at the emotional control the man had. He had just learned that his son was dead not 30 minutes ago, and he was functioning almost as if it was business as usual. The only evidence of his emotional turmoil was the weariness of his expression, and the Janan had little doubt that it could be hidden if the man so chose. The scroll was pushed to the side, and the old man turned his attention to Naruto. I'd ask you how you are feeling, but I know from experience that that is not a question anyone wishes to answer when they're grieving. Naruto almost smiled in response to the not quite a question. He knew exactly what the Sandaime was asking. I'm, dealing with it, he began hesitantly, somewhat unsure of his own feelings on the matter. For the entirety of Team 10's journey from Wave, he had been doing his best not to think about his dead sensei, only succeeding in doing the exact opposite. It hadn't helped that he had literally been carrying the man's body in his backpack. Naruto had been more than relieved to pass it off to the Anbu squad that had met and escorted them the last 10 miles back to Konoha. Over and over again on the way back to the village, Asuma's advice about how to deal with his situation with his level of power played out in his mind. You'd do well to stop dwelling on it, Asuma began. There's not much you can change about your situation in regards to other ninja, so you can only focus on getting yourself better. Though mostly unrelated, the same principle applied to his situation now. Asuma was dead, no matter how painful it was to have to acknowledge it, and there was absolutely nothing that he could do about it now. However callous it was, Naruto knew that there was little use in dwelling on it. As much as he hated to admit it, there was little more that he could have done on the bridge in order to help his sensei. Yes, he could have better restrained Haku, he knew that he wouldn't be making that mistake again, but there was little else. Missions went to hell all the time, events spiraling out of control faster than a person could blink. More often than not, People ended up dead because of small details that no one had any right to expect would mean anything, and the survivors were left to pick up the pieces. Frankly, if he was honest with himself, the thing that he was most upset with was the fact that he was managing to move on so quickly. He had accepted quickly that there was little he could have done to save Asuma, and dwelling on it now accomplished nothing. It was this almost calm acceptance that disturbed him. Naruto had never lost anyone close to him before, he hadn't had anyone to really lose, and he knew that most people were almost inconsolable when they lost a loved one. He felt detached from it all, once the initial pain had faded somewhere between Wave and Konoha, a DN it scared him. Despite his recent dealings with the demon in his stomach, he still maintained his fear of someday becoming like the monster. Unfeeling acceptance of the death of someone he cared about was straying close to his mental danger zone, much like detached killing. There was no doubt that he'd miss Asuma, but he wasn't about to start weeping again. It seemed unnatural, and he didn't like it. I'm dealing with it, Naruto said resolutely once more. The Sandaime regarded him carefully, scrutinizing his face with a penetrating gaze, before offering Naruto his own nod. The loss of one's sensei is never easy to deal with, Naruto realized that the old man was speaking from experience, and we can only move forward, doing our best to live how they would have wanted us to. The Sandaime glanced out the window and over his village. I called you back for a few reasons. Slate eyes locked with blue, now grayer than they had once been. Firstly, I want you to know that I don't hold you accountable for what happened. Such things happen on missions far more than I would like, but I have little doubt that the events that transpired were out of your control. Naruto leaned back in his chair, relieved despite himself. The notion that the Sandaime might blame him for his son's death had occurred to Naruto, but he hadn't paid it much heed, so wrapped up he was in his own mental turmoil. There was no doubt that the Hokage could have laid the blame at his feet that he didn't had lifted an unknown burden from his shoulders. Secondly, I would offer you a warning, the Hokage said. The man's face was as serious as it had been the night Naruto learned of his tenant, and the blonde had little doubt about what this would be about. Ah. You spoke freely about how you channeled the Kyuubi's chakra in the battle between yourself and Zabuza, the old man spoke. Despite the obvious boons the power offers you, be cautious with its use. I doubt I need to warn you about the detrimental effects that chakra can have on your body. Yes, Hokage-sama, Naruto said, his innermost thoughts in uproar as he fought the urge to tell the man about his deal with the fox. For obvious reasons, he had left the details of his conversation with the demon out of his report, and he now struggled with the idea of withholding information from the Hokage. Naruto had no doubt that the Hokage would find a way to seal off the beast from Naruto completely, for his own good of course. He couldn't allow for that to happen. That power was to be his trump card, and he wasn't about to let it go. Not only would it help save his own life down the road, 
but it would be invaluable if he ever encountered an enemy far enough beyond his own skill level. The lives of his team may depend on him, like they had on the bridge, and he would be damned if he let them die like Asuma had. So he kept his silence. Thirdly, is this scroll. The old man gestured to the parchment that had been dropped off by the cat mast Anbu. Naruto blinked as the Hokage unfurled it without flourish, letting the seals inscribed on it be shown. A storage scroll? Naruto wondered. Why would an Anbu interrupt a meeting of the Hokage simply to drop off a simple storage scroll? Even as the question passed through his mind, the answer came unbidden to him. The Hokage confirmed it not a moment later. These are, personal effects retrieved from Asuma, the Hokage finally betrayed some emotion as his son's personal effects were laid in front of him, his voice breaking ever so slightly. The hitch was gone almost as soon as it had arrived, repressed by an iron will born of decades of hard choices and emotional turmoil. Naruto felt his already enormous respect for the old man go up, even as raw emotions played out in his psyche. The Hokage bit his thumb and pressed it to the first of the storage seals inscribed on the scroll. A slight application of chakra and a puff of smoke heralded the appearance of Asuma's famous trench knives. Naruto stared down at his sensei's signature weapons, somewhat surprised to see them there, though he had been expecting them. May I? He asked quietly. Asuma had been rather anal about who touched his favorite blades, and Naruto had only gotten his hands on them twice before. The Hokage nodded with a slight smile. Of course, they're yours now. At Naruto's startled look, Sarutobi nodded, the smile still playing across his face. Oh yes. Naruto was unsure of how to respond. He had never even imagined that he would receive the prized knuckle knives his sensei had been so proud of. He had thought they would go to the Hokage, or at the least reserved for Asuma's nephew, Sarutobi Konohamaru. But he began, only to trail off. He didn't quite know how to phrase his confusion, and it wasn't like he didn't want the knives. Quite the contrary really. He just wasn't used to receiving gifts, of any sort. The Hokage shrugged with a sigh. I certainly have no use for them, Naruto-kun, and my grandson doesn't have the patience to learn my son's art. I'm sure Asuma would have wanted for you to have them, rather than have them gather dust in my estate as some token memento. Naruto almost chuckled. That sounded like something his sensei would have said. Now that he was actively listening for it, he could see where Asuma had gotten some of his speech patterns, though he doubted the man would have ever admitted it. He still felt awkward about receiving the knives, but he wasn't about to fight it. Asuma had been training him in the wielding of double blades for months. He wasn't about to turn down the opportunity to use such high-quality blades, regardless of how it came to be. As long as the old man was okay with it, he would be too. It would be like keeping a piece of his sensei with him at all times. The thought almost brought a chuckle to his lips. God, I'm such a fucking sap. Naruto reached forward confidently, grasping the twin blades in both hands, fingers coiling around the weathered leather that cushioned the handles. Unbidden, he felt his chakra begin to seep into the blades. A quick moment of concentration later, his chakra was changed to wind, an identical three-foot, nigh-invisible blades had sprung from the knives. Impressive, Sarutobi praised. And it was, such high-level elemental manipulation was almost unheard of in Janan. It appears you weren't exaggerating when you said he had talent, Asuma-kun. Truly, his son's favored student had far more skill than Sarutobi had originally given him credit for, the Hokage took all reports with a healthy grain of salt. It was a pleasant surprise on a day filled with naught but sorrow. Without saying a word, Naruto retracted the wind chakra, idly noticing how much easier it was to do on specially designed blades, rather than common kunai. He pocketed the knives in silence, making a mental note to have a holster made for them. Asuma had had them clipped to his belt at all times, but Naruto didn't wish to have them hanging out in the open. Is there anything else? Naruto asked numbly, for that was the best way to describe his voice. The boy thought he might have caught a small grimace on the Hokaye's face, but it was gone far too fast to properly tell. For my son, there is not, Sarutobi said. He applied another small burst of chakra to the open scroll on the desk. From Konoha and Kirigakur, there is. Naruto raised an eyebrow in confusion, though he knew of what the Hokage spoke. Against what he would have liked, he would have preferred to simply burn the bodies, the corpses of Zabuza and Haku had been sealed in scrolls, much like Asuma's, in order to be brought back to Konoha. Surprisingly, though perhaps not so much, considering his family greatly populated the Hunter Nin Corps, Kiba had come up with the idea, stating that both money and secrets could be obtained from the bodies of dead ninja. Both Naruto and Ino had wanted no part of ferrying the bodies of their sensei's killers back to Konoha, but had eventually been swayed by the logic that they might as well make a profit off of their dead enemies. 
It was cold, but Naruto could think of nothing more fitting than having Zabuza's body diced up and its secrets unlocked. The only issue was the Zabuza's head, the remnants of it being naught but paste that had been cleaned off the bridge by Tazuna's workers. To the best of his knowledge, one could only claim the bounty of a person if they had incontrovertible proof of the kill. The head was not the only way, but the easiest and most common way of doing so. With the head gone, it became far more difficult to identify the body, and, despite the Hokage not doubting Naruto, the boy thought Kiri might be a tad more skeptical of a Janan killing a feared Jonin. Ah! The thought struck him like a sledgehammer. The sword, was all he said. Sarutobi nodded, not stating outright but looking pleased with Naruto's quick deduction. Indeed. The Kiri no Shinobi Gatana Shichinin Shu were as renowned for their signature blades as they were for their Shinobi skills and brutality. The only way the Mist Seven would have relinquished one of their blades was, and is, in death, Sarutobi said, voice hard. He had a healthy respect and dislike for what had once been one of the most influential shinobi organizations on the continent. That one of its members had killed his last son had only heightened both aspects of his opinion. Kubi Kiribocho will serve as all the proof Kirigakura will need of Zabuza's death. Naruto nodded hesitantly, digesting the information with a grimace and just a touch of pride. Regardless of the circumstances, he had managed to kill a famous ninja, a jonin. A smirk that was entirely inappropriate, given the situation, threatened to break across his face. He might even get a spot in one of Kiri's bingo books. The thought very much appealed to the childish, attention-seeking side of him that had dominated his psyche when he had been younger. Beyond that, however, laid vindication of the sweetest sort. Until your names appear in my bingo book, you're not real shinobi in my mind. Who's the real shinobi now, Zabuza? Naruto thought with relish. With Zabuza's death confirmed, Naruto would likely take a spot in that very bingo book the Demon of the Mist has held in such high esteem. The appropriate sum will be deposited in your account, the Hokage was saying, unaware of Naruto's inner thoughts. The price on the boy's head, while far lower than the one on his master's, will be supplemented by the amount Konoha pays for new bloodlines and information about them. It will be at a reduced rate, of course, as the boy is dead, and split among your team. Naruto nodded absently inwardly thanking Kiba to the heavens for the financial windfall he was about to experience. It wouldn't bring Asuma back, but it was nice to have either way. The Sandaime sighed for what seemed like the hundredth time that day. Lastly, Naruto-kun, I wish for you to know that my door is always open to you. Should you have any questions, about anything, please do not hesitate in asking me. Naruto nodded once more, this time with a small smile on his face. Thank you, Hokage-sama. A silence hung in the air for a few moments, before Naruto stood fluidly. He was inwardly pleased with the meeting, despite its source. There was no doubt in his mind that Asuma's death would weigh heavily on him for some time, but there was no use in dwelling on it. He would do as the Sandaime said, doing his best to live as Asuma would have wanted him to. He would protect his home. With no prompting necessary, Naruto gave a low bow to the Hokage, and exited the office. Sarutobi watched the boy leave with a contemplative expression. A small smile graced his features finally, seeing the resolve formed in the boy through his eyes. The boy still had a heart despite the hardship he had gone through as a boy. Thoughts of his dead son filled his mind for a single moment before being shunted to the side once more. He would have time to grieve after one last bit of business. A single hand seal was formed, and Sarutobi only had to wait five full seconds before the cat masked Anbu from before materialized from the floor in front of him. Hokage-sama? Hiruzen waved a hand at ease. The man stood fluidly, posture relaxed though still at attention. Sarutobi almost smiled at the crisp professionalism. Kakashi trained him well, he mused. Remove your mask Tenzo, I have a new assignment for you. Slash tilde slash. Naruto had learned from a young age that the cosmos, the heavens to some, the gods to others, cared little for the day-to-day -day affairs of men. Whoever had created the universe had certainly left it to its own devices, and didn't bother with any one man no matter how many religious sects argued otherwise. It was for this reason that Naruto didn't bat an eye at the bright sun beating down on the back of his head and neck, while many black-clad figures at the funeral seemed to regard the weather with resentment. His own teammates could be included in that, as more than once he had caught both Kiba and Ino sneaking a glare upwards, almost as if they thought the weather was mocking them and their loss. Naruto knew better. Whatever higher power that existed didn't care when one man died. It certainly hadn't cared for a lonely orphan growing up oppressed by a disgruntled populace. A glance to his left heralded a stone-faced Kiba, the dog ninja in a desperate struggle with himself to hold in whatever tears he had. 
a glance to his right showed Ino, who had lost that same struggle, tear tracks lining her face as the Sandaime made the eulogy. For some, it was a cherished friend taken from our midst. For others, it was a comrade in arms. I myself lost a son, my grandson, an uncle, while three of our brightest young flames lost their sensei. Naruto steeled himself, forcing his body not to shift an iota as he felt the gaze of at least a hundred people bore into his back. Such were the perils of being at the front of the procession. He and his team were given the honor of standing at the front, next to Sarutobi Konohamaru and many of the Sandaime's personal associates. The three of them had each been offered the chance to speak, but each had turned it down. Kiba and Ino had been worried about speaking in front of a huge crown, both not confident in doing their sensei justice. Naruto's reservations had been similar, though he was more preoccupied with thoughts of how a crowd of 200 people, many of them civilians, would react to his presence up on the podium. He knew that no one would try anything, but he didn't particularly feel like fielding the no-doubt massive amount of glares that would come with his speech. He had enough to deal with on a regular basis anyway. That was one result of the botched mission to wave country that Naruto just couldn't get over. While there was scarcely a good anything that came from that mission, the villager's attitude toward him had only gotten even more ridiculous. He hadn't been liked before, but the vast majority had ignored him in favor of doing far more useful and productive things, like living their lives. Now, though, it seemed like things were back to how they were in his pranking days. He couldn't walk down a street without having to deal with the resentment of at least a dozen different people. They, somehow, managed to blame him for the death of Asuma, one of the most respected jonin in the village and the Sandaime's son. He supposed that it shouldn't have really come as a surprise. Any bad outcome that happened on any mission he happened to be a part of would inevitably reflect back on him, if only because of the QB. Heavens forbid that blame actually fall on the guilty party, Zabuza in this case. While Naruto had played a small part in the Asuma's death, by failing to properly restrain Haku, the Sandaime had managed to forgive the boy his mistake, and that was all that was needed in Naruto's mind. The rest of the world meant nothing if Sarutobi didn't hold the Janan accountable, general will of the populace be damned. Still, he would miss being an almost non-entity in the village, as he had been before the news of Asuma's death had been made public. With the reversion of his pranking, most of the villagers had stopped paying attention to the blonde, opting to give him wide berths and nothing more. Now, they were all back to their old, charming selves. A scowl crossed his face at the remembrance of the many harsh looks he had been receiving recently. He had made a promise to himself and to the Sandaime to live how Asuma would have wanted him to, and his sensei would have wanted him to protect the village he himself had served and died for. Already, that goal was becoming far harder in Naruto's mind. The irony of the situation wasn't lost on the boy. For the majority of his pre-10 years, he had done everything in his power to have the people of Konoha notice him, for better or worse. Now, all he wanted was quiet anonymity. Sometime between the spaces of his thoughts, the Sandaime had finished with his speech, and the crowd was making its way to the casket to pay their final respects to the fallen Jonin before the body was incinerated. Having been caught up in his thoughts, Naruto missed his cue to move, and had to hurry to catch the procession. As he moved, his eyes caught the obsidian pupils of his first friend, Sasuke and the rest of the rookie Janan teams having come to pay their respects, and the boy offered him a nod of respect. Naruto returned it quickly, though a bit hesitantly. He could safely say that he could finally understand where Sasuke was coming from with his thought of revenge toward his brother. He might never have the red-hot rage that Sasuke held toward Uchiha Itachi, his rage had died with Zabuza and Gato, replaced by a cold anger directed more at the situation than anything else, but he could completely sympathize with the would-be Avenger. The need to see Zabuza dead had brought on Naruto's qb induced rage. The stray thought of what might have become of Uchiha Itachi had Sasuke been unfortunate enough to bear the Kyubi struck him as he grasped a white rose from the pile. Naruto doubted that there would be much left of the nuke nin. The thought was banished as quickly as it had come. Pull yourself together, Naruto, you're at a goddamn funeral, he thought viciously. And yet, despite being at the funeral of the man who had been his sensei, friend, mentor, and the closest thing to a father figure he would probably ever have, Naruto couldn't bring himself to share the same melancholy as the rest of the procession. There was no doubt that he would miss his sensei, but he had come to terms with the fact that Asuma had died on his own terms, despite its abruptness. He had willingly put himself at risk for the people of Wave, and he had paid for it. Death was a shinobi's constant companion, never more than a step or two behind, and always waiting to lay a hand on your shoulder. All thoughts fled Naruto's mind as he finally came face to face with his sensei for the final time. The head had been stitched back to the neck, and all traces of blood and wounds had been removed by the medical examiner. 
It was standard protocol, so that the friends and family of the deceased could view their loved one for the last time before the body was cremated in order to preserve secrets. Black hair had been slicked back, the goatee, somewhat scraggly in life, had been clipped and trimmed, and the standard Hittai 8 had been polished to a glistening shine. His flak vest had been replaced with a new one, as had the sash of the twelve elite guardians, along with the rest of his clothes. The only things missing were the trench knives he had been known for so well, and his customary cigarette. It was crisp, clean, professional, altogether very nice, and not at all like Asuma had been in life. Though Naruto had accepted and come to terms with his sensei's death, seeing the man's corpse touched up and put on display was like a slap to the face and a punch to the stomach. It wasn't his sensei lying in that casket. It was just a body. The blonde spared the corpse one last glance as he dropped his flower onto the top of the pile unceremoniously, walking briskly off the raised platform. He passed a few people slowly making their way back to their seats or to places unknown, bumping past them without a care for decorum. A hand on his right shoulder halted him in his tracks, and he turned abruptly, right hand slapping to his hip in a gesture that would have left a kunai in his hand had he been wearing his holster. As it was, he stilled his impulse to lash out at the offender as he came face to face with a pair of crimson eyes that reminded him oh so much of him. For all his bravado, Naruto never looked directly into Sasuke's eyes during their spars, for fear of flashing back to that night. Where the last Uchiha held nothing but rage toward his elder brother, Naruto held fear. The fear of a man whose power had brought a once mighty clan to its death and had held him helpless effortlessly. A power that was, at its very core, built around crimson pupils. But then, these weren't his eyes. They were softer, far softer, and held a compassion and empathy Naruto didn't think Uchiha Itachi had ever been capable of. Belatedly, Naruto realized that Yuhi Kurenai was speaking. As much as I know you don't wish to hear it. They're all that I can offer you, Uzumaki-san, as well as an ear if you need one, she said, her voice a whisper while they were still in hearing range of the funeral. Naruto nodded somewhat absently. I, thank you, but I wouldn't want to waste your time, was all he managed. He wasn't entirely sure of what to say. It wasn't helped by the fact he had missed half of her statement. A soft smile greeted the Janan, and Naruto felt himself blushing a bit in spite of himself. Yuhi Kurenai was stunning. Of course, Uzumai san dash. Naruto, please. Naruto san then. The Jonin paused for a moment, her eyes appraising. But I'm sure that I could do far worse for company. Asuma always said as much. He was proud of you, all of you, really, but you most of all. Naruto scratched the back of his head in embarrassment, the boy feeling awkward with the situation now more than ever. He wasn't used to overt praise, especially from a Jonin. Becoming a decent person isn't easy with your background, he said, but you managed it. The woman locked eyes with him knowingly. Rising above our personal demons is never easy, especially the way you were forced to grow up. He was proud to say that you were someone he would trust with both his own life and those of the villagers, despite your past. The word demon struck Naruto like a hammer blow, and he lowered his eyes, not able to meet the crimson pupils of his sensei's friend. Guilt the likes of which Naruto hadn't felt before twisted his gut like a bayonet. Not fifteen minutes ago he had been disparaging the lives of the very people Asuma had sworn to protect, and the people whose lives were now entrusted to Naruto in his stead. He forced it down, however, and spoke once more, why are you telling me this? He asked quietly. The Jonin regarded him silently for a moment. Because you should hear it. Asuma wasn't always one for direct praise, and you deserve to know what he thought of you. Naruto nodded. What, what was he to you? He asked, glimpses of a conversation with Ino and Kiba coming back to him. For all he knew, she had lost as much as he had. Kurenai stopped still for a second, before composing herself with barely visible effort. We were, friends, I suppose, she sighed. Perhaps something more someday, but just friends really. Ah. Naruto trailed off, not sure at all how to respond. She had lost as much as him, though she concealed it well. He had always been good at reading body language, and hers was screaming discomfort at him. While it could have just been the topic, the fact that she, a Jonin, showed enough body language for Naruto to pick up on it hinted at something more. She and Asuma had been more than friends, whether it had been official or not, whether she would admit it or not. Thank you, Kurenai-sensei, he said formally, bringing the odd conversation to a close with a short bow. The Jonin lowered her head to him slightly. I wish you well, Naruto-san, Kurenai said sincerely, earlier awkwardness forgotten, before turning on her heel and striding back toward the funeral and her team, raven hair swishing back and forth with every step. 
Naruto watched her for a few moments before making his own exit, though moving in the opposite direction. The Jinan turned his head skyward as he made his way through the village, thoughts of Asuma, Kurenai, and his own ambitions flittering through his head as the sun warmed his face. More than anything, his thoughts remained on Kurenai's words, and the message they carried from his dead sensei. He had known that his sensei had respected his skills, he had proven that with what he had been teaching the twelve-year-old Jinan, but to hear such positive words about himself wasn't something he was used to. From what the pretty Jonin had said, Asuma had trusted him out of his three students to carry on his legacy. Naruto knew full well that it was a legacy of selfless service to Konoha and Fire Country. That, however, was the sticking point. As much as Asuma had thought of him overcoming his demons, Naruto truly hadn't, either figuratively or literally, opting instead to push them to side to be dealt with later on. He had done so with the attitude of the villagers, and had shunted true introspective thought about his situation with the Kyuubi away in order to focus on the here and now. In his defense, he had a perfect reason to do so with the latter, but it wasn't really his style, in hindsight. For his entire life, short though it was at present, he had been a go-getter. Whether it had been through his pranks for attention, or his single-minded attitude toward training to survive the threat of Akatsuki, Naruto had always been the aggressor, the one who tried to take his problems by the horns and wrestle them to the ground. He hadn't done so with either of his personal demons. The situation with the villagers had been moved to the side in order to take a back seat to training, and Naruto had convinced himself that he didn't really care about what the general populace thought of him. Looking back, on both today and his life, he knew that this wasn't the case. Their attitude, their intransigence toward anything regarding him grated on him like nothing else. That had to change. Or at least, he had to find a way to deal with it so it wouldn't interfere with his duty. If Asuma had entrusted him with his legacy of servitude to the village, personal feelings couldn't matter. As a shinobi, and as Asuma's student, he had a duty to serve, and he'd be damned if he didn't follow through on that. That was a promise, and Naruto never broke his promises. The QB issue was something else entirely, and something that Naruto would have to think long and hard on in order to deal with properly. He had no intention of giving up the power the demon had laid at his disposal, but he'd have to find a way to train and use it appropriately. Getting his friends killed because he was relying on instinct to use the chakra was something he wouldn't allow to happen, no matter the results on Tazana's bridge. You took your time. The sudden voice told Naruto he had reached his destination. He had been so caught up in his thoughts that he hadn't noticed. Got sidetracked, was all he offered in return. He stared down the stern face of his female teammate until she broke eye contact, electing to turn her gaze to the black, kunai-shaped slab of stone that served as Konoha's memorial to those who had fallen in battle. So? The girl asked him. It was Kiba, sprawled in the grass beside the blonde duo, who answered, So what? We're here right? Naruto didn't bother to raise an eyebrow. You sound like you don't want to be. The dog ninja shrugged, sitting up to stare down his teammates. Personally, this doesn't seem like something sensei would want us to do. We've been over this, Kiba, Ino lectured. This is our memorial, no one else's. Kiba just shrugged. Whatever. I just don't think he'd approve of us moping around for a day. He's dead now, Kiba, Ino said harshly. What he would want doesn't matter. Her voice trailed off a bit at the end, cracking as the girl fought back a sob. Naruto pulled the girl into a quick hug. She buried herself in his arms as she finally allowed herself to break down, tears falling freely from her eyes and shuddering sobs racking her body. He is dead, Ino, and that's why we're doing this. Once, Naruto soothed. Just this once, we're allowed to mope and mourn, and then we have to move on like he'd want us to. Ino's response was to cry harder, wrapping her arms around the blonde Janan even harder. Even Kiba, normally boisterous, was depressed, his own tears starting to leak from his eyes. Only Naruto didn't cry, though he held back more than a few sobs as his teammates broke down. Finally, the group's tears were spent, and Team 10 lay sprawled on the well-manicured grass around the centigraph. Naruto was the first to rise, pulling Ino and Kiba with him by the arms as he strode forward, finally taking in the full sight of the memorial stone. The name Sarutobi Asuma was engraved at the very bottom as the last name on the stone erected for Konoha's heroes. Naruto reached into the back pocket of his black funeral attire, withdrawing a plain white, rectangular box. You found them? Ino asked. Naruto nodded as he opened the box and passed a plain white cigarette to both Ino and Kiba. Yeah. They're expensive as hell. The Janan withdrew a square metal lighter from the same pocket, clicking it open with a slide of his fingers. A small flame burst forth, and Naruto lit up the ends of Team 10's cigarettes, 
the three of them holding them a few inches from their faces between their fingers. To Asuma, Naruto declared. To Asuma, Ino and Kiba chorused. All three took a simultaneous drag, and the sound of coughs filled the air around Konoha's memorial stone. Slash tilde slash. Two weeks had been the amount of time Team 10 had been granted for leave, and he had used the time to prepare. First impressions were ridiculously important in the world of Shinobi, even more so for Sensei and their prospective students. Even among them, Team 10 would be a special case. A Jinan team that had lost its sensei was an anomaly for the greatest of the shinobi villages, and there was no doubt that Team 10 would be even more of a hassle to deal with than an average trio of cadets. After all, they had some high expectations. He took a deep breath to center himself as he settled down in the clearing. The two weeks he had had to prepare were strange to him. As an Anbu captain, the best at that, he was far more used to vague plans that were only truly shaped in the heat of high-level missions. He had second-guessed his testing idea more than once, before finally settling on what his gut instinct had told him to do. It had carried him three years of service to the Hokage. It wouldn't fail him in front of three rookie Janan. Even so, he still made time to drop by his old captain's place for some friendly advice. He had been as surprised as anyone when he heard that the illustrious Hatake Kakashi had finally decided to take on a Janan team, but his captain had been even more surprised when the man learned that he was going to take on students. Sarutobi Asuma's students at that. He had just laughed off his former captain's surprise, he had been far more shocked when the Hokage had given the order. Kenzo would admit to being a bit miffed at being reduced to an instructor for some fresh out of the academy brats, the heavens knew how poor most rookies were, as he'd much rather be serving as Hokage on missions. Still, the Hokage had been insistent, and had assured him that it would only be for a short duration, as at least one, if not more of the team members was a shoe in for promotion to Chunin. That had caught Tenzo's attention, and had prompted him to do some digging through the Hokage's archives, S rank clearance was useful to have. The results had been almost as surprising to read as his assignment had been. Inuzuka Kiba had been exactly as he had suspected. The report said he was loud, brash, and arrogant, much like the rest of his feral clan. It was to be expected of the dog users, but what came as a surprise had been the boy's abilities with his clan ninjutsu. Academy records showed the boy to be third in his class in taijutsu, as well as more recent investigations showed large amounts of growth in the three and a half months he had been under Sarutobi Asuma. His partnership with his dog was at a high level for his age, which showed a slight inkling of future potential for the Hunter Nin Corps. The Inuzuka made up quite the large population of the Shinobi Hunters, and it looked as if the clan heir would join them. Yamanaka Ino had come as a bit of a surprise, though mostly because of the bipolarity of the reports on her. Her academy records showed above average skill at every aspect of the Shinobi lifestyle though her attitude was noted as needing work. The girl hadn't taken her time seriously at the academy, and her teachers had noticed. That was in direct contrast to the reports Sarutobi Asuma had written about the girl, calling her motivated and driven to excel. The dead Jonin spoke of high levels of improvement in her tenure under him, especially in the area of Genjutsu. The idea of a Genjutsu wielding Yamanaka was a harrowing thought as, combined with their mind techniques, illusions could become all that more potent. And that left the true enigma. Uzumaki Naruto, Tenzo called across the clearing, his voice bland. The blonde boy held the Anbu captain's gaze steadily, his face carefully blank as he took in the scene around him. By all rights, the clearing was a mess. The ground was torn up in multiple places, the sign of ninjutsu, while branches from nearby trees lay strewn across the grass. Chakra saturated the air and laid heavily on the blonde, who had been alerted to his presence being required at training ground 11 by messenger bird. The centerpiece, However, was the battered, bruised, and bloodied bodies of his two teammates, both lying prone at Tenzo's feet. Above them, clad in black fatigues with a matching vest and a half-mask similar to Hitake Kakashi's, stood Tenzo, Ninjato in hand, looking for all the world like the perfect assassin. Who are you? What are you doing here? The boy asked, his own voice flat. Tenzo was inwardly impressed with the boy's poise. He knew of many far more seasoned ninja who would lose all sense of decorum when faced with a similar scene. On some level, the boy probably knew this was a test, but the idea that it might not be halted the boy from calling the Jonin on it. The academy records were mixed concerning the Uzumaki, the early ones being rather scathing toward the boy's supposed lack of talent and work ethic. Those had lasted a year, before being replaced with far more moderate reviews, ones that indicated substantial growth of skill, before finally settling on comments that bordered on glowing praise. Naruto had been second in his class for the last few years of his tenure, second only to Uchiha Sasuke, a reputed genius in his own right. 
Further digging had showed a surprising turn in the boy's training, as he had begun to study under Mito Guy, the experienced and powerful Jonin's limited tutelage bringing out the latent talent the academy had failed to notice. That's not important, the former Anbu captain answered. The only thing that matters is that I'm following my orders. The reports his deceased sensei had written followed in a similar vein to those of the later academy years. Sarutobi wrote that the last Uzumaki showed potential befitting of a Jinchuriki, the boy possessing massive chakra reserves for his age, as well an injutsu talent the man felt unmatched by any of his generation, let alone his graduating class. The boy had a wind affinity, and the Jonin spoke of training in elemental ninjutsu in the last report he had written. All of that, combined with the hearsay about the Jinan having killed Momochi Zabuza of all people, a rumor confirmed by the Sandaime, though with significant circumstantial details included, made for quite the interesting Jinan. The former captain would admit to being more than a little intrigued by such a Jinan. And thus, Tenzo had his test. The Anbu gripped his blade ever so slightly in anticipation, and it was all the prompting Naruto needed. Though the reports had said it clearly, Tenzo was still taken aback when the boy hurled a wind chakra sheathed kunai at him, poised to pierce him between the eyes and howling like a hurricane. That, however, wasn't the appropriate response, the Jonin thought with a little disappointment. The kunai, while quick through the air, was no match for Tenzo's speed, which would allow for him to easily land a killing blow on one, if not both of the boy's teammates. Perhaps his mind needs some exercising. The sudden absence of the sound of wind was the only indication that his initial assessment was wrong. The former Anbu captain moved faster than the boy could see, using pure speed to escape a dropping heel that would have caved his skull in. Tenzo leapt backwards out of range, his sharp eyes catching the form of the wind-enhanced kunai now buried in the ground where Naruto had first been standing. Kawarimi with a kunai, with the few Uten chakra used as an anchor for the jutsu to better latch onto the blade. Impressive thinking. Naruto taken his well-earned opportunity to grasp both Ino and Kiba by the collar, shunshining back to where his kunai was stuck in the ground. He dropped the unconscious bodies to the ground unceremoniously, locking eyes and glaring at Tenzo from across the clearing. So, did I pass your test? He called, voice angry. Blue eyes bored into Tenzo's brown, and the new Jonin felt a smirk forming beneath his mask. Quick thinking on the fly and some deductive reasoning to boot. He'd likely make Chunin now if the examiner saw that last display. The Jinan had correctly gathered that the objective was to get his subdued teammates out of harm's way. Tenzo would even admit to being caught off guard. He would bet money that that little maneuver would kill even a Jonin, given the right timing. He, however, was no mere Jonin. One of them, was his answer. Your approach was reckless, though, leaving yourself exposed to any enemies that might have been lying in wait. Naruto's eyes widened as a small spike of chakra served as his only warning. The Jinan deftly leapt over a slash at his legs, planting his right foot on the offender's head and pushing off out of the immediate kill zone. Landing, he watched as both of his teammates dropped their respective henges, reverting to clones of the man in black. He clicked his teeth in irritation at his slip in judgment. A mistake like that might cost him were the situation not a test. Two quick movements had his new trench knives spinning their way to his knuckles, wind chakra exploding down their length and beyond with the force of a tornado. Kenzo allowed himself a small smile. The boy was certainly eager. Who knew, maybe he'd even be pushed a little. When one test ends, another begins, Uzumaki Naruto. Prepare yourself, Tenzo spoke in monotone. You won't succeed unless you come at me with the intent to kill. Chapter 9, Salutary Neglect. Slash tilde slash. When one test ends, another begins, Uzumaki Naruto, Tenzo spoke in monotone. You won't succeed unless you come at me with the intent to kill. Naruto spared the sentence one moment of thought, inwardly reflecting on how ludicrous the statement sounded, before reminding himself that this was a jonin. He likely wouldn't be able to kill the man anyway. That wouldn't stop him from trying, however. Tenzo fought back a slight smile as he watched his charge think on the task for a moment. At least he has some common sense, the Anbu thought with satisfaction. Many rookie Janan would simply charge in without a thought, either paying the order no heed or so confident in their skills they thought they could actually lay a finger on their instructor. Kakashi had told him as much had happened with his squad. The former captain knew well that it took a ninja of a certain skill to even be able to lay a finger on him were he taking the test seriously, but, just as he was no normal Jonin, Uzumaki Naruto was no normal Janan. He might even sweat a little. Wind roared to life around the boy's blades as he charged at speeds beyond most his age. Kenzo gave a single nod at the tactic, Naruto correctly assumed that the little kunai trick he'd used earlier wouldn't work twice. 
Full frontal, however, is too simple-minded. The Jonin unsheathed his assassin's blade in less time than it took to blink, bringing the ninjato to bear in a strike that would relieve Naruto of his head. The Jinan didn't disappoint. Showcasing his agility, Naruto came to an abrupt halt just outside the radius of Tenzo's slash, pivoting on his right foot and channeling latent momentum and chakra into a burst of speed that sent him sprinting around his new sensei in a perfect circle. Ah, Gokin, Tenzo thought. The distinctive tactic was first developed by the renowned Taijutsu master Maito Gai, though the style's creator rarely ever used the technique anymore. He was beyond such simple maneuvers. His students, however, the idea was to use pure speed to limit the enemy's sight, the sheer quickness causing the user of the technique to blur to an indistinguishable shape. With the enemy's attention split between trying to see the user, as well as trying to predict where the strike would come from, the Goken user would strike. Kenzo resheathed his blade in the exact amount of time it had taken to draw, bringing his arms up almost level with his eyes, elbows pointed outward and his center of mass lowered in what could only be described as a defensive stance. It wasn't a moment too soon as Naruto came hurtling out of his circle directly behind the Jonin, right foot poised and body coiling into a perfect trademark Konoha Senpu. Kenzo rotated quickly, the upper part of his left arm catching the brunt of the powerful kick, hardened muscles unyielding under Naruto's assault. An involuntary wince escaped his emotionless demeanor even so, the boy kicked hard. Such a thing wasn't about to stop him, however, as he lashed out with a lightning-fast right-handed jab. Naruto just barely avoided it by leaning his head to the side but the Janan paid it no heed, striking with dual cross slashes of his knuckle knives as his wind chakra screamed. Kenzo leaned back to avoid the first, but had to duck under the second to avoid having his head sliced off. The Jonin used his lowered position to ram his shoulder into Naruto, the though blow lacked its normal power as Naruto had jumped backwards to right himself after his strike. It still had enough momentum to force the Janan off balance, however, and Tenzo pressed his advantage bringing his left elbow up and under Naruto's chin in a brutal strike that sent the boy reeling. Naruto recovered fast, but not fast enough to stop getting backhanded across his face by Tenzo's left hand in a continuation of the Jonin's last strike. The blonde lowered himself instinctively, growling as he tasted blood in his mouth. Tenzo nearly smirked beneath his mask as the boy raised his knife-laden hands to be level with his head, unknowingly mimicking Tenzo's own taijutsu stance. Good instincts, they'll help him learn quickly, the Jonin thought with praise. Chakra racing down his legs, igniting nerve endings, Naruto burst forward, knives poised to behead Tenzo once more. The masked man took a single step back to right himself in preparation, and Naruto took the opportunity to move into a fast-moving circle once more. This again? The boy should know better, the new Jonin thought, somewhat disappointed but still wary. Tenzo lowered himself into his defensive stance once more in expectation. Naruto wasted no time, hurtling out of the circle in another perfect Konoha Senpu, this time to Tenzo's right. The Jonin almost sighed. A quick rotation had the former Anbu captain poised for a perfect block, his left hand ready to grab the inclement kick, while the right would grasp Naruto by the neck. The tactic hadn't worked the first time, the boy had to learn never to use the same tactic twice, no matter how harsh the lesson would be. He made for the grab, only for the body of his new student to pass clean through his hands like a ghost. Bunshine but when did he have time, Tenzo thought with alarm and a small hint of satisfaction. So the boy was smarter than that after all. An instantaneous kawarimi carried Tenzo outside of Naruto's circle, the substitution with his moku bunshine seamless as reflexes born of endless high-level missions kicked in. He reappeared some 30 yards from his new student, and turned just in time to watch the blonde obliterate his bunshine with Fuuten, Rinkudan at point-blank range. Wood chip soared skyward as Tenzo studied his student. Crafty use of ninjutsu while leaving the taijutsu as a smokescreen, good instincts, and no hesitation when it comes to landing decisive blows. He either knows that he won't touch me, or he's just taking this test far more seriously than I had thought. The Jonin wasn't quite sure which option was running through Naruto's head, but he didn't much care. Both would serve his purposes here. Time for a bit of pressure. Both Yuagao and Kakashi said he needed to exercise his sadistic side a bit more, this would be a perfect opportunity. Naruto glanced through the haze of wood chips warily, mind ablaze with thought. Wood was really only used for kawarimi by ninja, not to form clones. That this jonin could do so hinted at a skill Naruto, like the rest of the ninja world, had thought lost with the Shodai Hokage. Could it be, he thought with uncertainty. Already, this new sensei of his was proving formidable in many ways. 
His mind was saved from having to try to answer the myriad of questions surrounding the Jonin when the still floating wood chips in front of him morphed into sharpened blades resembling kunai. Blue eyes widened almost comically as Naruto realized how trapped he was, before lightning fast hand seals had wood impacting wood rather than flesh and bone courtesy of a substitution. His kawarimi left him momentarily disoriented, reflexive though it was, and the blonde shook his head a few times to clear out the cobwebs. He apparently shook his head a few too many times, as when he refocused a second later, the clearing was filled with black-clad clones of his new sensei. Naruto cursed sulfurously at the sight, before retrieving his knuckle knives with a lightning-fast swipe at his waist, few Uten chakra exploding down their lengths. Senses screaming, Naruto leapt backwards to avoid a hand that burst from the ground to grab his ankle. He landed lightly on the balls of his feet, but immediately was forced to sway to the side to avoid a stab from another clone. A quick weight shift had him in position for a counterattack of his own, but the appearance of yet another black-clad figure at his flank forced him to strafe to his left to make space. Belatedly realizing that he was completely encircled by the mass of black-clad clones, Naruto blurred into action as the ninjato-wielding doppelgangers rushed him. Moving almost too fast for the untrained eye to catch, Naruto wove in and out of the mass of clones, avoiding their attacks with seeming ease and always by only a hair's breadth. One stab to the chest was dodged with a spin to his left, the spin led to another in the opposite direction, as Naruto planted his right foot and used his momentum to move in the complete opposite direction, neatly avoiding a slash at his neck. An idea struck him as he ducked under a punch, and he planted his hands on the ground and pushed upwards, sending his body skyward. He sheathed his unused knives in their holsters at his waist, before speeding through the hand seals of a cat and jutsu he had secreted from the archive years previous, but only now had the time to practice. Just as he was about to release the grand fireball, his sight of the mass of clones ten yards below him flickered for an instant. What? He thought with alarm, before the obvious answer lodged itself in his brain. Genjutsu. None of the clones had actually touched him, each of their attacks easy enough to avoid, and he hadn't made any counterattacks due to being far too occupied with dodging the numerous swipes and slashes at his form. He had just assumed they were like the Moku Bunshine he had reduced to wood chips before. Add to that his momentary disorientation, and the conclusion was obvious. The knowledge that this was, in fact, a test of his abilities reasserted itself, and Naruto realized that it was natural for this new sensei to test his genjutsu ability. And he had failed in it spectacularly. The pent-up chakra from the Gokaku no jutsu was growing too hot to bear, so Naruto released the grand fireball on the mass of illusionary clones with a rage-filled grunt. The fire swirled in the clearing for about five seconds before Naruto released the jutsu and fell back to earth, breaking his chakra flow for good measure even though the latent chakra in the air from his ninjutsu would have dispelled the genjutsu anyway. The blonde Janan landed without a sound, staring down the single form left in the clearing, his form seemingly untouched by the fiery hell Naruto had unleashed on his doppelgangers. The two locked eyes for a moment, one impassive, one steaming with anger, before Tenzo was suddenly in Naruto's face before the boy had a moment to comprehend what was happening. Naruto took a punch to the face and an elbow to his ribs before he started reacting. The jonin was fast, and he left Naruto with little time to respond to the sudden bout of violence. The Janan ducked under a high elbow, only to receive an uppercut to the face that sent him reeling. It was the space made from the blow, however, that gave Naruto the precious half-second he needed to regroup, and he launched his counterattack with all the ferocity Goken embodied. His first two haymakers were blocked by Tenzo's raised forearms, hands near his head once more, but Naruto adjusted quickly. He lowered his center of mass accordingly, realizing that he wouldn't be able to land so much as a legitimate hit on the man while standing tall, and struck out with one of the lightning-fast jabs he usually reserved for when fighting with his knuckle knives. It wasn't to be. Tenzo redirected the jab with the outside of his left arm before grabbing it, using Naruto's forward momentum as leverage to rotate his body inwards to deliver a shot to Naruto's elbow. A duck under the offending appendage had Tenzo in position and the Jonin capitalized by viciously elbowing Naruto in the face, sending the Janan's head snapping backwards as blood flowed from his newly bleeding lip. The black-clad man wasn't done, however, taking the opportunity to deliver an elbow to Naruto's left leg, two back fists to his chest, a second elbow to the right leg, before finally grasping the boy by his neck and flipping him to the ground in a brutal show of strength that had Naruto bruised, disoriented, and gasping for air as he lay still on the ground. Kenzo observed the fallen form of his charge silently for nearly a minute. The boy was recovering, slowly but surely. Air which he had gasped for seconds earlier now came in steady breaths. It was a recovery time far faster than Ninja many years his senior and in their primes. Jinchuriki, 
those created at birth at least, are physical marvels unlike normal humans, even by shinobi standards. Tenzo showed no outward expression at the proclamation, electing to let Sarutobi continue unimpeded though he certainly held questions. The effect of a bijou's chakra on a human over time has never truly been documented, the Sandaime lectured. But snippets of information about many of the known Jinchuriki state similar observations about physical prowess in relation to their normal shinobi counterparts. They move faster, recover quicker, and, given the correct training, are far stronger than normal shinobi. And that's just physical? Tenzo asked. Sarutobi nodded. Yes. The far-reaching effects of the demon's chakra affect everything from physical recovery to chakra capacity. The Sandaime locked eyes with Tenzo. I take it you are far more versed in the more churka intensive effects that surround most who harbor tailed beasts? Of course, Hokage-sama. Tenzo nodded. Good. While my son. Tenzo noted how the old man didn't even flinch at the mention of his newly deceased son, not that he expected him to sought to enhance Naruto's ninjutsu capabilities and played at the boy's immense talent in that area, I would ask you to concentrate more on the physical, taijutsu aspects of the boy's development. Hokage-sama? Sarutobi almost smiled at the unspoken why. A Jinchuriki's body is malleable, even at an age where most normal humans stop developing as their genetic structure and past nutrition have a set blueprint as to what the body will eventually be. While I'm not saying to break the boy's bones and reset them in certain ways, I do believe that a more physically oriented training style would benefit the boy in the long run, as it would play to the great strength he will no doubt possess one day. Tenzo frowned, the expression in full view as his mask was off, he was still uncomfortable without it at times. A new taijutsu style? Sarutobi smiled. The captain was quick like that. Along with his stellar record and unorthodox abilities, the sharp mind of a trained commander was why Sarutobi had chosen him for this job. Indeed. While Guy certainly did Naruto a favor in taking him under his wing, his Gokan style is far too rigid for one not fully devoted to Taijutsu. The smile morphed into a grin of satisfaction. I believe Naruto himself has come to understand this, though he has found little to do about it without proper guidance. Kenzo nodded, in thought once more before an idea struck him, one that Sarutobi had likely been after from the beginning. Shinzo Kara? He was rewarded with a grin that bordered on nostalgic. Rather fitting, no? Indeed, Hokage-sama. Though, I wonder how is he to learn such a style in such a short time? I am only to be his sensei for a short time, and even to be adept at the style takes months of training. The former Anbu captain trailed off, the answer to his question smacking him in the face even as he asked the question. At this, Sarutobi's grin became almost gleeful. The hell? Naruto had taken over a minute to fully recover from the beating he had taken, only to receive a scroll to the face as he sat up. He caught it before it reached the ground, however, and turned an appraising eye to it. Cage Bunshine? He asked aloud, reading the title. A corporal clone technique that forms a doppelganger directly from the chakra of the user, Tenzo recited from memory, having copied the information from the forbidden scroll of seals onto the scroll his charge now held. The voice of the Jonin who was to be Naruto's new sensei drew his attention from the scroll to the man, drawing a raised eyebrow from the Jinan. The man, formerly clad in only black, now wore the standard uniform he often saw on all of Konoha's ninja. Navy fatigues covered by a forest green flak vest were offset by the standard equipment pouches in their appropriate places. The only distinguishing feature on the man was the mask-style hit I ate that Naruto knew was similar to the one worn by the Naidaim Hokage. That, and the wooden chair the man was sprawled on lazily that seemed to both grow directly from the ground and conform to every line of the man's body, almost as if it grew from him as much as it did the earth. Naruto shrugged off the sight of the dead bloodline ability, electing to save his questions for later and concentrate on the obviously important scroll. I take it I'm supposed to learn this, he stated more than asked. Why else would the man give him the scroll? Indeed. The cage bunshine is a B-ranked restricted technique due in part to its monstrous chakra drain on the user, Tenzo lectured. Due to your, extenuating circumstances, it's been decided that you would find the technique to be a boon rather than a detriment. Naruto nodded at the indirect reference to the QB sealed within him. The chakra drain that most ninja would find instantly debilitating likely wouldn't even phase him. He broke the seal on the scroll and unfurled it without a flourish, beginning to read with rapt attention he truly only reserved for learning new ninjutsu. Tenzo watched the boy with calculating eyes the whole time. Any questions? A wry smile crossed Naruto's face, though he didn't look up. Plenty. Your name would be a good place to start. Rai amusement seemed to transfer from student to sensei, 
as a similar smile broke across Tenzo's unmasked face. Call me Yamato, he said simply. Naruto nodded, still absorbed in his reading, though he noted the difference in call me and my name is. Knowledge was power, indeed. Anbu then, the boy thought with some certainty. Most regular shinobi didn't have classified names, after all. He spared a second of thought to he and his team being assigned an Anbu for a sensei, before dismissing it. Nothing bad could come of intensive training, at least in his mind. He was almost finished with his reading when his eyes came to a halt above a passage about the jutsu's effects. Blue eyes met black sharply, and the newly dubbed Yamato broke into a smile. Memory and sensory transfer? Naruto asked. If this was what he thought it was. The other reason why this jutsu is classified as restricted, Yamato said. Physical training? The jonin shook his head. Only the knowledge of it. Naruto nodded. Even without physical gains being directly transferred to the user of the technique, the cage bunshine was still a massive boon to his training. The amount of ninjutsu I could learn with this, hell, even taijutsu could be practiced, Naruto thought with a growing excitement. Why? He asked Yamato. A learning implement. The Hokage believes that direct training in ninjutsu is something you don't require at present, and the technique will help you break down and master any new jutsu you happen to come across, Yamato stated. The Hokage was adamant about not directly teaching Naruto any new ninjutsu besides this one. Let him find them on his own, he had said, a wry smile on his wizened visage. Taijutsu then. A satisfied smile split Yamato's face. That is what I'll be training you in for the foreseeable future, among other small things. And my team? Naruto had no idea how many points he had inadvertently won with the Jonin with his simple statement of concern for his teammates. They have been similarly tested, and will receive training tailored to their needs as well as group training. Yamato offered the boy a small smile. Rest assured, Team 10 staying together is in the interests of the Hokage, and I'm here to help you grow into a functioning and cohesive unit. Naruto nodded, shoulders sagging slightly in relief that his team would be staying together. It was an unvoiced fear of his that they would be broken up and trained separately, but it appeared that wasn't to be the case. So. Naruto trailed off. So. I shall begin your taijutsu and physical training once you've mastered the cage bunshine. Naruto raised an eyebrow. Any particular style? He asked dryly. Indeed, Yamato said patronizingly. Shinzo Kara, though you wouldn't have heard its name despite your familiarity with it. The Jinan realized he would be learning whatever style the Jonin had used so effectively against him in his test. A smile split his face at the thought of using the brutal techniques against his enemies, rather than having it used against him lightning fast, physically uncompromising, and viciously dash. Brutal? Naruto finished cheekily. You noticed, the jonin drawled. I did. Yes, well. Yamato shifted slightly in his seat, the wood responding to his movements to provide perfect support regardless of his position. It is a seldom used style anymore, its creators having been wiped out at the start of the second secret shinobi world war, but it is effective, and based solely on the intent of the user. Do you want to kill? Do you want to maim? Yamato said, gesticulating at Naruto to get his point across. Anbu style? The boy asked in reference to the many taijutsu styles that Anbu were forced to learn upon their entrance to the program. Yamato was mildly impressed with the boy's knowledge. The Sandaime did say he was good at gathering information. Yes, though it originated in what was once known as Uzu no Kuni. The Jonin carefully gauged his charge's reaction. Specifically, from the shinobi village of Uzushio Gakur, Naruto finished for him quietly, eyes lowered at the thought of his dead ancestors. You've heard of it, Yamato stated more than asked. I can do my research, Naruto said quietly. Certain subjects motivate me to dig more than others, he finished somewhat cryptically. Yamato nodded, taking note of the change in his student's tone and mood. Maybe I should have been less blunt, he thought in retrospect. He wasn't used to dealing with children, and certainly not orphans with emotional baggage. Do you think of them often? He asked gently. He too was an orphan, and could sympathize with wanting to know about one's family. Unfortunately, he had never actually found who his was. Naruto shrugged, visibly collecting himself. He didn't like thinking about his family. Only if I can't help it. Thinking about them does me no real good, does it? Best just to move on. Yamato nodded. While jaded, especially coming from a preteen, it was a good outlook to have on life for a shinobi. There were things that you just couldn't change, and dwelling on them did no one save your enemies any good. The style? Naruto asked, eager as ever to steer the conversation back into safer waters. 
safer waters that had nothing to do with his feelings about his deceased relatives. Ah, yes. Yamato shifted himself once more, and Naruto watched as the wood moved with him. It was somewhat disconcerting. Shinzo Kara, beyond standard katas that you will be learning, is truly all about being knowledgeable of your surroundings. Whether those surroundings are people, trees, weapons, doesn't matter, the Jonin lectured. Naruto got the impression that this wasn't the first time the man had made this speech. Knowledge of actions and whatever reactions you choose to implement. A defensive style? Naruto asked, as that is what such a style would be classified as. Surely not. In the way I use it, yes, Yamato confirmed. You, I suspect, will bring a more offensive-oriented mindset to the style. Naruto raised a blonde eyebrow. I wasn't aware that a mindset could be brought to a taijutsu style. Yamato shrugged. With most, more rigid styles, the mind of the user only truly affects how hard they hit, as there are only a set number of moves and katas that one can use while still conforming to the style. With Shinzo Kara, while there are certain patterns and even katas, the mindset of the user is everything. When put into practice, there is a constant choice that has to run through the user's mind. In reacting to this, do I seek to kill, or to maim, or even to not injure? Naruto nodded at the explanation. No matter what though, each option hurts. That they do, Yamato confirmed with a wry smile. Naruto settled back in thought, his eyes drifting to the open cage Bunshine scroll. He wasn't entirely sure why he was learning this new style of taijutsu, but he wasn't going to complain about it. As much as he was comfortable with Gokan, it was far too rigid for someone who wasn't completely devoted to taijutsu. He would never be so one-dimensional, at least not by choice. He had been in the beginning stages of trying to create his own taijutsu style, one far less rigid than Gokan, but only the heavens knew when that might have actually happened, let alone if it would have happened. And now he had this dropping neatly into his lap, with a B-ranked clone technique that would help him everywhere thrown in as a party favor. At this point, from the viewpoint of a shinobi in training, things couldn't be better. It hardly counted as a consolation prize after losing Asuma, but it would help him move forward in the long run. So when do I start learning this stuff? He asked Yamato. A raised eyebrow met his query. When you learn that jutsu, was the answer. Naruto blinked once, grinned, and settled down into his training mindset. I'll get along with this guy just fine, he thought with satisfaction. Slash tilde slash. I don't like this guy. Naruto just rolled his eyes at the complaint that was now fast becoming Ino's most used sentence. Unfortunately, he was alone in this, as in a surprising twist of the norm, Kiba was fully backing up her claims of hating their new sensei. He really didn't see what the problem was. He voiced as much, and promptly winced at the openly hostile looks his team sent him. He rolled his eyes again, out of sight of course. Leave it to Ino and the mutt to finally agree on something, and that something being disagreeing with him. Honestly, he felt like he was on a team with children sometimes. Sensei. He called. Yamato, sitting as always in that weird chair of his, opened his eyes. Naruto didn't think for a second that the man had been sleeping. He had been thinking. A slight smirk crept up the man's face, about the only emotion the man showed on a regular basis. Ready, then? Naruto gave a single, curt nod, stealing himself. The preteen turned once to look at his two teammates, locking eyes with Kiba. The boy nodded back, though with considerably less intensity. Naruto just sighed, he'd have to have a long talk with the two of them after this session was over. It was due. Refocusing, Naruto stared down his new sensei for less than a full second, before breaking into a full-on chakra enhanced sprint at the man. Peripheral vision degenerated to a blur as Naruto moved, true tunnel vision only staved off by an intense concentration that didn't allow the blonde to slip into sunshine. 10 meters, 5 meters, come on, Kiba. Naruto mentally screamed. Almost 3 meters from his waiting sensei, Naruto felt the distinctive grip of chakra take hold of him for a split second, before disappearing just as quickly as it had come. Useless mutt. 2 meters from Yamato, Naruto halted the majority of his forward momentum gripping the ground with chakra for leverage, and rotated himself into a counterclockwise spin that carried him past his waiting sensei. Feet planted, tendons screaming, Naruto came to a full stop on the other side of Yamato, arms raised to his eye level in anticipation. He wasn't disappointed. Blurring almost too fast for the Janan to see, Yamato struck out with a right-handed haymaker that was blocked by Naruto's left forearm. Countless hours of clone training memories came to the fore in the blonde's mind, and he moved to grab the offending appendage and turn defense to offense. Chakra-laced fingers slipped over Yamato's retreating hand, 
finding just too little to grab hold of. Plan B, then. Naruto shuffle stepped to his right, managing to neatly avoid a thrust kick from the Jonin, and ducking under a follow-up that would have landed him in a nearby village. The Jinan lowered his center of mass before lashing out in a sweeping low kick at Yamato's legs, aiming to relieve his sensei of his balance. The former Anbu captain leapt over the leg sweep, but Naruto had expected it. Having only fractions of a second, Naruto pivoted like the wind, coiling and uncoiling faster than ever before and launching a brutal elbow at his airborne sensei with all the speed and suddenness of a snake. It connected solidly, the chakra-empowered strike launching the former Anbu back and sending him to the ground. Naruto grimaced for less than a second, before, senses screaming, he turned rapidly, arms raised in his now trademark taijutsu stance. It too proved futile, however, as Yamato occupied one of his arms with a cross punch before spinning Naruto off balance and sending him careening across the clearing with a kick to his exposed chest. The Jinan landed hard, and had a moment to glance at the downed and splintering form of Yamato's Moku Bunshine before grimacing in pain. That hurt. Falling back to the earth, Naruto took a leaf from Shikamaru's book and simply stared at the passing clouds for a few moments, reveling in the relative peace. It was about all he managed to get these days, in between personal and team training coupled with being Team 10's new mediator. As frustrating as it was, he was forced to admit that the earlier vitriol both Ino and Kiba had been spewing at their new sensei wasn't an isolated occurrence. It had been a sum total of two weeks since Yamato had taken the reins of Team 10, and it had been a rough going even from the very beginning. Kiba and Ino had been determinedly frosty toward the Jonin, and the man's own aloof attitude, oftentimes a bit robotic, certainly hadn't helped matters. Naruto had been left as the man in the middle, with Kiba and Ino committed to their private rebellion on one side, and Yamato stuck with simple reprimands, anything more would cause both of the Jinan to close up even more, that much was obvious to even Naruto, on the other. And, really, short of beating the two of them, which Naruto was loath to do, the boy couldn't really think up a way to get them to stop bitching. A hand blocking his view of the clouds helped him back to the present, and the Jinan grasped it firmly, letting Yamato pull him into a standing position. He winced slightly at the fresh pain from where the man had kicked him. Now more than ever was he glad for the healing capabilities of the demon fox inside him. Without them, he would have been a bloody mess on the ground, given the number of times both Kiba and Ino had managed to screw up their current exercise. Quite simply, they were instructed to kawarimi with him as he moved in on his opponent, Yamato in this case, in order to sow confusion and take advantage of opportunities created by the first person. It was one of the many teamwork exercises that Yamato had brought to Team 10, and, unfortunately, wasn't being handled well by two-thirds of the team. The only good thing coming out of it was Naruto getting some taijutsu practice against someone other than his clones. The proffered hand disappeared just as suddenly as it had come, and Naruto watched yet another bunshine of his new sensei fade. Blue eyes found the real man lecturing both Kiba and Ino back where Naruto had started his charge. The concentration is the most crucial part, and it is what you're currently lacking, Yamato said, his tone stern. You've been familiar with the jutsu for years now, so the only thing holding yourself back is your mind. Ino and Kiba both looked less than happy with the criticism, but only Ino spoke. We're not rookies, sensei. We know how the jutsu works. Naruto winced, hard. Both Ino and Kiba had been skirting around the edges of disrespect and outright insubordination for the entire two weeks Yamato had been their sensei. He'd brushed the majority of it off, the Sandaime probably told him to go easy on them for a while, but most of the two's little rebellion had been far from direct, the words spoken between them and occasionally Naruto, at which point the blonde boy would try, and fail, to impart some form of common sense. This though, was overt, and Yamato had no reason not to put the two in their place. Is that so? The man questioned. His voice was level and his face as impassive as ever, but Naruto could easily detect the undercurrent of frustration in the Jonin. Indeed, if that were the case, you wouldn't have so much trouble with what is by far the simplest of team-based maneuvers in Konoha's playbook. As it stands, only your third teammate seems to be able to manage it. Naruto had never really been one to be awkward, which couldn't really apply to someone who had been an infamous prankster in his younger days, but he couldn't really help it in the face of his teammates' resentful looks. It wasn't his fault he had picked up the technique quickly, months before really, they simply weren't concentrating. Hell, he was the one getting beaten down by their sensei every time Kiba or Ino managed to botch the technique. I wonder at what exactly you were taught previously, if such a simple exercise in a basic jutsu keeps eluding you. The blonde Janan bristled at the implied slight against Asuma's teaching, but managed to rein himself in. This was a dressing down long overdue and, no matter how much he liked his teammates, 
he knew that they needed it. Friction like this needed to be resolved quickly or Team 10 might as well disband, given what their future effectiveness would look like. While Naruto was restrained, his two teammates were not. Our sensei taught us well. Kiba all but screamed, Akamaru adding his own commentary in response to his partner's emotions. Then prove it, Yamato said flatly and so quickly that Naruto almost was forced to crack a smile at trap he had set for Kiba and Ino, though it certainly applied to him as well. If, after this, they continued to make their little rebellion a nuisance, they'd be dishonoring Asuma's memory, slighting all the work he had put into Team 10's growth. It took a few moments for other two-thirds of Team 10 to get the Jonin's ploy. They didn't seem all that happy about it, Naruto noted. Yamato sighed, the first real show of emotion the man let slip for the whole day. Naruto noticed that the man became less robotic as the day wore on. The Jonin decided to finish ahead for the day, and dismissed the team with a stern note to think on what he had said. Naruto retrieved his pack from where he had tossed it some hours earlier, idly taking out an energy bar and tearing it open. A quick glance at the path that led back to the village showed Kiba and Ino already on their way out. Neither of the two appeared to be in much of a mood to wait for him, to Naruto's chagrin, so he had to hurry to catch up. He threw Yamato a nod on his way past that the Jonin didn't bother to return. Drawing level with his team, Naruto listened with less than rapt attention as Ino and Kiba muttered insults of varying potency, shaking his head all the while. Finally having had enough of both, Naruto interrupted. What the fuck is your problem? The blonde didn't flinch as the hostile looks of earlier returned. They were expected at this point. Undeterred, he continued, we're supposed to be trying to get back to active duty and all you two are doing is fucking around like little kids. Ino looked like she was ready to deck him, but Kiba broke in before the blonde could get a word in edgewise. What's our problem? The fuck's your problem? Asuma sensei's dead and you're acting like nothing ever happened. And here was the heart of the issue. Asuma. Simple though the answer was, it was nonetheless extremely complex and difficult to deal with. From Naruto's perspective, Asuma had died a hero's death, but it had been of his own making. No one had forced him to stay in wave and fight, but he had chosen to, dragging Team 10 with him into what would and should have been an early grave for all four of them. As much as Naruto would miss the man who had become such a large part of his life, he had to move on. Ino and Kiba had no such thoughts, and only saw the hero's death their sensei had died, leaving them to pick up the pieces. Naruto sighed. Yes, he's dead, and I've moved on. Shit doesn't stop happening just because someone dies, and I'm not gonna be stuck flat-footed when it does. Kiba snorted and turned away, but Ino picked up the slack for him. He's been dead for a month and you're already making it seem like he never existed. He was our sensei, not some. Tool you can throw away. The girl finished, pausing for a moment in the middle to find the right words. I know that. Do you? Because it looks like you're having a hard time showing it. But that's not the point, Naruto shouted over Ino's interruption, finally coming to halt with the village in sight just down the path. Yes, he was our sensei. No, he wasn't just some tool. But that doesn't change the fact that he's dead and he would want us to move on. Getting petty about what Yamato tells us to do isn't about to bring him back. So that's it, then? You think you know best so you just go along with what this asshole of replacement says? Naruto had been emotional as a child. From irrational bouts of anger to distasteful pranks on the general populace, the boy had been one of the most openly expressive ninjas in training Konoha had ever seen. Those same emotions had been mostly bottled up in the years following his late night encounter with Uchiha Itachi forced aside in favor of a more reserved and calculating persona that was necessary to become a ninja that would ever stand a chance against an organization of mysterious shinobi. But that didn't mean he didn't have those same emotions anymore. People had once been wary of Naruto for more reasons than just his tenant. They said he had a temper. Those people were right, and Naruto wasn't one for what he saw as blatant stupidity in the face of a serious situation. Yeah, I am, because the guy knows what the fuck he's talking about. You're making it seem like Sensei's death was some tragic accident. Well, I've got news for you too, Asuma chose his death. He made a decision that the mission was more important than his and our lives, and paid for it. I'm not about to let the same thing happen to us. Any of us, he added for emphasis, blazing blue eyes boring into the faces of his teammates. Just because you're scared doesn't give you the right to act like nothing happened. Kiba broke in, fully regrouped as Eno sputtered from the slight against Asuma's judgment. I'm not. Shit happened and I'm trying to stop it from happening again. I'm trying to get stronger. You two fucking around, acting like a couple of spoilt brats back in the academy, puts all of us at risk. What happens next time round, and there will be a next time, when shit hits the fan, huh?
Huh? When the chips are on the fucking table and there's no one there to bail us out. I'll tell you what happens, we die. I'm not about to let that happen, and if that means that I have listened to a guy who's being put in as a replacement for Asuma, and an experienced Jonin at that, so be it. Looking back, he shouldn't have expected to have much of an effect on two people as emotional as Kiba and Ino, neither of them was particularly rational on their best days, nor were they objective on this matter in the slightest. You're a cold bastard, you know that, Naruto? Kiba growled. And you're too idiotic to see reason, Kiba, both of you. I'll live with being cold so long as it keeps people alive. For a moment it looked as if the dog ninja was about to throttle Naruto, who would have welcomed it at this point, but instead did the smartest thing he could and stormed off down the path to the village. Ino followed him without hesitation shortly afterward, but not before tossing Naruto a glare that tried to burn a hole in his face, blonde hair whipping about in the wind. Naruto was left on his own in their wake, standing at the entrance to one of Konoha's many dense, outlying woodlands. Frustration bubbled up in him for a moment before he spun abruptly, channeling chakra into a punch that shattered the trunk of a tree. The sapling tumbled to the ground with a crash as Naruto followed the rapidly disappearing forms of his teammates with his eyes, shaking his head all the while. They would learn he was right. They would have to. Slash tilde slash. Twin Anbu on the rooftops halted across from one another without a sound. Heads turning in opposite directions, the elite shinobi surveyed the surrounding area with critical eyes. Save for the few forms of late night walkers or workers, the streets were empty. Konoha was a shinobi village, and as the strongest, it wasn't surprising that foreign agents would do their utmost to infiltrate it. It was at this time, past midnight, that Anbu was in full force in their patrols. Infiltrators were caught weekly, almost daily at times, and every nook and cranny needed to be surveyed. The first, a woman wearing a dog mask, flipped through a quick series of hand seals before nodding. Her partner, a lizard-masked man, nodded back, brining his hands together in a ram seal. A single pulse of chakra, not big enough to disturb any sleeping villagers, emanated from the shinobi, the technique working to unearth anyone hidden in a genjutsu. It had the added effect of rebounding off of surrounding nearby chakra presences, alerting the male onbu to anyone using natural cover. There was one nearby, but the chakra indicated they were sleeping on the inside of the wall. Five seconds after the pulse dispersed, the lizard-masked man sent out one more, just to be safe. Satisfied after finding nothing, he gave his female companion a nod. With a whiff of displaced air, the duo vanished into the night, having disturbed no one. Using chakra to cling to the side of the building the two Anbu had just surveyed, positioned on the inner edge of a window, Naruto breathed out in a slow, steady exhale. The blonde, clothed entirely in a blue so dark it could be black, counted out two minutes in his head starting from when he heard the two Anbu leave. He was no censor, but two highly trained chakra presences were hard not to notice in a village full of sleeping people. Reaching the 122nd mark, Naruto deftly and silently leveraged himself, gripping the wall with chakra, and flipped onto the roof. Landing in a crouch, body low with his right leg extended in case of any sudden movements, the Jinan did a quick 360-degree visual check of his surroundings. Finding no one, and mentally congratulating himself for avoiding the patrol, he relaxed for a moment. An easy smile crossed his face, concealed by a half-mask though it was. It was almost fun for Naruto, indulging in what had become one of his guiltiest pleasures. Sneaking past patrols on his way to some late night, or early morning, as it was, training was a bit of a pastime for the blonde. As an academy student, he wasn't given access to the training grounds without special permission, and no one ever seemed willing to give it to him. So he made do, as he always did. True, there was no reason for him to have to sneak past patrols to get in some late-night training, as a Jinan he had full access to all but the Forest of Death, reserved for tuning it up, but it helped keep the hard-earned stealth skills sharp. Anyone could be fooled by a good enough cloaking genjutsu or ninjutsu, just like anyone could break a good enough genjutsu. It took real skill to sneak past patrols without using chakra, and it was one of the things that Naruto had taken pride in for years. Knowing where to hide, how to position the body and suppress enough your presence to seem like a chakra presence that was so close to the building's edge as to be inside it, how to move without expending chakra and go undetected in a village full of watchful lookouts, it was things like that that counted as real stealth. Asuma had often said that Naruto was born to be an infiltration specialist. The man was right. Taking a moment to feel the wind through his skin-tight mesh shirt, Naruto surveyed his surroundings once more, before silently creeping his way to training ground 11. A shunshine would have been quicker, but with how locked down a hidden village was at night, the speed technique was simply a way of asking to get caught. Landing softly in the clearing, 
Naruto pulled back the blue bandana covering his hair to scratch his head before replacing it with a blue hoodie, shinobi grade, from one of his storage scrolls. Tight-fitting clothing was a must when sneaking around, as loose garments flapping in the wind were a dead giveaway to any observant patrols. Fully covered from head to toe in blue, Naruto brought his hands together in a cross-shaped seal. Cage Bunshine no Jutsu, he murmured. Twelve puffs of smoke heralded the arrival of his clones, each clad in the same clothing as he. A single nod greeted the doppelgangers, and they each moved into the nearby trees, disappearing from the original's sight. Back in the clearing, Naruto centered himself, calling up the numerous lectures on his taijutsu Yamato had given him, as well as the hours of practice he had gone through with his clones. Taking a deep breath, Naruto drew his former sensei's trademark knuckle knives and made his way into the trees, tensed in anticipation for the rustlings in the dark. Chapter 10, In the Presence of Enemies. Slash tilde slash. A dull thump sounded by Konoha's main gate as Naruto casually dropped his travel pack. Dirt kicked up in a cloud, coating his sandals and mid-calf high bandages in a thin layer of grime. He didn't much care as he lowered himself to the ground, leaning his head back against the hardwood of the massive gate and closed his eyes in thought. Meet at the north gate at 9 o'clock sharp, Yamato had said. We have a joint mission. Pack for two weeks worth of travel. The Jonin hadn't said anything more the previous day, preferring instead to vanish in the standard Konoha sunshine. Naruto had shaken his head in light frustration while Kiba and Ino had walked off in their almost daily huff, not bothering to wait for the Jinchuriki. Such had become the habit of Team 10. Ever since the argument between him and his team, the less mature members in his opinion, both Kiba and Ino had taken to ostracizing him as much as they could. They had decided that not speaking to him for the most part and leaving practice without him were their best courses of action. Avoiding him outside of team training was easy, and Naruto didn't do too much to bridge the gap, but missions were more difficult. While Yamato had decided, rather wisely, that a C-rank mission outside of the village with the team in such a state would be an altogether bad idea, D-rank missions were far from off-limits. Whereas before the chores had simply been tedious and annoying, now, given the relative tension, they were the mother of all awkwardness for the 12-year-old blonde. Neither of his two teammates talked to him beyond the bare minimum necessary to complete the assigned tasks, and the two left him to do his work on his own. Naruto had taken to using his new clones, the cage bunshine was rapidly becoming his favorite technique, to get his assigned work done. Fast and easy, Naruto had to wonder how he had ever managed to get D-ranked missions done without the aid of his clones. Of course, Yamato wasn't about to just let him leave after doing his own work, often making the blonde help out his teammates. Ostensibly, it was for the benefit of the team, and the man was looking to rebuild some of the team dynamic Team 10 had possessed before Asuma had died. It didn't work all that well. Rather than building teamwork between the members, the D-ranked missions, specifically Naruto's new and easy way of doing the chores, only served to irritate Kiba and Ino further. Naruto felt like he was on a team with 10-year-olds, rather than the mature ninjas they were supposed to be. Admittedly, Yamato could have done more to build camaraderie between the three pubescent 12-year-olds, but Naruto felt he either couldn't or didn't bother trying. The Jinan suspected the former. Being an Anbu, something Naruto was nearly sure that his new sensei had been, didn't exactly promote strong, tight-knit relationships and emotional bonding. Good sensei from a technical standpoint Yamato was, but he wasn't a nurturer by any means. More than ever, Naruto found himself missing the easygoing and fairly transparent nature that Asuma had projected, if for nothing else than to resolve the growing chasm between him and his teammates. Conversely, Yamato was as reserved as any person Naruto had ever met, including Sasuke. His somewhat withdrawn nature didn't endear him to Ino or Kiba, despite his effectiveness as a teacher during their team sessions. While Naruto certainly couldn't claim to be friends with the man, something he could have said with ease about his first sensei, they had a strong working relationship. When Yamato lectured, Naruto listened, when Naruto raised questions, Yamato answered them. They got along as well as any two people in a workplace could. It was clean-cut, efficient, and sterile, filled with none of the easygoing cheer and near-familial bond Naruto had shared with Asuma, but it worked. Despite himself, Naruto found himself content with his relationship with the former Anbu, a sentiment only compounded by a steady growth under the man's tutelage. Yamato could teach, and Naruto was more than happy to learn. Beneath it all, Team 10 splintered. Kiba and Ino would have their petty vendetta while Naruto waited, with growing impatience, for the two see just how stupid they were being. Sometimes he wondered if it wouldn't be better if they just went their separate ways. The emergence of familiar chakra presences accompanied muted footsteps, drawing Naruto from his reverie. 
Blue eyes drifted open lazily and Naruto half turned to see Team 8 walking toward him leisurely. Ohio, Naruto. Nice look. New? Came the familiar greeting of Akimichi Kuji, his usual snacks surprisingly absent. Hayuga Hinata and Aburame Shino, his two teammates, trailed slightly behind the large boy, Kuji having sped up to reach his old friend. A change in his usual attire explained the boy's greeting. Over his standard green t-shirt he wore a black flak vest, similar to the standard issue green ones worn by Chunin and Jonin in Konoha, that he left unzipped. Lo, Kuji, was all the blonde said in response, not in the mood for much small talk. Naruto stood fluidly, like the shinobi he was, to greet his old running buddy from the academy. Reaching forward, he grasped his friend's forearm in a standard, customary Akimichi greeting. A smile that was a cross between a grimace and a wince broke across his face as Kuji returned the grip. Tubby bastard always was strong, he thought somewhat fondly, recalling many such greetings. How's it going? Can't complain, I guess. You? The blonde shrugged, some of his earlier thoughts returning in spite of Kuji's perpetual cheer. Good and bad. Learning to just roll with it, I suppose. The smile on the large boy's face dimmed somewhat, no doubt thinking that Naruto was speaking of dealing with Asuma's death. He was, in a way, but certainly not in the way the Akimichi thought. That didn't even begin to cover the rest of the shitstorm of information he was currently dealing with. How's that going? Kuji asked sympathetically. Naruto snorted a laugh. It's going, was all he said. Kuji nodded his acceptance, and Naruto moved past him to greet Shino and Hinata. Good to see you, Shino, Hinata. It's been a while. Shino nodded briskly, as was his way, while Hinata flushed and averted her eyes to the ground, silently pressing her fingers together as was her way. Indeed, Naruto-san. My condolences for the loss of your sensei. A Anyo, it is good to see why you as well, Naruto-kun. Naruto nodded at the respective greetings, quietly thanking Shino for his sympathy, before moving on to other topics, trying and failing to distract himself. So, you guys have any idea what, exactly, we're gonna be doing on this mission? Yamato-sensei wasn't specific. It was Shino who answered. Kurenai-sensei spoke of a search and retrieval mission to the country of rice fields. Increased bandit activity in the area of interest is why additional manpower was requested in the form of an additional Janan squad. Naruto nodded as Shino spoke, digesting the dry, yet informative details. Great, he said dryly, far from enthralled. What are we retrieving? An information packet being delivered by the daimyo of Ricefield's men, as per the treaty between our countries, the near melodious voice of Yuhi Kurenai sounded from behind her Janan, causing Kuji and Hinata to jump in surprise. Shino was unaffected, simply turning at the sound of her voice, while Naruto had seen her approach over the heads of Team 8. Two blonde eyebrows rose at the statement. Isn't that something handled by Chunin and Jonin? Janan didn't get slotted into missions where any type of sensitive information was being passed. It was too dangerous. Kurenai offered him a reassuring smile, her inky black hair blowing in the slight breeze. The packet contains nothing sensitive, and is more of a formality to be observed than anything truly necessary. Naruto gave the Jonin a nod before quickly averting his eyes so as to not be caught staring. You're looking well? Naruto-san. It's good to see, the pretty Jonin offered, and Naruto flushed involuntarily at her words before giving her a quick smile. The group descended into silence as Kurenai dropped her pack next to Naruto's and moved to make small talk with the two gate guards. The sound of chips being chewed filled the air as Naruto looked about for conversation, all the while not particularly wanting to speak. It was an interesting contradiction. Just as Naruto began to tap his foot, the sound of bickering assaulted his ears, and a sardonic smile found its way to his mouth. About time you two showed, he quipped blandly, not really irritated. You're early, we're on time, Eno offered briskly as the two greeted the members of Team 8 with considerably more cheer. Nice to see you too, Naruto grumbled under his breath. Yamato here yet? Kiba grunted after obligatory etiquette had been observed. No, Naruto returned a scowl crossing his face as he spied Ino and Kuji in familiar and friendly conversation. He scanned the gathered group. I'd expected he'd be here by, now, the blonde trailed off, keen blue eyes finding the form of his sensei causally leaning against the outside of the gate. When did he? Blue eyes met black, and Naruto thought he spied a slight smirk pass over his sensei's face, but it was gone before he could fully make it out. Sly bastard, Naruto thought as he watched Yamato get Kurenai's attention before the two made their way to the assembled Janan. As you've been informed, 
This mission is a C rank collaboration between teams 8 and 10. Our objective is a standard information packet to be handed over to us just inside the border of the country of rice fields. I assume you've each packed for two weeks worth of travel? Yamato asked the group, though it wasn't really a question. Six nods and a few muttered yeses met his inquiry. Move out. Slash tilde slash. The sound of crashing water was all-encompassing, loud to the point of being wince-inducing. Water, brilliantly blue yet clear as the day as it reflected the sun's rays flowed underfoot, the current unperturbed by the sandals resting atop it. Naruto didn't see the water, however. Neither did he see the myriad of ensnared fish struggling upstream beneath his very feet. He didn't see the sun's refracted rays, somehow managing to create a near rainbow in the thin mist permeating the air halfway across the river into the country of rice fields. Nor did he see the trees extending behind him for miles along the river on which he stood, finally giving away to water and rolling fields and hills. He barely even heard the sound of the awesome waterfall to his left, deafened as he was by the sound of his own heartbeat. All Naruto saw was stone that gave way to a flash of indigo hair and red eyes that inspired both envy and terror in him. Eyes as blue as the water flowing beneath him were locked on the carved face of the man who Uchiha Itachi had warned him of four, almost five, he corrected himself, years ago. Uchiha Madara. His hands clenched at his sides unconsciously and his eyes narrowed as his internal equilibrium was disturbed by the swirling, almost nauseating sensation of the Kyuubi's chakra being drawn upon as the name of Naruto's formerly faceless nemesis echoed through his subconscious. The reaction was mostly his, though he suspected that the Kyuubi might have played a small part in the stirring of the pot. The beast could probably be considered the only sentient being in existence that could honestly say that he hated Uchiha Madara more than Naruto did. And Naruto hated him quite a bit. He had been all but responsible for the deaths of both of his parents. Listless blue eyes stared out at the 200-foot-tall cage in front of him, seeing but not truly comprehending the vision before him. Around him, water rippled in great waves and the walls shook as the Kyuubi's mocking laughter erupted, the beast glorifying in the pain it could cause its container. The Yondaime, his father. Naruto could see nothing, could feel nothing in the wake of the information that was as close to earth-shattering as Naruto felt he would ever receive. The Yondaime, the man he had adored for his childhood and hated since he had learned of his burden, was his father. The fact that his mother had been both the last of the once proud Uzumaki clan and the previous container of the Kyuubi was all but shoved to the wayside in the face of his father's identity. Pushed aside in the face of the curse Namikaze Minato had given him. Beyond the cage, beyond the swirling water and the miasma of crimson-colored chakra that crashed and broke around and against him, beyond the fox's cruel thundering, one thought penetrated Naruto's mind. Old man, why didn't you tell me? Even now, the thought would echo across his mind every now and then, putting him into a mood of gloom and introspection as he tried to piece together why the old man that he had looked to as a grandfather had withheld information so critical to his identity. He never came up with much, nothing so serious that it would prevent the Sandaime from telling Naruto due to any real danger to him. Needless to say, his teammates on the mission to Rice Field Country had stayed clear of him for the majority of that day. He had gone to the QB for information on Madara. The fox obviously would have information to yield about a man he had tasked Naruto with killing, to be greeted with the tale of October the 10th 12 years previous. The tale of how Madara, a man with chakra fouler than even my own, the fox had said, had managed to rip the beast from his mother's seal and force it to his will with his Sharingan's trickery, all but killing his mother, Uzumaki Kushina, in the process, before setting it loose on Konoha. The Yondaime, the fox had concluded after some years of thought on the matter, for it hadn't been present had fought Madara to a standstill before breaking the Uchiha's hold over the beast and sealing it away in Naruto. The fox had been far from pleased to relate the tale of its own imprisonment, but took a vindictive solace in the fact that Naruto felt as much pain as it did at the revelations. Naruto had been all but silent for the day, and his team had been even more skittish around him than normal, correctly sensing his mood and having no wish to tempt the sleeping dragon. Yamato had seemed to ignore the episode for the most part, but Naruto had sensed, when he had bothered to pay attention to those around him, that the man was wary. Not for the first time did Naruto wonder about the man's placement on the team as sensei. Sarutobi was no fool, and it would have made no sense to saddle some Jonin, even a former Anbu captain, with a tailed beast container if they would be ill-equipped to deal with it. It was especially so, now that Naruto had accessed the fox's chakra. A flash of red in his peripheral vision sent a shock of terror through him his body unconsciously associating the color with the famous dojutsu of his Uchiha nemesis. Fight or flight took hold of the blonde for a single second, his brain shooting orders down nerve impulses at the speed of thought. Arm and leg muscles tensed in preparation, 
and Naruto's right arm twitched in expectation of delivering a jabbing palm strike to his assailant's throat. The motion was never completed, halted in the middle as Naruto realized, belatedly, that the flash of red merely belonged to Yuhi Kurenai's dress, not Uchiha Madara Sharingan. Get a grip, Naruto, he chastised himself, noting that though the female Jonin looked at ease, the tightening around her eyes spoke of her knowledge of his reaction. Both teams are ready to move out, Naruto, she spoke, her soft voice somehow carrying over the roar of the falls. He nodded once, curtly, and turned to follow her back to the small camp the two teams had made just inside the border of fire country. The journey from Konoha had been a long one, requiring non-stop running since that morning, and all the Jinan were in need of a rest to regain their bearings for the rest of the mission. They entered the camp in silence. Naruto's trained eyes quickly locating his teammates and those of Team 8 loitering about a clearing that had been filled, just a few minutes previous, by a good-sized wooden house that Yamato had seen fit to make grow from the ground. The man had apparently decided to rest in style. Naruto had never seen his teammates happier with their sensei than they had been in that moment, though they returned to their usual cold treatment a few minutes later once the novelty had worn off. Yamato himself was packed and ready, standing at the edge of the forested clearing to observe the five Janan. Naruto spared the man a nod as he passed him, swiftly walking to his pack that was leaned against a tree. The blonde had never bothered to unpack, preferring to relieve himself quickly in the woods before making his way to the valley of the end to brood. He took up a position next to his sensei in watching the proceedings. The group was ready to move in short order with little fanfare aside from a rather humorous interaction between Kiba and Shino. Just because I employ insect-based techniques, Kiba-san, Shino had patiently explained, does not make me responsible for Akamaru's flea problem. The group stood assembled before the two Jonin in silence as Yamato addressed them, our destination lies almost two hours to the northwest of here. With any luck, the packet will be delivered on time and we can begin our journey back to Konoha immediately. The meeting's location, sensei? Naruto asked. Yamato gave him a look, and he elaborated, the briefing packet wasn't specific. Shintoshi, Yamato recited blandly. That's Fuma clan territory, Abarame Shino's quiet voice came from the back of the assembled Janan. The rest of teams 8 and 10 turned as one to look at him. Naruto squinted in thought, the only Fuma clan he knew of lived in rain country. Yamato simply nodded without expression, but Kurenai looked pleased. Yes it is, Shino. The Fuma clan have long been allies of Rice Fields Daimyo, and have agreed to provide protection and supervision for our meeting with the Daimyo's men. Naruto's eyebrows went to his hairline, but Ino beat him to the punch in asking, Is that really necessary, Kurenai sensei Her expression was quizzical, belying the calculating mind Naruto knew she had underneath. This is only a C-ranked mission, after all. At her proclamation, Kiba stiffened, while Naruto struggled to look unaffected. His eyes unconsciously flickered to Yamato's, who was staring directly at him with an unfathomable expression in his eyes. The hair on the back of Naruto's neck stood up. Something's wrong here. The blonde barely noticed when Kurenai waved off his teammate's concern. The presence of the clan is simply ceremonial. It has been a tradition since the end of the last war for the Fuma clan to be present at the daimyo's dealings, given the close relationship the two entities share. Team 8 nodded as a whole, accepting their sensei's words without question. Team 10 nodded as well, though all three sets of eyes were locked on their sensei. A look of resignation seemed to pass through the man's black orbs for a moment, though it was gone too quickly to be sure. Good then, Kurenai said, clapping once. Shall we? She asked Yamato. The brown-haired Joni nodded once in response. Let's go. A chorus of yes, sensei, rang out through the clearing as the Janan hastened to obey, and the six preteens leapt into the trees. Or they would have, had Naruto not taken that moment to trip over an exposed root, falling flat on his stomach in the process before he could catch himself. A round of chuckles greeted his flushed face as he rose, eyes cast downward at the tree root that had tripped him up. He tilted his head quizzically. That wasn't there before, he thought. Glancing up to the still chuckling teams, Naruto made eye contact with his sensei. A smile played about the man's lips, but it stopped a long way before touching his eyes. Naruto knew the man well enough to recognize that the jonin was all business. Are you quite ready, Naruto? Yamato asked dryly, or do you need a minute to collect yourself? We can wait. The collective gazes of the whole group snapped to the brown-haired jonin at the sheer novelty of the usually sober man cracking a joke, while Naruto stiffened unconsciously at the feeling of something crawling up his leg. 
only his expectation of his sensei sending him a message kept him from crying out in surprise as what felt like a snake slithered up his right leg before depositing something in his pocket. A lightning fast glance to the ground revealed the root he had tripped over quickly retracting, burying itself in the ground where it had come from, just as he had expected. Blue eyes sought black once more, but the man was looking to Kurinai now as she gently reprimanded him for making fun of his student. The nearly hidden smile on her face belied her sincerity, however, and the former Anbu captain took his dressing down with the same bland look that he seemed to take everything else with. Kurinai hadn't noticed. Eyes flickering to the five other faces in the squad, Naruto found nothing out of the ordinary, and the Hyuga didn't have her Byakugan engaged. Less than three seconds gone, a message passed, and no one knows a thing, Naruto marveled, his respect for Yamato going up a notch. His hand drifted to his right pocket, where he casually felt what seemed to be paper stuffed inside. He refrained from raising an eyebrow. The man could bend wood to his will, and paper was made from trees after all. A scant three minutes later found Naruto in the trees, taking up the rear of the group as they left the site of the Valley of the End in their wake. It wasn't hard for the blonde to surreptitiously remove the paper Yamato had passed him without the notice of the rest of the group, positioned as he was. Blue eyes scanned the note quickly. Instead of writing with ink, the paper looked to have pieces cut out of it in the shape of letters. Naruto squinted slightly, as the weird letters took some adjustment of the eyes to read properly. They formed a concise list. Information Packet Objective Retrieved from Fuma Contact Otogakura no Sato, knew. It said nothing more, but Naruto knew enough to put the pieces together. Despite being labeled as a simple C-ranked retrieval mission, the joint effort was simply a cover for the two Jonin, probably Yamato specifically, to collect some form of information on Otogakura no Sato, some new village. Whatever it was that was being retrieved, it was obviously sensitive enough for the Hokage to devise a cover for it. The old man didn't want this new village to know about Konoha's espionage. Beyond that, the fact that it was entrusted to a former Anbu captain spoke volumes about how potentially important this information was. A spark of frustration and anger rushed through him at the knowledge of the secret mission. His team had been victim of a mislabeled mission once before, with deadly consequences. That he and his team were being thrown into the line of fire again, this time with the Hokaye's full knowledge, nearly made him scream at the unfairness of it all. But isn't that what being a ninja is all about? A small, traitorous part of his brain supplied. Wasn't that exactly what Asuma had been warning him about back in Wave? About how mission objectives wouldn't always be defined, how information would be limited, and how he would have to adapt and deal with it in order to stay alive as a Chunin and Jonin, let alone be successful. Yes, he decided, this is exactly what Asuma Sensei was talking about. Life wasn't fair, especially for a ninja. Naruto knew this better than anyone given his upbringing yet he allowed himself to fall into the same line of thinking as his teammates, allowing himself petulant reactions in situations that, while indeed unfair, couldn't be changed, and where complaining did no one any good. That couldn't happen, that wouldn't happen. Not anymore. Bitching about his situation hadn't gotten him anywhere as a child and he had accepted that and learned to live with it. He'd do the same here. He couldn't say anything without blowing the missions cover to teammate. All he could do was be as ready as physically possible and be prepared to carve up any auto nin who happened to cross paths with their group. He sped up briefly, passing Yamato's note to Kiba and giving the Inuzuka a tap on the shoulder to let him know. His teammates, at least, deserved to know, and he doubted that Yamato would have expected the information to be kept from them anyway. Once sure of the dog ninja's awareness, Naruto dropped back, adjusting his weapon's pouches and readying his knives. Slash tilde slash the group of Konoha ninja didn't reach Shintoshi until it was nearly nightfall, at which time they were invited to dinner at the expense of the Fuma clan head, a man ever eager to impress his guests. Yamato had looked ready to immediately refuse the kind offer, obviously in a hurry to get whatever information the Hokage was to receive from the clan back to Konoha as quickly as possible. But the Janan weren't trained for operating on zero rest. It had been a long journey for the Janan, and each of them was quite ready for some rest before setting off the next morning and it wasn't as if Yamato had any real excuse to leave, given that this was supposed to be just an average c rank mission and he wasn't about to blow the real mission's cover. Kurenai's logic had won out in the end. They were surrounded by friendly clan members and in friendly territory. It would be better to rest sooner, rather than have to stop in the middle of their journey back to deal with a Janan who happened to pass out due to lack of rest. The former Anbu wasn't too happy with the decision, but refrained from showing his displeasure. It was clear enough to most, however, that the man was on edge, and they steered clear of the Jonin for the night. Dinner was an altogether pleasant affair, with the clan head, Hanzaki, 
treating the Konoha ninjas to what was far closer to a feast than a regular dinner. The man apparently wanted to show off, and the Konoha Janan were far from complaining at the ridiculous amount of food in front of them. Huji, especially, had enjoyed himself. For Naruto, though, the entire affair was an exercise in trying his limited patience. As he had expected would happen, Kiba had immediately passed the note Yamato had made off to Ino. What the blonde hadn't expected, though he probably should have in retrospect, were the reactions his two teammates would have to the thought of a secondary mission beyond their own. Instead of coming to the conclusion that the Hokage obviously had his reasons for sending their team, specifically Yamato, to retrieve covert information, the less mature thirds of Team 10 unanimously decided that the whole situation was far too familiar to the botched mission in Wave, and that it was all Yamato's fault. The latest bout of wisdom from the dynamic duo saw Kiba and Ino cornering Yamato immediately when the two teams broke for a few minutes of rest, with a hushed shouting match and a severe dressing down following shortly afterwards. It was only Naruto's fast talking to Kurenai and the pretty Jonin's ability to run interference with her own team that prevented the entire mission from being aired right then and there. Naruto wondered at the futility of it all. Sure, people would believe what they wanted to believe, and there was no way that Team 8 would have had any inkling of a different, covert mission, but the three Janan weren't stupid. They would start suspecting something at some point, Shino at least was perceptive, and then the whole mission would be blow open. Needless to say, Naruto had received a dressing down of his own once Yamato had made sure that Kiba and Ino weren't about to defect. Apparently he hadn't been supposed to share Yamato's information with his team. Unused to being in the wrong, the whole scene had screamed unfairness at Naruto, but he had swallowed his displeasure. He didn't have to like it, however. At length, he found himself holed away in a corner of the clan head's house, a rather large building in the very center of Shintoshi, reading through the earth manipulation section of the scrolls that Asuma had given him before the wave mission. He remembered the first stages of his wind training under the dead Jonin with nothing even close to familiar fondness, and had hoped that he would have to do nothing more involving leaves. The scroll said differently, and Naruto added it to the growing list of frustrations that the mission was heralding. Yamato and Kurenai were talking quietly with Hanzaki, though Naruto couldn't hear what was being said from his position. He suspected it had to do with the mission, but couldn't be sure. Yamato had conveniently disappeared for a few minutes before dinner, and had returned far more at ease than he had seemed before. It wasn't something noticed by one who wasn't looking for it, but Naruto had been paying special attention to both Jonin ever since Yamato had told him about the real mission. A slight ease in the shoulders, less tightness around the eyes, fewer discreet glances about, small and unnoticeable under normal circumstances, but the circumstances weren't normal, and Naruto wasn't a normal Janan. The whole thing seemed suspicious, and led Naruto to believe that the necessary information was not being delivered with the daimyo's men, as he had thought before, and was retrieved instead by a separate contact inside the clan. The blonde admitted to himself that he could be wrong in his assumption, but felt that after a month and a half of quietly observing his new sensei that he could pick up a few of the man's idiosyncrasies. Yamato hadn't seemed half as relaxed the entire trip, even when the samurai had hand-delivered their packet to him, and the Janan couldn't think of any other reason why the man might be so now. Thoughts of his enigmatic sensei flew from his mind as a blue and orange blob shaped like a human dropped itself next to him. Blue eyes turned from his elemental scroll to the blob, only to realize that the blob was in fact a girl around his age, with burnt orange hair and a navy blue bodysuit. Brown eyes peeked out from a soft, rounded face curiously, staring at his scroll intently. He snapped it shut. Can I help you? Naruto asked in his best polite voice, even as the girl turned her eyes to him with mild annoyance. No, she said after a pause. Her voice was harder than Naruto had expected, having pegged her to be about his age, but carried an undercurrent of something that the boy couldn't quite place. Well all right then, the blonde thought with a bit of wonder. He reopened his scroll, this time trying to actually get some reading done rather than muse about the mission, and was unsurprised when the orange-haired girl didn't move, but instead returned her eyes to the earth manipulation text. The simplest of exercises for students of earth manipulation is the leaf-crushing exercise. Similar to its counterparts, leaf-splitting, burning, and shattering, the exercise is designed to force the student to become in tune with the nature chakra. With earth manipulation, it is important for the student to attempt to crush the leaf, not with pure chakra pressure alone, but by allowing the life energy to seep into the leaf and force it to crumble, rather than do so from the outside. Ironically, this exercise is most similar to the leaf shattering technique, its lightning nature counterpart, despite being elemental opposites. Naruto was drawn from his reading as the orange-haired girl's head drifted closer to his as he unconsciously moved the scroll to his right, further away from her. 
The Jeannan looked to her sharply and met brown eyes once more before they glanced away, a faint blush marring pale cheeks. Can I help you? He asked once more, foregoing bluntness and ignoring the what the hell do you want? That was begging to be asked. He normally wouldn't have bothered, but, like most boys his age, he had a soft spot for cute females who smelled nice. You can move your scroll to the left some. The Uzumaki shrugged and obliged her. It wasn't like she was really disrupting him. She was merely curious. It was understandable, he felt, given that the Fuma clan wasn't in possession of many ninjutsu, or so he had learned. The guards at the entrance to the compound had carried bows and arrows in addition to the standard kunai and shuriken, and he knew for a fact that Hanzaki usually toted a zambadu on his back. The evidence pointed to a clan of shinobi far more focused on taijutsu and weapons rather than ninjutsu, something so far from the norm in Konoha that Naruto had a hard time imagining what it must have been like. Your clan doesn't have much in the way of ninjutsu, he probed, though it was more of a statement than a question. No. Naruto bit down on his frustration at the intransigent girl, allowing a sigh to escape his lips and nothing more. He hadn't had to deal with people refusing to talk to him for years, since he had started taking his academy time seriously, and consequently hadn't been forced to wheedle information from unwilling sources for quite some time. That didn't mean he couldn't dust off his skills, however, though they would likely need a bit of a tune-up. He doubted that the girl would react well to a combination of puppy dog eyes and incessant hollering. Yes, I guessed as much, he began, shrugging off the one-word answer like it hadn't frustrated him in the slightest. The bows and arrows were a bit of a tip-off, to be honest. Not many ninja carry them these days. I suppose not. Right. Well, you see, that got me thinking. Maybe a clan of weapons specialists? I thought, but that didn't make much sense. Not in this day and age. He had her full attention now, though from how her eyes tracked down the scroll and finally stopped, it was most likely because she had finished reading what Naruto had left open and didn't want to ask him to open the scroll further. I did some reading about the Fuma clan back home and didn't come up with much outside of Rain Country. I figure you guys must be some offshoot that happened along the way that got kicked out or something. He trailed off, ostensibly because, were he genuinely rambling, he would have just realized that he had probably just insulted every fiber of familial pride the girl possessed. She didn't disappoint. Brown eyes glared into his blue harshly, and when the girl opened her mouth her voice was just as barbed, though still quiet. I'll thank you not to call my clan a family of bastards, she hissed. Ah, I'm so sorry, Naruto exclaimed, hands held up in surrender. I didn't mean to insult you. I'm just curious as to why your clan doesn't seem to have much in the way of ninjutsu, he said contritely. That's all. Maybe because we specialize in something else? The girl asked sarcastically. Outside of Sunagakura's puppet brigade, we're the foremost specialists in chakra threads, she said, her voice filled with pride. And here we go, Naruto thought with satisfaction. Really? He questioned. He didn't have to reach far for real interest. I'm not familiar with, how'd you call it? Chakra threads, the girl said, almost patiently now that she had calmed down. It's a technique that's most used by puppet users these days to control their puppets from a distance. But that's not what you guys do, Naruto surmised quickly. The orange-haired girl smirked. Oh we do, she said, gesturing to Naruto's arm. When the blonde looked down, she jerked her hand back towards herself, pulling Naruto's arm with her even though she didn't once touch it. Despite retaining all feeling in the limb, the arm moved like dead weight as it was pulled across the girl's body, Naruto not far behind as he landed in her lap with a strangled gasp. A flush crept up his neck as he righted himself after the girl, he still didn't know her name, released her technique. He noticed with some small mortification that the incident had caught the attention of the entire room. The clan head, Hanzaki, was staring at him with a single eyebrow raised, while both Yamato and Kurunai mirrored him. Kuji looked amused while Shino remained impassive. Naruto couldn't be sure, it was so hard to tell with the Hayuga eyes the way they were, but it seemed almost as if Hinata was glaring at the orange-haired girl. Ino's glare was far easier to see, and Kiba looked to be fighting a smile with great effort. Yes, well, the girl continued once the room had returned to normal. We do use the threads like puppeteers sometimes, but mostly for thrown weapons and the like makes those bows and arrows a bit more dangerous, Naruto mused, his embarrassment sufficiently squashed. Oh, yeah, the girl said with a prideful smirk. You guys do anything else with those threads? The blonde Janon probed, fully interested in a technique that was quite obviously dangerous. This and that. She shrugged. Naruto nodded. Whatever else the clan did was not likely to be revealed by anyone, least of all this girl. 
the blonde sat back against the wall once more, satisfied with the information he had managed to get. Though he still had some questions. Still, does it really make sense for a clan to be so devoted to one tiny branch of the ninja arts? The girl shrugged again. I guess not, she said at length. She didn't seem too happy about the logic. We're trying to expand some, though. We're pretty close to a deal with some local ninja that would really help us move in some new directions. Sasami, the deep voice of the clan leader cut into the conversation from across the room. The Konoha ninja need to be shown to their lodgings for the night. They have a long journey in the morning, so let's leave them to their business. As he spoke, three bow-wielding clansmen entered the room and gestured to the Konoha ninja to gather their belongings. The girl, Sasami, rose. Yes, uncle, she demurred before turning back to Naruto. I didn't catch your name. Naruto grinned as he gathered his pack. Didn't think I dropped it, he said roguishly. It managed to draw a smile from the girl, and his grin widened. Uzumaki Naruto, he introduced himself, holding a hand out. She took it. Fuma Sasami. It was good to meet you, Naruto. And you, Sasami, he said as the orange-haired girl was led from the room by her uncle. Maybe they would be able to continue their conversation the next morning before the Konoha group left. She had been interesting. He would never see her alive again. Slash tilde slash. It was the feel of pressurized chakra being let go that had woken him, split seconds before Yamato's voice sounded. Get up. All of you. Naruto sprang upward, vaulting from his prone position to a crouch, a kunai clenched in his right fist. Blue eyes darted around the darkened room that was shared by teams 8 and 10, taking in the still groggy forms of his counterparts, though he couldn't tell with Shino, the boy wore sunglasses even to bed. Two people were missing, however. Naruto's eyes met Yamato's, and the Jonin held up a hand to ward off his unspoken question as he waited for the others to shake off the effects of sleep. Yamato? Kurnai questioned a few seconds later, after her team had shaken a bit of their grogginess away. My clone was pulling guard duty with Kiba and Ino when a cloaking genjutsu was laid over the area. It was broken, but not before my clone was dispatched. This was 57 seconds ago. Since then, I've dispatched the two shinobi that were most likely sent to kill us. I've also learned that Hanzaki and his immediate family have been murdered. The same is happening throughout the entire clan compound, this is a purge, the Jonin finished monotonously. What are we supposed to do? Kuji exclaimed in a panic. All three Team 8 Janon looked terrified out of their wits, even Shino. Naruto felt he probably didn't look much different. Quiet, Kuji. Kurenai ordered, silencing her whole team. She turned to Yamato. Well? Take your team and Naruto directly out of the town and lead them to the border. I will track down Ino and Kiba. It went unspoken that both groups would have to fight their way out. Sensei Naruto began. Naruto. This is not the time for a discussion. You will follow Kurenai's lead with Team 8 to the border. No exceptions. The former Anbu captain stared down his best student with emotionless eyes as he passed a small scroll to Kurenai. Naruto's eyes hardened and he nodded once, curtly. The former Anbu captain was in charge here, and he would follow his lead. He opened his mouth to reply, but the man was already gone, having wasted too much time briefing the group already. Kiba and Ino might have already been killed. Get a hold of yourself, Naruto. He screamed mentally. Fatalistic thoughts never helped anyone, especially not in these types of situations. Gear up, Kurenai was saying. But pack nothing besides the essentials. This is a mad dash so we can't have anything slowing us down. B but what about Yamato S sensei? Hinata stuttered. Yamato is former Anbu. He can take care of himself, Hinata, the red-eyed Jonin said gently, soothing the nearly hysterical girl. I'll need you at your best right now, Hinata. We need to be able to see what's around us. Can you do that? Some distant part of Naruto's mind marveled at how calm the pretty Jonin was in the situation, but most of him was itching to get the hell out of Dodge. He had gathered his essentials precious seconds before, and his right foot tapped incessantly with impatience even as he gripped his twin knuckle knives. Simon, Simon, Simon. Let's go already, he thought savagely as Team 8 rushed to retrieve their weapons. This was why he always kept them in a neat pile less than a foot from where he slept, if not on his person. Yes, Sensei, he nodded demurred at last, though she didn't sound confident in herself. Good girl. Kurenai surveyed the group, all of them finally ready to move out. Let's move out. It was the quietest war zone Naruto thought that he would ever stumble into, even after Kurenai had dispelled the residual cloaking genjutsu. Whereas not a sound could be heard before, 
nearly silent footsteps made by invisible enemies echoed into the night, and the sound of brief weapon clashes became deafening before halting abruptly. Shino, Kuji, take the rear. Naruto and I will be our front with Hinata in the middle, Kurenai hissed. The Jinan obeyed silently. Hinata, your eyes. The timid heiress brought her hands together in a seal. Byakugan, she whispered, as veins bulged around her pupil-less eyes. They widened almost immediately. Sensei, she began, but Kurenai and Naruto were already moving. Naruto broke left as Kurenai vaulted back over the top of her Jinan, both reaching their would-be assassins before the words were out of Hinata's mouth. Naruto lowered himself under an outstretched stab, letting momentum carry himself into his attacker. He lowered his shoulder at the last moment and lifted, changing the man's direction and flipping him bodily over his head before the black-clad assailant could so much as react. The man landed with a thud, but Naruto paid it no heed as his disruptive wind chakra erupted into four foot blades. Taking two quick steps forward, Naruto brought both arms across his body in an X shape at eye level. The elemental chakra did the work for him, as a similarly black-clad man dropped to the ground with his head neatly removed. The Jinan juked to his right to avoid the downward slash of a katana that would have left him bleeding out, before blasting forward in a mini sunshine. Wind parted flesh like a hot knife through butter as Naruto ran through the sword-wielding ninja, piercing both kidneys, and the blonde met the dying man's eyes with a snarl as he viciously removed the weapons. Naruto turned back to the group to see Kurenai with her hands in a seal, staring intently at the man Naruto lifted over himself at the start her own two opponents dead from multiple wounds from a kunai and lying under the overhang on which they had likely been perched when the Jinan exited the building. The Jonin's eyes became unfocused for a brief second before she released the hand seal. The man wobbled unsteadily for a moment, before Kurenai casually cut his throat with a kunai. He gurgled for a moment before dropping like a puppet with its strings cut, the stench of released bowels filling the air. Near silence reigned for a moment while the three Jinan of Team 8 took in the sight of casual brutality the stillness only punctuated by soft footsteps coming from multiple locations around them. Get a hold of yourselves, the red-eyed Jonin commanded, addressing her stun team. This is the life of a ninja, so you'd better get used to it quickly. All of you need to be at your best if we're to survive. All three nodded shakily, still stunned by the unheralded attack and its even briefer ending. Good. Hinata, the man indicated that their forces are less concentrated to the north. I need you to verify that. Why why yes, Sensei. The Hyuga bloodline activated once more, and the heiress nodded. There are fewer M men to the north, S Sensei. Good work, Hinata, Kurenai praised gently. I need you to keep your eyes activated for me, Hinata. Can you do that? Yes, Sensei. No more was said as the group rounded the corner of what had been their lodging in the Fuma clan compound, and onto Fuma Lane, the main road that bisected the town. Naruto and Kurenai led the five man team at a brisk jog eyes peeled for lurking enemies. Unconsciously, Naruto was reminded of the night that had changed his entire outlook on shinobi life all those years ago. He wondered if it had been this quiet when Uchiha Itachi had eradicated the Uchiha from the face of the earth. His thoughts were shattered as Hinata called out, Sensei. In quiet distress, and indicated two alleys that the group would pass in a few seconds before holding up eight fingers. Naruto and Kurenai exchanged a glance and a nod, and the blonde Janan steeled himself even as the sound of his own heartbeat filled his ears. A single knuckle knife was sheathed briefly as Naruto coated and hurled a wind-enhanced kunai to his right, into one of the two alleys. The blade's aim was true, and it entered one shinobi's chest cavity before brutally exiting the other side before any of the assassins had time to react. Before the remaining Otto-nin could comprehend that their teammate was dead, Naruto had used his chakra as an anchor and kawarimi with the kunai into the center of the alley. Wind chakra exploded down the length of his former sensei's knives into six-foot scalpels that bent like whips. Capitalizing on his opportunity, Naruto spun 360 degrees in the blink of an eye, his whip-like blades eviscerating and bisecting the unsuspecting shinobi as the wind roared its fury for a single moment before falling silent as Naruto fell to one knee to maintain his balance. A second kawarimi with his kunai carried him back to his original position before the top halves of the dead auto ninjas hit the ground. Four thuds echoed behind Naruto, but he was already sprinting toward the opposite alley to assist Kurenai. The red-eyed Jonin had only two men left to deal with, and saw his approach from over the shoulder of one of her attackers. Swiftly, she thrust kicked him into Naruto's path before dropping low to sweep the feet of her final opponent. The man hit the ground hard with a muffled groan before he was silenced by a well-placed kunai. Naruto quickly reversed his momentum, allowing his body to better catch the airborne shinobi. 
Grabbing hold of the flying ninja, the blonde placed a hand over his mouth to muffle him before slitting his throat. The cooling corpse dropped like a sack as Naruto released him. Twin Shunshines carried the Janan and Jonin back to the front of their five-man team, who stood arrayed back to back in anticipation of another attack. Even as the three prepared for assault, their eyes were wide with shock at the brutal end to the fight. H holy shit, Kuji hissed. And Naruto-kun, Hinata whispered in awe. All three pairs of eyes rested upon Naruto, blood spattered as he was and looking like he was spoiling for more. Distantly, it occurred to the blonde that none of the three had actually seen someone killed before, let alone killed someone themselves. The dead bodies didn't affect him, his sense of squeamishness died along with Zabuza when he had splattered the Jonin's brain matter across the bridge in Wave Country. Now isn't the time for staring, Kurenai scolded. Get a hold of yourselves, we're not out of here just yet. Hinata, how's our route? See clear, sensei. We're less than 600 m meters from the northern gate, a and there is only one man guarding the exit, Hinata said. H his chakra levels indicate a likely JJ Jonin. The red-eyed Jonin sighed. Hmm, alright then. Leave this one to me. Naruto, I want you to stay out of this fight unless absolutely necessary, is that clear? Kurnai asked, serious red eyes that reminded the blonde of the Sharingan boring into his own. Clear, sensei, said Naruto, curtly. He wasn't about to bum rush a Jonin unless absolutely necessary. Good, stay alert, though. You're my immediate backup if this goes south, she cautioned. Yes, sensei. Night vision will restrict his sight to about 200 to 250 meters in each direction, so you three will halt at 300. She pointed to indicate team 8. I will cloak us in a genjutsu to hide us from sight, but stay out of range either way. Naruto, you will press up at about 100 meters behind me. Now, I don't expect the illusion to hold for long, so a secondary sensory overload will hit him when it dispels that should buy about 3 to 7 more seconds to work with. If, after that, he's still alive, Naruto, you will break in as a diversion and nothing more. I'll be able to handle him after that. Am I clear? She asked. A chorus of nods met her. Good. The five of them ghosted forward invisibly, with the 300-yard mark coming at a signal from Hinata. Naruto paused with Team 8 for a few moments as Kurenai continued forward, before following it yet another signal from the Hyuga Eris. The blonde matched her pace easily, maintaining the 100-meter gap without effort. The plan was sound, better than sound. It was rock-solid for something thrown together on the fly, with the two genjutsu seeming almost foolproof in theory. And yet, Naruto was still nervous. Maybe it was just the thought of trying to tackle yet another opponent well outside of his skill range, but it was more than just that. He had a bad feeling that he couldn't place, and no amount of mental reassurance would make it go away. He pushed it down, however, when the moon broke through the overcast night and the limited light revealed Kurenai steadily advancing on the Jonin's position. Maintaining his distance comfortably, blue eyes squinted in the dark to behold a man of average height, hands loose at his sides, clad in grey fatigues and a matching flak vest. A dark hit I ate lay across his forehead, the metal gleaming in the moonlight while the fabric contrasted sharply with the pale, almost pasty white skin of the man's face. Yellow eyes with slit pupils stared into the night impassively, reminding Naruto far too much of the QB for his own comfort. Time seemed to stand still for a split second as Naruto's blue orbs met yellow pupils that seemed to peer right through him. The man's lips twitched, and Naruto suddenly knew what was about to happen an instant before it did. The blonde Janan's mouth opened in a warning that was far too late at the same time Kurenai lunged at the still motionless Jonin, Kunai in position to eviscerate the sentry. Chakra rushed to Naruto's legs and exploded outward in the most overpowered sunshine of his young life as the telltale feeling of an egg being broken over his head heralded the immediate collapse of Kurenai's illusion. Naruto moved faster than he ever had before, his speed eating away at the 100 meter gap in hundredths of seconds, but he was still 20 meters away when the Jonin struck. As fast as a snake, one fist met Kurenai's neck before the Konoha Kunoichi had a chance to comprehend that her illusion had failed, before the man's other hand divested her of her kunai and buried it in her stomach in one smooth motion. A look of pure, unadulterated boredom flitted across the Jonin's face as Kurenai's lips parted in a silent O, oh, and a thrust kick to her breast sent her speeding towards Naruto. The blonde hopped lightly, intercepting Kurenai's flight path and catching her with a hard exhale. Naruto dropped to the ground almost silently quickly surveying the damage the kunai had done. As he examined his instructor's injury, he was peripherally aware of Team 8 sprinting towards him, but paid it no heed. The jonin had left the kunai buried in kunai's abdomen, and Naruto thanked whatever divine power there might have been that the man had done so. 
The blow seemed to miss just about all of the vital points in the area, but Kur and I still would have been at serious risk of bleeding out had the blade been removed. Instead of true relief, however, Naruto only felt more dread for their situation. The strike had been deliberate, and if the man was good enough to detect Kurnai's discreet illusion, dispel it without being harmed by the sensory overload, and then reverse her ambush as effortlessly as he had, he wouldn't have failed to kill his would-be assassin unless he hadn't wanted to. And that meant that Naruto and teammate had just become his playthings. Chapter 11, Indomitable. Slash tilde slash. Konoha Shinobi, the man whispered in a low, deceptively feminine voice. I haven't encountered Konoha Shinobi in quite some time. What a, disappointment. A pretty little Jonin and four Janan. The man's eyes widened, though in anticipation rather than surprise. Though, a Hayuga, an Akimichi, an Abarame, and, Uzumaki Naruto. A devilish smirk that put the fear of God into Naruto split the Jonin's face. This might be fun after all. His heartbeat deafening him, Naruto took a deep breath to steady himself, and then took another. His hearing slightly restored, he addressed Team 8 behind him. Guys, I'm gonna break us out. When I do, grab Kurunai and run, and don't touch the kunai, whatever you do. Don't argue, he said quickly to cut off any protests. Don't even think. Just run for the southern border. I'll be right behind you. Whether it was the utter terror of the moment, or some quality in his voice, the three Janan behind him didn't argue, and Kuji shuffled slightly to better pick Kurunai up when Naruto initiated the breakout. The Jonin was laughing at them. You have a plan. He cackled delightedly. How, magnificent. I'm afraid, however, that you will not be going anywhere. Four kunai appeared in his hands, and the four Janan were suddenly suffocating under the most powerful killing intent they'd ever felt as dozens of shuriken and kunai peppered their frozen limbs. Blood spurted, flesh was rent, and the Janan's stomachs turned over as the sight of their own deaths by projectiles played out in front of their eyes. Naruto couldn't even blink let alone breath as what felt like a million needles were stabbing him all at the same time while his chest was compressed past the breaking point. This was it, he was going to die. He, Uzumaki Naruto, was about to be brought low by some Odogaku or Jonin before he had accomplished anything. Before he had even made Chunin. A painful warmth was spreading through his limbs as his fatalistic thoughts hammered through his head, before the deafening sound of his own heartbeat silenced them, and the poisonously red image of a roaring fox obscured his vision. Time slowed as his mind flashed to his first encounter with the demon fox, and suddenly the Jonin's killing intent wasn't so suffocating anymore. It was nothing before the QB's pure malice and malevolence, and the devilish smirk was nothing more than a joke of an expression on the visage of a pasty-faced pretender. The phantom pain vanished, the suffocating killing intent dissipated, and the pale Jonin stood behind it all with four kunai hurtling through the air towards the Janan's chests. Naruto acted on instinct before his mind had fully caught up to the situation at hand. Two clawed hands formed a cross-shaped seal in front of his face, and the distinctive sound of shadow clones popping into existence filled the silent night. Three puffs of smoke obscured the Jonin's vision of the Janan he had targeted, and the sight of corporeal, black-clad blondes appeared for but a moment before dissipating as the throwing knives found their marks. The devilish smirk already on the man's face widened, contumely a satisfaction peeling pale lips back to reveal slightly pointed teeth. So sorry Toby sensei's dirty little secret can think for itself. Wonderful. Naruto paid the smile no heed as he drew a brace of four kunai with his left hand, while forming a half ram seal with his right. A spear of killing intent was hurled at the smirking Jonin, causing the man to recoil in slight shock at its potency. The blonde allowed himself a single moment of satisfaction as his spur of the moment idea paid dividends, and the frozen Janan jerked back to their senses. The genjutsu had been broken as the man lost his concentration. You guys alright? He queried, voice shaking involuntarily even as the QB's energy continued to filter into his system. Yes, Naruto-san, came Shino's predictable response, even if Naruto could detect the obvious fear in the boy's tone. And naruto k kun why your ch chakra, Hinata gasped. Naruto didn't spare time for a curse as he realized that the Hayuga's Byakugan must have been activated, and could therefore see the distinctly inhuman chakra coursing through Naruto's coils. Nothing to worry about, he bit out quickly, unperturbed about his secret getting out. He had bigger things to worry about. You guys remember the plan? He asked, silently thankful for the Jonin's continued lack of movement. The man obviously thought them so far beneath his notice to allow them their moment of hushed conversation. Even as he was doing so, Naruto felt the stirrings of an irrational anger begin to take hold. How dare he not take me seriously? Came the feral, by Juu-induced thought. 
three muttered yeses sounded from behind Naruto, and the blonde exhaled quietly. The man wasn't likely about to let Team 8 waltz right past him as he dealt with Naruto, so he'd have to break them out the hard way. He was confident that Team 8 would follow his lead, but, for the first time since his first meeting with Zabuza, he was less confident in himself to be able to pull them through. A flush of chakra derailed the thought before it could take hold in him, and Naruto readied himself by sheathing his four kunai in a combination of futon chakra and the foxes. He would only have one shot at this, and he would need his anchors. The Joni nodded as he watched Naruto call upon his elemental chakra. Such heightened control in one so young, impressive. So, he finally hissed. You've dispelled my genjutsu. An impressive feat indeed, but then I'm sure you're just full of surprises, isn't that right, Naruto-kun? An involuntary shiver coursed through him at the tone of familiarity, but it went ignored, as did the rest of the words, as Naruto threw one kunai directly at his own feet, before hurling the other three at the jonin blocking his path in a staggered flight path. A cage bunshine appeared as the blonde made yet another cross-shaped seal, and it sprinted at the pale man, knuckle knives drawn. The Jonin spared a split second of consideration for the flight path of the blades, smiling openly at the more advanced tactic the Jinchuriki employed, before twisting himself around and out of the path of the kunai in an inhuman display of flexibility. His tongue flapped out of his mouth happily as the sight of four stun Janan met his eyes, before he refocused on the clone bearing down on him. Only it wasn't there anymore, replaced instead by one of the kunai he had just dodged. His eyes widened even as his spine seemed to cease to exist for a moment, allowing him to bend further than 90 degrees at the waist to avoid being rent in two by the clone behind him. A kunai of his own found its way to his hand to deal with the annoyance, only to find nothing but air as he slashed out. The sight of yet another of the boy's knives filled his vision, and a cackle escaped his lips as he turned to face the clone once more. Kawarimi with a kunai, the jonin thought. Well-timed and a nearly instantaneous method of covering short distances. Impressive indeed. I wonder if he knows just how well he imitates Namikaze's old habits? The Jonin's hand, the one not holding a kunai, darted out faster than the clone could react, catching the incoming knife mid-strike and simultaneously knocking it to the ground. Moving faster than Naruto's I could track, the Jonin struck out in a jab with his kunai-laden hand, impaling the clone through the throat and watching in satisfaction as it puffed out of existence. But, he muttered to himself, the low hiss unheard by the Janan, Kawarimi is no Horaishin. He turned back to the four Janan, three snakes creeping out of his sleeves in preparation, half expecting to see the real Uzumaki Naruto charging him, only to be blindsided as a crimson corona of power, so bright it lit the countryside for miles, erupted. Chakra senses going haywire at the explosion of malevolent demonic chakra, and nearly blinded by the mere sight of it, the pale Otto Nin had no time to react as Naruto heedless of all else, barreled into him with the all-kinetic force of the maelstrom he was named for. The blonde, fully cognizant, let the poisonous chakra go to work eroding flesh and bone as he held the pale man in a stranglehold. Red eyes met yellow for a single, suspended moment before Naruto pressed his advantage brutally, a crimson-colored, bubbling hand of chakra extending from his arm swatting the jonin into a nearby building in a devastating hammer blow. Slitted eyes spared the building a glance as the man plowed through stone and would like a bullet, dust exploding out as the framework collapsed upon itself. A split second was all the boy allowed himself before he enacted a lightning-fast kawarimi that brought him back to the first kunai he had lodged in the ground. Run, he roared at the stunned forms of Team 8, even as he forced the QB's chakra back down to a boil beneath the surface of his skin. The residual killing intent echoed through his vocal cords regardless, and fight-or-flight syndrome took over in the minds of his three comrades. All three took off through the north gate at a full sprint before heading directly southeast, leaving Naruto to hastily collect Kurenai in his arms and tear off after them. The combination of the QB's chakra and adrenaline proved potent, and Naruto easily managed to power himself parallel to Team 8 in the open plains of Ricefield Country. He kept the three Janan slightly ahead of him, however, knowing that if the remaining Auto Ninja decided to chase them that he would need to be the first line of defense. Team 8 had already proven themselves to be Greenhorn Janan, unaccustomed to true combat, and would drop like flies in a running battle. A shock of pain split his skull for a moment as he finally managed to wrestle the QB's chakra back down, and a wave of fatigue swept over him. He stumbled as exhaustion made itself known, nearly growling in frustration at the aftereffects of using the QB's chakra. Damned fox, he cursed. Even with his own reserves nearly full, he still felt like he had run all the way from Kumagakura to Konoha in one go. Even so, Naruto righted himself through force of will, and resigned himself to rationing the fox's chakra so as to keep himself moving, 
inwardly cursing himself and the fox itself for making him use the instrument of his exhaustion to fight it. He'd likely end up passed out for days after this whole mess was over. If they got out alive, that was. That thought spurred him on, and his eyes bled from blue to deep purple, his teeth and nails lengthened, and his whisker marks deepened ever so slightly as the Baiju's chakra coursed through him once more. With a single push, he regained his place at the back of Team 8's sprint to the border, noticing idly that the three had slowed considerably as they regained their wits. It was a good thing too, as at their previous pace they would have passed out halfway through the countryside. The group crested a hill, coming to an involuntary halt as the sight of a massive body of water shimmered in the moonlight in front of them. A sigh of relief escaped Naruto's chapped lips. Follow it around, he grunted, his voice sounding like gravel due the influence of the Kyuubi's chakra. Three pairs of startled eyes shifted to him. W what? Huji whispered, as if he had forgotten that Naruto had been running behind them in the first place. Wrapped up in the terror of the moment, Naruto mused distantly, they probably hadn't thought of him at all. Follow it around, he repeated, making an effort to soften his voice. It didn't work. This lake is the start of the river that flows into the valley of the end. If we follow it around, we'll reach Fire Country's border in a few hours. But first he started, as all of Team 8 had begun to move off. He placed Kurenai's unconscious form on the ground. I'll need some help with Kurenai. It was as if a veil of blindness had been lifted off the three Jinan of Team 8 at the mention of their sensei. All of a sudden, panic returned in full force, only enhanced by the fact that their sensei, the one person they had been counting on in case of a situation like this, was lying unconscious with a blade sheathed in her gut. Kurenai sensei, Kuji exclaimed in shock. The heavy boy's breathing quickened almost immediately as he stumbled backwards. His feet caught on a piece of gravel and he tumbled to the ground unceremoniously. The disorientation seemed to do him a spot of good, however, as the moment his back hit the ground, his breathing calmed, his mind no longer focusing on the prone form of his sensei. The other two weren't so fortunate. Hinata's already pale cheeks became even more so, her eyes widened, and she stood stock still staring vacantly down at the jonin. The gaze seemed to pass right through the dark-haired woman in front of her, however, seeing instead some phantom of her mind. While Shino looked to be his usual stoic self, Naruto could see the boy's body was far too tense, and a faint buzzing noise that the blonde had been hearing since the flight from Shintoshi was getting truly deafening. Caught off guard by Team 8's reactions, Naruto flinched back, uncomprehending of the raw emotion playing out before him. What are they, why are they? It was only when Hinata sunk to her knees, hugging herself tightly around the chest and whimpered, Mother, that snapped Naruto out of his daze. Hey! He barked, his voice, already a growl, amplified by the corrosive chakra running through him. Killing intent rolled off of him, flooding the immediate vicinity and grabbing teammates' attention like a slap to the face. Get a hold of yourselves. You're running around like a bunch of Greenhorn Academy students. We're not out of this shit yet, and all of you panicking like a bunch of fucking kids is gonna get us all killed. The growling dressing down hadn't done much for Team 8's rapidly fraying nerves, but it seemed to snap them out of their collective stupor. What do we need to do, Naruto-san? Shino asked, his voice quiet. The fact that he deferred to Naruto's leadership spoke volumes, and unknowingly had Kuji and Hinata giving more weight to his words. The blonde sighed, raking a clawed hand through his hair. His own nerves weren't helping the situation. He was constantly fighting himself to keep from snapping at the three Jinan in front of him, not to mention the consistent pounding of blood in his ears courtesy of the Kyuubi's chakra. He was itching for a fight and he knew it, but was powerless to stop the urge. He could push it down, though. First off, Kurenai needs to be patched up some. Anyone who might have chased us from the town seems to have given up by now, so we have some time to work. A thought struck the Jinan suddenly, and he turned to Hinata. How long can you keep your eyes activated? He asked, voice filled with something like hope. The heiress looked to her feet. A Anyo, only a few minutes at a time, and Naruto kun. The blonde refrained from cursing sulfurously at the girl's tiny chakra reserves. That's fine for now, Hinata. Can you activate them now? The girl nodded once, and chakra pulsed outward with a hand seal and a muttered Byakugan. There's n no one within 1,000 meters, Naruto K kun, Hinata stated, picking up on his train of thought. Good, good, Naruto muttered absently, his mind filing away her range. Okay. First things first, we've got to get this kunai out of her. He turned violet eyes on the group. Do any of you have anything that'll help clotting? Bandages can only do so much. Kuji looked pensive for a second, his eyes unconsciously flickering back and forth between Naruto and his sensei, 
before shaking his head in the negative. My clan's pills only deal with chakra output, he muttered. Shino, predictably, said nothing, but turned hidden eyes to Hinata. The girl in question blushed and looked down, pushing her fingers together in her usual show of uncertainty. Anyo, I, I have a sea cream that helps wounds close by directing ch chakra to the injury, b but I'm not sure it will w work properly, she stuttered. Aren't you the Hyuga heiress? Grow a spine. Naruto thought harshly, the QB's natural malice amplifying his impatience with their situation. Now isn't the time for your insecurities. That'll have to do, was all he grunted as he unwrapped the excess bandages from around his calves. Get the cream and coat these in it. We'll use them to help stop the bleeding. Hopefully it'll buy us some time. The blonde passed his bandages to Hinata and Shino, who began applying the cream liberally. He motioned to Kuji. When we start moving again, I'll need you to carry her. You're easily the strongest of us physically, and I'll have to deal with any threats against us if and when they appear. The you guys won't be much use in a fight right now when unspoken, but the heavyset boy seemed to get the message, if the look of grim determination on his face was any indication. Got it, Naruto. Good. Are you guys finished with the bandages? He asked Ashino and Hinata. Just about, Naruto-san, was the bespectacled boy's reply. We've a few more left. Hurry it up, Naruto ordered. We don't have too much time and I don't want to linger. Even as he spoke, the Jinchuriki moved to start removing the kunai from Kurinai's abdomen gingerly. He grasped the blade lightly, inwardly thanking the heavens that he had paid attention in those first aid lessons at the academy, and pulled directly opposite the angle of entry so as to do no further damage to the blood vessels. A wince passed across his face as the Jonin moaned quietly in her unconsciousness. The blonde wondered again at the enemy Jonin's mindset as he had stabbed Kurinai, silently thankful for making his job easier. The man must have been arrogant to the extreme to purposefully leave a wound so treatable, so confident in himself as to think he would easily be able to dispatch the Jinan. Then again, Naruto mused as he stemmed the blood flow with the bandages from Kurinai's own dress, it likely wasn't a far-fetched assumption. The man obviously hadn't counted on running into a Jinchuriki. Get those bandages over here. He directed, using one hand to apply pressure to the wound while simultaneously cutting away pieces of Kurinai's red and white dress with a kunai. Hold this down, Kuji, he ordered the Akimichi, passing the blood-soaked cloth to him. The boy took over with a grimace, looking more than a little sick at the prospect. Both hands free, Naruto removed the rest of the fabric with ease from around the Jonin's abdomen, and discarded the blood-soaked fabric. Naruto-san, Shino spoke from behind him, cream-lathered bandages in hand. The blonde only grunted in acknowledgement, taking the white, slippery strips of cloth without prompting. Lift that, he ordered Kuji, gesturing to the bloody cloth. The boy pulled it off and backed away hastily, all too eager to step away from the bleeding woman, inadvertently leaving Naruto to bandage Kurinai on his own. The whiskered Janan didn't even bother to sigh as the three Janan kept their distance, slipping one hand under the Jonin gently as he wrapped the cream-soaked bandages around her middle. Sticky life water ran down his clawed hands as they repeatedly passed over Kurinai's well-toned stomach muscles, the dark liquid contrasting fiercely with the almost creamy tone of the woman's skin that was paling far too quickly. The job was finished swiftly, and Naruto fastened the not-too-tight pieces of cloth to the pretty Jonin with a liberal helping of adhesive tape. He stepped back, shaking his hands and rubbing them unconsciously on his shorts, and observed his hasty handiwork. It would have to do, he decided, turning back to Team 8. That'll have to do it. Kuji, pick her up, we're leaving, Naruto directed. We've lingered here far too long. We can be in fire country in a few hours, but only if we hurry, he growled. The three Janan of Team 8 nodded resolutely in response, and Kuji gingerly lifted his sensei into his arms bridal style. The four Janan followed the edge of the lake for nearly a full half hour before it turned into a river, the sound of running water and the nearly silent crunch of their hurried footsteps nearly deafening to their ears in the silence of the night. The foursome was forced to stop multiple times during the trek, as Kuji had to readjust his grip often, and neither Shino nor Hinata had the stamina to keep on at their pace for hours at a time. It was during one of these stops, for Kuji this time, just before dawn, that Hinata activated her Byakugan as per Naruto's order. Milky white eyes widened in terror for a split second, and Naruto knew dread. T-12 figures approaching from the north or west, Hinata gasped. Curses exploded out of Naruto's mouth that would have made even a battle-hardened shinobi take a step back. He took a deep breath to steady himself, even as the sound of his own pounding heartbeat began its ritualistic echo. All right, he began, here's the plan. We're gonna take Kurinai and get across the river. 
I assume you know the water walking exercise. Three hesitant shakes of heads met him and the blonde only barely kept himself from exploding. Shit. Okay, then we'll need to keep on around the river until it thins. Then we'll cross. Once we're over there, we'll need to sprint along the river bank until you reach the valley of the end, just like we planned. Once we're in fire country we can contact one of the border patrols. The obvious entryways are gonna be swamped with patrols at this time of day, so we'll need to get to one as fast as possible, you hear? Kuji nodded resolutely, already reaching to pick up Kurenai. Hinata was tripping over herself in her haste to gather her belongings, while Shino directed his steady gaze at Naruto. The blonde got the impression that the bug user could see right through him. You won't be with us, he said quietly, having picked up on Naruto's unspoken plan. It wasn't a question. A sardonic smile split Naruto's face. I'll hold them off for a few minutes before breaking out. I'll be right behind you, he said in a whisper. You'll need our help. No, Naruto cut across the boy quietly, his voice eliciting a wince. He paid it no mind. Kurenai needs medical attention ASAP, we don't have time to stop and fight a taxing battle. And if I come with you and they catch us, which they will, we'll all get killed in a running battle. This way, Kurenai will get back to fire country with only one of us playing catch up. Shino paused, uncomfortable and an obvious thought. That chakra you used. Naruto grimaced. Like I said, I'll be right behind you. The bespectacled boy nodded once, firmly. I will keep them moving. I know, Naruto said. He addressed the rest of the group. Let's move out. Chakra revitalizing their limbs, Team 8 plus Naruto took off at a sprint around the riverbank. Naruto stopped after a few steps, watching silently as his comrades continued their sprint, two-thirds of them so focused that they were completely unaware of him. Turning, he began his backtrack slowly, taking measured steps as he focused on filtering the Kyuubi's chakra through his coils. Purple eyes bled fully into crimson, and Naruto thought he could almost hear a growl of satisfaction come from the beast. He paid it no mind, however, as the slight rustling of branches heralded the approach of the Otto Nin. Pointed teeth became bared in a feral snarl of rage as boiling red chakra bubbled out of and across the surface of Naruto's skin. The now familiar warmth of the fox's demonic chakra washed over him fully as the visible life essence settled itself in a cloak around him. One, single tail like appendage sprouted from behind him and began waving back and forth. The twelve ninja, clad in all black body gear and face masks, broke through the foliage at a run, only to halt abruptly as they caught sight of the demonic vision waiting for them at the edge of the water. The Konoha Janan noted, with a feral satisfaction, that fear was quickly replacing confidence on their faces. Stunned, the men looked at one another in shock, and it was all the prompting Naruto needed. Formerly restrained murderous intent poured forth, every ounce of it directed directly at the shinobi, who froze. Naruto spared no thought for the men in front of him as instinct took over and a haze of red blurred his vision. Dust and rocks exploded upward behind him as he tore towards the twelve motionless shinobi faster than the eye could track. A red blur was the only sight that greeted the men as Naruto dropped to all fours and covered the remaining distance in two bounds. Claws outstretched, Naruto barreled into the first of the twelve without ceremony, nails finding purchase in the soft flesh of the man's throat. Blood spurted as the claws left two-inch rents in the skin, and the man dropped like a sack with his head half removed. The unleashed Jinchuriki didn't so much as glance back as the body hit the ground, having extended the single tail into a seven-foot whip that bisected three Otto Nin as he spun in a full circle. Four shinobi were lying dead after less than a second before the other eight reacted. Acting quickly, the first brought his hands together in a seal sequence, causing a rock fissure to erupt where Naruto was standing. The cloaked blonde reacted faster than the man could have ever anticipated, deftly jumping out of the spike's way, before exploding forward and grabbing the offender in a lightning-fast, crushing chokehold that collapsed the shinobi's windpipe in an instant. Capitalizing on the Jinchuriki's momentary pause, a second auto ninja leapt forward and made for a stab at Naruto's exposed back. Inhuman reflexes jerked Naruto to the left, and the knife buried itself hilt deep in his right shoulder. The boy's roar of pain split the air, and Naruto dropped his quarry to the ground. Coiling his body, the blonde jabbed his clawed left hand into the chest of the auto nin who had stabbed him before the man had a chance to react. The feral Janan paid the blood running down his arm and rivulets no heat as the dragged the screaming shinobi to meet his eyes. Slitted eyes the color of fresh blood met terrified Hazel for a single, suspended moment before Naruto slapped the man into a tree twenty meters away with enough force to crack the trunk. It had taken four men dying in the span of a second to galvanize the auto nin into action, and it took six men in two for the rest to realize that they were well and truly fucked. 
The first who tried to run was cut down as Naruto almost casually ripped the kunai stuck in his shoulder from its resting place, hurling the blade through the back of the man's head in one motion. The second who broke for his life had his organs liquefied as an arm of pure, demonic chakra snatched him around the waist and squeezed. The third man didn't make it a step before the Jinchuriki had swept him into a tree with a wave of his arm. The fourth made it a full step before stopping suddenly, staring with unblinking eyes down at the crimson, bubbling hand of chakra that was extending out from his chest. The fifth man had resigned himself to death, and was neatly decapitated by a blood-colored whip that had been meant for his chest as he fell to his knees. The final Autonin made it to the tree line as Naruto was distracted, but it was for naught as the Jinchuriki fell to all fours and powered himself into a flying tackle that sent the two tumbling to the ground in a tangle of limbs. Quickly using his weight to pin the man, Naruto held him down by the throat while he raised his second claw in preparation for a strike that would brutally decapitate the shinobi. It was only when the crimson eyes of the nine tails met pale blue eyes that could have been his own that Naruto realized that the man's mask had been ripped from his face. Terror-shrouded eyes stared back at him from a face that could have been his own a few years down the road. Shocked at the raw fear he saw, Naruto stumbled back from the boy's body into the nearest tree trunk, the Kyuubi's cloak receding. The Jinan slumped to the ground as his eyes bled back into the natural blue of his father, vacantly taking in the destruction of his own making as the death of the auto ninjas played out before him. Overwhelmed at the sight of the nearly dozen dead, Naruto's gag reflex reared its head violently and his stomach emptied itself in one go. Disoriented, the Jinchuriki blinked and rolled his head to right himself as his nausea began to subside. What have I done? He gasped, throat raw. Quiet though the words were, they seemed to echo around the new graveyard as if the blonde had shouted them to the heavens. Self-disgust ripped through him as each and every one of his brutal, inhuman kills flashed before his eyes, and his head dropped to his hands as sobs threatened to rack his body. A gurgle broke his train of self-hatred, and blue eyes peered out from behind clenched fingers at the stirring body of the twelfth Autonin. Caked blood covered the teenager's throat, and Naruto realized with a start that the Kyuubi's chakra had completely eaten through the flesh and blood vessels, leaving the barely alive shinobi to suffocate in a pool of his own fluids. A sob finally broke from his throat as he recalled the ninja's young face, only a few years older than his own, shrouded in absolute terror at the hellish vision of death that had torn through his comrades. The self-hatred returned in full force as Naruto remembered the clear blue eyes, so like his own, that had stared back at him once the mask had been torn from the boy's face. And yet, at the same time, three other faces flashed before him, the faces of his comrades and teammate. The memory of their terror at the utterly unfair situation they had stumbled into passed before Naruto's eyes, and the recollection of their panic at Kurenai's condition stirred the already churning pot of emotion in the Jinchuriki. It was the memory of Hinata, broken, collapsed and hugging herself that convinced him. This had been necessary. The twelve auto nin had had no idea what they were sprinting into when they broke through the trees by the riverbank but they had been ready and willing to slaughter the four Janan and their instructor in much the same way that Naruto had done to them. Teammate was green, utterly unprepared for the harsh realities of the shinobi world where clans were purged and children were sentenced to death for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Before tonight they had never even seen a dead body, much less taken a life. They would have dropped like flies, cut down without thought or remorse by the kill squad. It was kill or be killed, and Naruto knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that all twelve of the would-be assassins wouldn't have hesitated to cut him or his comrades down. In the end, he had decimated twelve enemy shinobi to preserve the lives of five, his own included. He had protected his teammates, his comrades in arms. He had done his duty. He had done his duty the same way Asuma would have. The same way his father would have. Self-disgust gave way to a calm, cold acceptance of his actions. He was a shinobi, and shinobi killed, and died, in the line of duty. It was a truth universally accepted by those in their world who lived long enough to rack up a body count, and it was a truth that Naruto had never truly understood until now. Even the sudden death of Asuma hadn't completely reinforced that fact. He was a shinobi, and he had done his duty. As a direct result of his actions, he and Team 8 now had a better chance of seeing another sunrise. Twelve men had to die to ensure that his comrades would escape, and, as Naruto rose, kunai in hand to put the final Odogaku or Shinobi out of his misery, he found that he could live with that. A flash of moonlight glinted off the black metal of the knife as Naruto delivered the coup de grace, and the once again blue-eyed boy turned his back on the riverbank graveyard and strode off into the night to rejoin his team. He didn't look back. Slash tilde slash. Exhaustion pounded a steady beat through her body, her heart a drumbeat in the near total silence of the clearing. She could say with complete certainty that this was the most tired she had ever been in her life. 
Her arms could have been made of lead, while her legs might as well have been made of jelly, for all the weight they could hold. Her head felt like it weighed 30 pounds as she leaned back into the trunk of the tree she rested against, the dull thump of her hair on the bark echoing in her mind. Yamanaka Ino was tired, deathly so, but she refused to let the medic sedate her for the journey back to Konoha. Not yet, at least. Yamato-sensei had tried to convince her to accompany the first of the medical two teams back to Konoha with Kiba, but she had held her ground. Kiba, who had taken a kunai to the back in a skirmish before Yamato had found them, was in stable condition and was only being taken back to Konoha as a precautionary measure. She, however, was mostly unharmed, save for small flesh wounds, and needed nothing more than field medicine. With nothing impairing her save for exhaustion, Ino wasn't about to be carted off to Konoha without knowing exactly what was happening. Not with her friends still out there. Not with Naruto still out there. Not that he'll want to see me, she thought morosely, a spear of self-disgust ripping through her. Not with how I've been treating him. It was truly amazing how nearly getting killed, not to mention waiting to find out if your friends had been killed, managed to put things in perspective. Her sardonic chuckle broke the silence of the clearing, causing the patrolling Anbu to perk up. Ino didn't care, though, wrapped up in her thoughts as she was. She, she and Kiba, really, had been treating Naruto like shit stuck on the bottom of their sandals ever since Yamato had become their sensei. And, if she was honest with herself, it was only because he had decided to learn from a man she only saw as a replacement for their real sensei. It was a childish reason by anyone's standards, and Ino shook her head at the sheer pettiness of herself and Kiba. Unbidden, Naruto's words from their fight drifted back to her. I'm not. Shit happened and I'm trying to stop it from happening again. I'm trying to get stronger. You two fucking around, acting like a couple of spoilt brats back in the academy, puts all of us at risk. What happens next time round, and there will be a next time, when shit hits the fan, huh? When the chips are on the fucking table and there's no one there to bail us out. I'll tell you what happens, we die. I'm not about to let that happen, and if that means that I have listened to a guy who's being put in as a replacement for Asuma, and an experienced Jonin at that, so be it. Why do you have to be right all the time, Naruto? Ino asked the dead air in a whisper. The boy had been dead on the money, as usual, and Ino was left shaking her head at her own stupidity. She had let herself be blinded by loss, and had pushed away the one person she knew she would have been able to count on in any situation. And now he was out in the wild on his own, likely fighting his way through Adonin just to get back. Snap out of it, Ino. He's got Kurenai sensei with him. He'll be fine. She raked a hand through her loose hair, flecks of blood from her fingernails leaving trails in her sweaty, grimy locks. Four months ago, she would have been sprinting back to Konoha simply for the prospect of a shower. Now, she waited with bated breath for the return of her teammate, caring for nothing else. Ino vowed never to let her fellow blonde out of her sight if, when. She fiercely corrected herself, Naruto returned. She couldn't quite pinpoint the moment in time she had first started nursing an affection for her teammate but she was honest enough with herself to acknowledge that she didn't think of him as just a friend or a teammate, though he certainly fell into both categories. He was Naruto. That was all that really mattered. It was in this moment of clarity that Yamato found her. They've been spotted, he said in an opening that startled the blonde Janan so much that she nearly jumped. The girl regained her bearings quickly, however, focusing tired aquamarine eyes on the brown orbs of her sensei. A patrol caught up to them as they were nearing the valley of the end, they will be there in less than half an hour. Ino blinked, her mind flashing to a scene of blood, sweat, and pure desperation. Her tanto was past the point of being slippery, sticky as its handle was from the now dried blood. The dead body of a nameless, faceless Otto Nin laid face down less than five feet from her, but she barely even noticed the corpse. A simple slice throated down the assassin, the motion easy from under the cover of her genjutsu. She turned her head to the whimpering Kiba next to her, watching detachedly as he tested the array of bandages that covered the back of his right shoulder. Akamaru cradled to his chest, he met her eyes with a defiant nod, letting her know that her hasty handiwork would hold. The slight breath of relief that left her lips barely touched the dead air before the telltale feeling of an egg being cracked over her head told her that her double-layered illusion had just been shattered. Ino whipped around, her blonde hair flying and an expression of horror etched upon her pretty face as the figures of six masked shinobi dropped to the ground opposite her and Kiba. The expression remained as crimson blood sprayed violently across her pale visage, her eyes fixed upon the sight of multiple wooden stakes protruding from the chests of her would-be assassins. Two branches stuck out of each man's chest, one penetrating the heart, another the liver, in a terrifyingly thorough execution. The stakes receded abruptly, 
and each man dropped like a puppet without its strings. The sound of thumps filled Eno's ears as she raised shocked eyes to meet the icy brown orbs of her sensei, the man perched like a hawk on top of the opposite roof. Hey, are you sure? She stuttered, trying to regain her bearings from the metal flash. Were she more alert, she would have wondered at the stupidity of asking a Jonin whether he was sure about information he had received from Anbu. The brown-haired former Anbu showed no expression at the unnecessary question, opting to answer with a simple yes and motioning for Eno to follow him. The blonde Janan scrambled to her feet hastily, fighting some small, residual dizziness from sitting for so long. We're going to meet them, she said mostly to herself as her sensei took to the trees. The girl flooded her legs with chakra before doing the same, silently wishing for one of Kiba's always handy soldier pills to help deal with her exhaustion. The run to the valley was mostly a black blur to Ino, who only truly remembered anything, thanks to one of the Anbu members running alongside her and Yamato. The woman had very nearly caught the blonde Janan at one point, before wisely offering the girl a soldier pill from her own stores. You should have returned to the village with your teammate, the Kunoichi chastised once Ino had regained some energy. My other teammate is still out there, the bond returned with a bit of vitriol, uncaring of her tone. I'm not going anywhere until I know what's happened to him, she finished in a whisper, a note of pure terror entering her voice at the thought of Naruto not returning. Stop that! She screamed at herself, shaking her head in a futile attempt to clear her mind of fatalistic thoughts. The female Anbu next to her was silent for a few moments before, Senpai mentioned that Uzumaki is in the company of Yuhi Kurenai and her team. Yuhi is a talented Jonin, your teammate will be fine, the Kunoichi soothed. Ino wasn't sure, the monotone of the woman's voice threw off her perception, but it almost seemed as if a note of pity entered the Anbu's voice at Ino's plight. The blonde nodded, shakily at first and then resolutely. Yeah, yeah, he'll be fine, she told herself. Ino contented herself with the knowledge that Naruto was in good hands with Kurenai and Team 8. Letting the soldier pill go to work, the Yamanaka powered herself through the trees and towards the valley of the end. Waiting for her was a scene that would forever be etched into her memory. The roar of the nearby waterfall drowned out most sound coming from her destination, but she still managed to hear the words of the head of the medical team that had been waiting for Team 8 at the border. Set her down now. Get those bandages off of her immediately, we need to repair the damage to the area ASAP, the head medic was shouting as Ino burst out of the tree line directly behind Yamato. Get me blood pills, people. She needs it, and badly. All of Ino's cushy visions of Kurenai steering Naruto to safety from the depths of rice fields country imploded with the force of an explosive tag at the sight of the inky-haired Jonin laid out on the ground, blood-soaked bandages being removed from her abdomen and medical personnel scrambling for supplies around her. One medic neatly sliced the bloody cloth away with a kunai, exposing a bleeding stab wound to the kunoichi's stomach, and Ino felt her heart drop to her feet. Visions of Asuma's head sailing skyward in a spray of blood flashed before her eyes as Ino beheld the tense scene on the riverbank, and the blonde girl clapped both hands over her eyes in a futile attempt to halt them. No, no no no. Ino breathed, panic resting control of her thoughts. Her hands fell from her eyes as her head whipped about in an attempt to locate Naruto. Naruto? She all but screamed into the night, searching for any sign of her wayward teammate. This can't be happening. Not now, not him. Naruto. She screamed again, just as a heavy hand fell on her shoulder and startled her out of her panic. Calm down, girl. The female Anbu ordered, roughly slapping the blonde girl across the face, nearly sending her to the ground. Your teammate is fine. A simple jerk of her head drew Ino's gaze to the river. The remaining three Janan of Team 8 were being carried over on the backs of Anbu operatives, while a fourth Anbu walked side by side with the final member of the mission. The surreal sight of Naruto striding along the surface of the river with an Anbu at his side caused Ino's eyes to widen as she took it in. In the moonlight, the damage done the Naruto's attire was far too easy to see. The black vest was torn, ripped, and even shredded in places. Off-color splotches spoke of blood, though Ino couldn't be sure if it was his own. Normally sunny blonde hair was dulled with grime, sweat, and blood. A single knuckle knife spun around his left index finger idly as Naruto made his unhurried way across the river, his steps measured, tired, yet confident. Blue eyes blazed from beneath the fringe of his matted hair, taking in everything at once with the sight of a true veteran, a confidence born of lives taken and defied fate stared out at the world, daring anyone to challenge him. Two sets of blue eyes locked from across the river, and suddenly Naruto was right in front of her, having bypassed Team 8 and covered the distance in less than an eye blink. Ino had barely registered his presence in front of her before she had nearly tackled him, wrapping him in the tightest embrace she had ever given. 
Naruto, for his part, simply let it happen, gently returning the hug after the initial shock had worn off. I thought you were dead, Ino breathed into his chest, fighting back sobs of relief as her fatalistic thoughts and imaginings evaporated. Can't get rid of me that easily, Naruto grunted tiredly, slightly amused at the girl's reaction in spite of himself. Pushing him away briefly, Ino grasped Naruto about the shoulders and held him at arm's length, surveying him up close. From less than a yard apart, Ino could clearly see the damage done to Naruto from the night skirmishes, not all of it immediately apparent even from up close. His body was shaking, trembling even, with pure, unadulterated exhaustion. Blue eyes, though blazing in their intensity, were shadowed, worn with the exertion that followed pinpoint focus for an extended time. Ino was no sensor, but the normal chakra output that Naruto usually radiated was nowhere to be felt, hinting at dangerously low reserves. At a glance, Naruto was ready for another ten rounds against whatever shinobi he had doubtlessly cut down, looking every part the mythical knight in an epic. But, in truth, his body was ready to give out. Even so, he offered her a smile, subconsciously looking to reassure Ino that everything was, in fact, just fine. Ino, whose stomach was doing a series of acrobatics as she stared at her teammate, simply elected to encircle Naruto in her arms once more, fully believing that everything was, in fact, just fine. Alright guys, that's it for the video. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. As always, the rest of the story is already out over on Patreon, link to that will be in the description. Anyways, until next time, peace.